Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well. Tonight we have the best of October and November. 35 stories coming out to just about 8 hours. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like. Let's see if we can reach 1500 likes on this one. I think if everyone took a quick second we could do it. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated as I post content just like this all of the time. Just a reminder, these stories are placed in no specific order. Sit back, pack a bowl, grab a coffee, whatever it is that you do to relax. And let's begin. Enjoy, tell someone you love them, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. It is, of course, the classic cliché, but my wife and I still decided to move after what happened. We had horrible nightmares from the incident, and we're just glad that we seemed to survive as a family. But still, we wanted to get out of the house, which made us both remember what happened each and every day. Maybe it was the universe giving us something good or just pure dumb luck, but we found a house that was essentially our dream house. I know that every homeowner says that about their house, but it truly was an amazing deal. It had enough bedrooms to give both of our two boys their own room, and for my wife and me, each one office. It had a garden, which meant that we could finally fulfill my wife's dream of harvesting our own vegetables and fruits. And it was only five minutes away from her parents. Since she wanted to be closer to them anyway, it seemed perfect. Sure, we had to renovate it first. There was an ant problem, and my god, at night the house was louder than my wife's snoring. But we still settled on it quickly. It took some time to acclimate to everything. The move on top of our seven-year-old Andrew being our oldest now, and us having to give away all of our daughter's belongings. It might seem harsh, and earned a lot of hurtful comments from some people, especially my parents. We're not talking anymore, but none of us could stand to handle any of her things without almost breaking down. The loss of our daughter might have been the worst thing to happen to us. But then it became so much worse. My therapist encouraged me to type it all out and post it here, so maybe this helps. I cannot bring myself to start with the death of my daughter, so you'll have to settle up with the aftermath. Bear with me. I know this text will be a mess. I think it all started with Tim, our other son losing his tooth. He was incredibly excited, proudly displaying it to us, and then his teachers in daycare. In the evening, after I had put him in bed, he made a shushing motion and lifted his pillow to show me his tooth laying underneath it. I chuckled and ruffled his hair. Well, if you've been a good kid today, then I'm quite sure that the tooth fairy will exchange it for a gift. I told him. He nodded along. What do you think she'll leave with me? Maybe some marshmallows? I don't know if the tooth fairy would give you sweets. Remember, those make your teeth sick. The next morning, the Tooth Fairy had left him a new small stuffed animal. He was over the moon and carried it with him the entire day, until my wife, Mary, who was worried that we would have to put it in the laundry on the first evening of him having it, but it seemed to calm him a lot. So we didn't say anything. Dad? I turned around to see Andrew standing behind me. Tim stood behind him, awkwardly clinging to the sleeve of Andrew's pajamas. Both looked up with the excitement only two brothers under ten can bring up. Do you think the Tooth Fairy also accepts other things? Tim asked. Maybe I can trade some of my toys for better ones. Andrew scrunched up his face. I told him that the Tooth Fairy wouldn't, because it's the Tooth Fairy. But maybe there are other kinds of fairies. I did my best to make an exaggerated thinking face. Hmm. I think the tooth fairy only shows up for your teeth. 
And I don't really know of any other fairy that would trade the things from under your pillow. Sorry, Tim. He looked so disappointed. I almost felt with him. Well, your teeth are just your mouth bones, right? Andrew asked slowly. You should definitely stop sleeping with one arm under your pillow then. Tim looked horrified and looked like he was about to cry. I quickly intervened and reassured him that the Tooth Fairy wouldn't try to take his arm away. Both boys seemed unsatisfied with the answer, but did go to bed without a fuss then. The next morning, Tim was quite sulky at breakfast and reluctantly told us that he had placed a matchbox car under his pillow. And besides jabbing him in the cheek, nothing had happened. Andrew almost laughed out loud and told him that he should make an experiment out of it. To see what the Tooth Fairy would deem an acceptable trade and what not. That seemed to cheer Tim up. It was heartwarming to see our boys bonding again. They had been so cold to each other following the incident, and we had been worried sick over what and how much exactly Andrew had seen that day. But he seemed to slowly recover from losing his sister. Our therapist also said that behavioral changes were to be expected, and especially if Andrew had seen anything, that would absolutely explain his coldness. Which Tim then of course reciprocated. But now both were eating their cereal and discussing which toys or things to put under their pillows. It seemed like everything was on a very good track. In fact, the entire day seemed to be very nice. Mary and I had a lunch date when we saw each other in the cafeteria at the same time. We worked in the same building, but different firms. And when we had gotten the boys from daycare and school, we settled on a picnic in the park. Tim especially seemed to respond very well to visits to this park, probably because he missed the playground. Andrew also liked going there. Even though oftentimes older teenagers from school he knew, and hated, would hang around there. When we came home, Andrew asked Tim if he wanted to help him with his homework. Seeing both working on the kitchen table, Andrew doing his math homework and Tim doodling on some paper, it almost reminded me of the time before the incident. It was bittersweet. I want to try for another baby. Mary had asked her parents to take the boys for one evening, and I was looking forward to spending one uninterrupted evening with my wife, but what she said almost made me fall out of my shoes. Are you sure? We don't know if one of the boys won't be acting up again, and you are still recovering from losing her. We both are, I said gingerly. Mary shook her head. It has been almost a year. We got a second chance here with our two boys. A fresh start. I would love to expand our family. Just imagine how much life a baby would bring to the house. I cocked my head. Is this about your pregnant co-worker? Mary looked almost insulted. That's not... Okay, maybe it is what started the thought, but I really do think I'm ready. Have you seen the boys interacting with each other? It's better than ever. She left the rest on said, but I perfectly understood. Our boys had not gotten along well after the incident, and Mary was right. The new house had been a great fresh start and it came with great changes, but we had settled here, and now was as good as any other time to think about a baby. I nodded slowly. The house is a bit big for only four people. Andrew must have seen my wife googling some baby related things because he was very moody when I checked in on him during the homework time. Hey, what's wrong? You know that I can't read your mind and just tell why you're upset. He looked angry and confused. Why do you want another baby? The last time did not work out very well. He said, showing me clearly that he was still not completely happy with his brother. I had to swallow a lump and remind myself that he was allowed to be upset. It's okay to feel like this, but your mom and I would still like to have a bigger family. And I'm sure that you will be best friends with another baby in no time. He nodded slowly and I could swear I could watch actual wheels turn in his head. 
then, like nothing happened, he just asked for cookies. Kids are weird, man. I woke up because Andrew was screaming bloody murder. I rushed into his room to see him clutching his arm. His pajamas tinted in a shade of red they should not display, and crying his eyes out. I was close to a panic attack at this point, but after cleaning his arm in the bathroom and assessing the damage, I could see that they were nasty scratches for sure, but nothing I couldn't treat at home. Mary, still drowsy from taking a sleeping pill this evening, tended to Tim whilst I bandaged Andrew's arm. He insisted that he had been wakened by the tooth fairy who wanted to steal his arm, but he could pull away, hence the scratches. He described her with a hideous face and lumpy hair, and was adamant that she had come out of his closet. Coincidentally, in which his Halloween costume, consisting of a mask depicting a monster and a cheap wig, waited for its great debut on Old Hollow's Eve. Of course we made sure to check the entire house for any fairies and let Andrew sleep in our bed that night, but it was still deeply unsettling for this to happen now. We brought it up with our therapist and asked her what could be the cause of Andrew doing that to himself. She reassured us that well it was concerning and we should monitor sharp objects in his vicinity even more, it was most probably a cry for more intention and that we should focus on bonding with him more in the next few weeks. So we asked Mary's parents for their help and organized the next Saturday to revolve entirely around Andrew. His brother stayed with his grandparents and we took Andrew to his favorite museum, the park, and let him choose a new toy at the mall. He seemed to enjoy it, but he clung to my hand almost the entire time. Even after countless reassuring promises that he still was our little boy, and of course he was equally as important as his brother and any potential future siblings, he still refused to admit that he scratched himself. We could only make him promise to yell for help should this ever happen again. He seemed a bit more at ease after this, and we went to pick up Tim from my in-laws. Our dinner was peaceful with both boys eating their vegetables and no food being thrown. I really thought we were doing okay. What a fool I was. The next morning, Andrew's bandages were stripped away and the wounds opened again. He hadn't called for help or screamed when it happened, which only made us more sure that he was doing this for attention. Even our therapist couldn't tell us what was wrong and just strongly advised us to put gloves on his hands. In case he did it subconsciously and let him sleep in our room. But that did not help at all. The next week, every day Andrew woke up with bloody arms, each day looking more devastated. It took a toll on us all, of course. Mary was constantly torn between nightmares and insomnia to the point where I had to promise to hold watch so that she could take some sleeping pills and sleep for a few hours. The next weekend we had another day just with Andrew, letting Tim stay with his grandparents again. He could not thank Mary's parents enough. Andrew's mood seemed to brighten a little and he enjoyed himself when we visited a petting zoo, and he could see his favorite animal, mountain goats. He was chattering the entire way home, giving us bits of information about the animal with the occasional plea to build a mountain in the garden, such that some ghosts might move in there. It was almost as if we had our boy back, he even played with Tim in the evening, both of them racing through the entire house until Tim almost tripped over the rug in the living room and we called them both to the dinner table. The next morning was the first in almost two weeks where I did not wake up to the sight of Andrew clutching his arm. Instead, he was sleeping soundly in his bed, not reacting at all when I quietly called out for him. I almost wept in joy when I realized he had finally slept through the night. Even Mary was still sleeping. So, I decided to make some breakfast. It had been a long time since we had some breakfast in bed. 
Tim was quietly playing in his room, and he did not want to help me prepare the food, so I went to freshen up in the bathroom before heading into the kitchen. When I came back to wake up Mary and Andrew, I was in for a nasty surprise. Neither of them were waking up. My heart almost stopped when I realized that the sleeping Andrew had his blanket draped over him in a way that concealed a huge puddle of blood pooling near his stomach, and that he was missing a good part of the skin on his hand. My heart sank so far down into my stomach upon the sight. I immediately called an ambulance, even more worried when I realized that Mary was also unconscious. What had happened here? Both were breathing, although I only now noticed that Andrew's breathing was way too shallow. I tried to put a bandage on Andrew's hand, but it was soaked in seconds. How long had he been bleeding? Only when I heard the sirens in the distance did I remember Tim. Oh no, what if he saw any of this? I raced to his room, but I could not find him anywhere. Everything was a mess. When the paramedics and police arrived, they instantly transported my wife and son to the hospital. But the police urged me to stay behind because they had a few questions for me. It quickly became clear that they were not treating me as a suspect, and also not concerned for the safety of Tim. Instead, they asked me if we had been to the park with him in the last few weeks. What an odd question that had been at that time. My entire family was in shambles, my wife and son in the hospital and my other son missing, and they were worried about the park. I almost lashed out at them, but they managed to rob me of all my energy quickly with some information. Sir, your son was seen in the park talking to his old acquaintances. Is it possible that he regained his memory? I almost fainted at that thought. Now, you see, Tim had always been... special. When he was little, his mood had changed very quickly, as it was with most children. But when he got older, his mood swings got worse and alternated between him being a relatively normal little boy and him doing the most vicious things. When he was a toddler, he would always throw anything in his immediate vicinity at Mary and me until we had to secure most cabinets and dressers such that he did not have access to them. On his ninth birthday, he had threatened Mary with the knife with which she wanted to cut his birthday cake, because he changed his mind last minute and didn't want chocolate cake anymore. When he was 12, his school informed us that he had been caught smoking with some older boys just outside the school premises. We put him in therapy and it seemed to improve his behavior somewhat. His therapist said that there was no diagnosis for his behavior, but that that could change once he reached 18, and then he could also be medicated. Oh, how we were looking forward to that. When he was 14, he ran away. It felt incredibly wrong, but Mary and I almost cried happy tears when the police told us they couldn't locate him. After half a year, Mary fell pregnant, and although we had not planned for that at all, we decided to keep the baby. Our baby boy Andrew was born a happy and healthy boy. Sure, he also cried a lot and was not the easiest baby, but compared to Tim, he was the best behaved and sweetest little angel. Andrew never knew his violent older brother and we were hoping it would stay like this until he was old enough to grasp the concept of mental health and its problems. But then when Andrew was five, Mary got pregnant again, this time with a baby girl. We were happy. This time it was planned. We were overjoyed, but then six months pregnant, Mary got a phone call from the police telling us that Tim was back, and he was back with a serious drug problem. Of course, we sent him to the best rehab facility we could find, but that just made him angry. After seven weeks, he escaped and paid us a visit at home. We argued, and I attempted to get him in my car to bring him back to the facility. 
But even though he was weak from rehab, he lunged forward and managed to push Mary. If only we hadn't been standing right next to the open front door. If only I had a better grasp on his arms. If only Mary had been standing further in the hallway. My poor Mary tumbled down the three steps and suddenly there was so much blood everywhere. In the panic and mess, Tim escaped. Mary got transported to the hospital, but that night I almost lost her. We lost our baby, but the doctors could revive Mary, thank God. This time is still hazy for me. I don't remember everything correctly, but one week after Mary had been sent home from the hospital, we were called to the psych ward. Tim had been admitted there after he had been treated for an overdose. Somehow it had erased his memory almost completely. Mentally, our son was five years old again. The doctors and psychiatrists assured us that this was uncommon, but most probably permanent. Now the sight of him triggered so many emotions, most of them bad, but after half a year, we were asked to take him home. Because he seemed stable and couldn't stay at the psych ward full time, we said yes. He would be in daycare during work hours, where he would receive therapy and educational lessons, would be regularly assessed, and we could admit him to the ward again if we noticed anything too unusual. But we didn't. The doctors predicted that Tim would mentally stay five for the rest of his life, and with the right medication, his mood swings would be gone. This was an amazing second chance for us with him. After we had lived with Tim again for a year, we moved to the new house. You know the rest. I want to implore everyone to be very cautious. The psychiatrist theorized that Tim must have regained his memory when he visited the park where he used to meet with his friends. He must have pretended to still be five years old to get revenge on us. He must have been so angry, filled with hate and spite for us. After multiple tests, doctors confirmed that Tim had mixed sleeping pills into our dinner to render us incapable of reacting to his vile doings for so long. He could hurt Andrew easily, using his Halloween costume to fool Andrew and to make us believe our sweet little boy would hurt himself. When he had accidentally put too much in our food and realized that he had made a mistake, he fled, the police said. I am beyond devastated. Mary and Andrew haven't woken up so far, and I feel like I'm going insane without them. Every day I read to them and I talk to them, but I just want to see my wife smile again, or hear Andrew giggle. But what pushed me over the edge was the news the police brought me today. Tim had tried to do it again, with another family two states over. The local police forces have dubbed him the Bone Fairy, after everything they knew about our case. Please, everyone, be safe out there. You haven't heard about the dark web? My friend Jason expressed to me. No, why would I have? It's this place where you can find some of the weirdest stuff on the internet. I've tried to look for things myself, but I've never really found anything cool. Sounds dumb. It's not. I'm sure there's some weird stuff on there, I just haven't found any. Look, how about after college I come over to yours and I can install this browser? The two of us can look on this together. I really couldn't be bothered with all the hassle, however, the expressive nature of his tone made me fold into letting him install this browser onto my computer. He was a computer nerd, so I just trusted him with that stuff. I was unfamiliar with this sort of thing. I never told him this, but Jason was my best friend. He was always there for me when I lost my mom and was just a very funny guy. He always used to play the most creative pranks on me. This might be cringy to some of you, but I gave him this wristband as a gift when I was younger for helping me through those times. He wore it quite a lot, so clearly he valued our friendship. 
He was really like a brother to me. Jason came to my house later that day and installed the software. We had a few drinks after that, and later on in the day, he left to go home and play some World of Warcraft. He was obsessed with that game. You see, I never really had any intention of going onto this dark web browser. Jason wanted me to explore it myself to see if I could find anything, but I really didn't care. For the next two days, I pretended to use the browser. When Jason asked me what I found, I just gave him short answers. Yeah, I looked and haven't seen anything cool or interesting. Sorry, man. Jason let out an elongated sigh in disappointment every time. After the week was finished, I was in my room profoundly bored. You see, I lived alone in a small apartment. It was actually a place owned by my father, however, he let me stay in it, as it was really close to my college. I didn't spend that much time in that apartment. I liked to go out with my other friends, have drinks, go to watch sports matches, and spend time at the local arcade. On this Friday night, many of my friends didn't have time for me. Some of them were going to a concert which was already sold out. Jason was alone in his apartment feeling unwell. Another one of them had things to do with their partner too. I was left single in this tiny apartment with not an awful lot of entertainment. So, my stale state of affairs got the better of me. I made myself a cup of coffee and sat in isolation by my computer desk. I decided to use the browser Jason had installed to see if I could actually find anything of interest. When I opened the software, I was surprised to see that it looked like any other natural browser. It was called Doorfront, which I thought was an extremely bizarre title. It had everything you'd expect. A search bar, some tabs at the top of the screen, and some colorful touches to the background of the page. My eyes skimmed across all the tabs, and everything seemed exactly like Google. In the corner of the browser, something caught my eye. There was a smaller link which had a different color than the rest of the headings. It read, Show me something I might not want to see. All of the other links were blue, however this one was in a dark red, hidden away carefully in the corner of the page. Naturally, human beings are suckers for doing the opposite of what is told to them. I told you not to think about elephants. You think about elephants. Naively, I pressed on the link expecting to see some really messed up stuff. After a few seconds of tense waiting, I was pushed to a new page. I was stunned to see that the page displayed the image of a goat. That's it. Just an image of a goat. It looked like it was laughing and had its tongue out skewed at a 90 degree angle. Immediately I thought this link was some sort of troll. I smirked at how random this was, however the link was still in that corner of the screen. Again, I pressed on it. This time I was presented with a Wikipedia page of a war that took place in Egypt during the early 1000s. After a few more clicks I realized what this show me something I might not want to see link actually was. It was a random search of the internet. Kind of a cool concept, however I wasn't seeing anything cool or interesting. Just as I was about to stop pressing this random internet search button, I was taken to a type of page I'd never seen before. It was a chat room with a distinct red background. It had a large chat box and also featured webcam images. Almost identical to how something like Omega looks except with a more sinister tone. Thankfully, my webcam wasn't on. And it seemed like the other webcam was off too, as all I saw were two black squares. I just sort of stared into the dark screen for a few seconds before perceiving that this page was probably broken. I was moving the mouse towards the X at the top right of the tab when suddenly, user 274 started typing. I waited anxiously for a few seconds before seeing, hello there with a winky face. 
Talking to strangers at 11.45 p.m. wasn't really of interest to me. On this night, however, I was alone with no friends, so I decided to reply. I let out an enthusiastic, Hi. After a few long, awkward seconds, they started typing again. What are you doing right now? This seemed like a forward question, however, I lousily answered. Not much, TBH. I was already getting bored. Pressing the random internet search button was more fun than engaging in small talk with a random person. I moved the mouse over towards the show me something I might not want to see button. After a firm click, it appeared that the link was now not working for some strange reason. The person in the chat room started typing again. Me too. I'm looking for someone to talk to. I haven't been feeling well lately. This made me feel guilty, however, I really couldn't be bothered engaging in chit-chat. I then decided to press the X to close the tab. To my shock, it would not respond to my clicks on the button. It appeared that I was internet-stranded in this weird, creepy chat room. Before I could even reply to the previous message, the user in the chat started to type again. Why would you want to leave me? My heart froze. Did they know that I tried to exit the chat room? Could they perhaps see what I was seeing on my computer? Stupidly, I decided to reply to the person. Hi, sorry. I just want to search the internet. I think my browser is frozen, though. The user started typing almost instantaneously. No, it's not. What do you mean? I asked, whilst bewildered. Your browser isn't frozen. There was a dead silence before they promptly messaged. I just decided to pause you. I started to sweat profusely. My hands began to shake as I typed in my concerned queries. I don't understand. The anxiety and fear was starting to hit me hard. I was sat alone in a small room in the pitch dark. The only light source was the radiant computer screen which lit up my face. They typed for a while and said, I didn't want you to leave like the rest of them. Don't worry, I have plans for us. My fear levels raised even higher. What did this creep want with me? They started typing again as my mind was struggling to process the freaky conversation that was unraveling. I need you to do something for me. Could you turn on the webcam, please? By this stage, I'd completely forgotten about the fact this was even an option. My eyes were frozen with fear on the chat box for so long that the two black boxes were totally neglected. I hesitantly decided to reply. No, I don't want to turn it on. Surprisingly, I was hit with the longest dead silence so far. The other person stopped typing for quite some time. In this period, I once again tried to press the X to close the tab. It still refused to let me off this chat space. Almost instantly, after I tried this, the user started typing again. If you try to leave again, something really bad will happen. Stop trying it. My heart felt like it was trying to break out of my chest. I began to tremble as I typed. What do you want from me? They instantly responded with, Turn on the webcam. No, why would I do that? I just want to see you react to something. Part of me was tempted to just press the webcam on button. Maybe if I reacted to whatever this freak wanted, he'd leave me the hell alone. Nevertheless, I stood firm that I was not going to turn on the webcam. I'm not going to do that. Can you please just leave me alone? All of a sudden, something strange happened. My mouse was completely frozen. No matter how I moved it, the cursor was stuck near the bottom of the screen. The user started typing. Fine. I'll do it myself, then. I read in confusion before I was drawn to something horrifying. The cursor started to move on its own accord. 
I held a shaky stare as I watched it slowly move towards the webcam on text. Before I knew anything else, the button was pressed and my webcam was on. I saw my startled, shaky face pop up in the black box for a few seconds. Very quickly I put my hand over the webcam and covered it with a firm grip. The person started typing again. Now I've seen what you look like. Wow. Move your hand right now. I need you to see this. I didn't oblige, and if anything I further tightened my grip on the webcam camera. By this stage my instinct started to kick in, and I realized how messed up this whole situation was. Whoever this was, must have been hacking my computer somehow. I decided to press the power off button on the side of my computer. It didn't work. How can the power button on my computer not work? I watched in terror as the person typed again. I told you, if you tried to do that again, something bad would happen. I don't think you understand how serious I am, Jordan. I felt my soul leave my body. Jordan was my name. They somehow got information on who I am. I never told them my name or anything about myself. All of a sudden, I could see them begin to type again. Look, I mean you, no harm. If you just show your face and let me see your reaction, I'll leave you alone. I decided to do something very stupid. Going through it in my head, what was the worst that could happen if they saw my face? They might actually leave me alone. My grip loosened and I slowly moved my hand from covering the webcam. My worried expression now showed on the screen for this crazy person to see. The user started to type again. Perfect. Enjoy. Enjoy what? I thought in my head. I stared at the screen for what might have been minutes and absolutely nothing happened. Only thing I could do was look at my own trembling face. Eventually, the other screen started to flicker, and it appeared that this user had now turned on their webcam. I couldn't make out what I was looking at. There was a dim light and also some glass. I then suddenly heard the opening of a door. I now realized what I was looking at. It appeared that this camera feed was coming from the inside of a car. Whoever was on the other end had left the webcam of what I presumed was a laptop, facing towards the car door. When the car door opened, I gasped as I saw a figure in a dark hooded coat just stand there menacingly. They leaned in and looked directly into the webcam. I could see that they were wearing a dark ski mask. The person then raised their hand slowly and waved directly at the camera, directly at me. The person then did a quick 180 degree turn and began to walk the opposite direction away from the car. As the person visibly got smaller, I could see more and more about where this person was parked as they left the car door open. In the darkness, I could vaguely make out some garden decorations, and a house number 16 that was illuminated by the dim street lights. It was at that moment when it hit me. I was horrified to see that this person had parked his car outside of Jason's house. I could see from the webcam in the car that this dark figure was just standing outside his front door in the middle of the night. The hooded person appeared to press on the doorbell. I ran straight to my phone which was on the desk behind me to call Jason. I needed to warn him not to open the door. My brain still wasn't processing all that was happening. How did this person know Jason's address? The phone rang for what felt like years. No answer. I tried to call again. No answer. I muttered, no, 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 under my breath. The no's gradually getting louder as the seriousness of this messed up situation hit me. I ran outside and got in my car. Frantically, I began to drive to Jason's house. He only lived a few minutes away from me, so I knew I could get there fast. On my way there, I called the police. 
I tried to explain the situation to them, but I was panicking so much that every other word was mumbled. They understood enough to send help to Jason's house as soon as possible. As I turned the corner to Jason's street, I looked right towards his house. To my shock, the car from which I was witnessing this whole thing was no longer there. Jason's front door was visibly left wide open. I bursted out of my car and ran into his house. Jason, Jason. I called out into the many rooms of his home. I wildly looked around his house, but there was no sign of Jason anywhere. I checked the basement, the toilets, the closets, everywhere you could think of. Jason was nowhere to be seen. Everything became blurry. The anxiety, the panic, the fear, it all began to get too much. Mentally, I couldn't take it. My friend was gone and I had no idea where he was. A thought hit me in amongst my emotional breakdown. I still didn't end the chat that I was in with whoever this creep was. Maybe there was a chance the webcam was still on and I could figure out where he went. I sprinted back to my car and started to hurry home. I was going about 20 miles over the limit but the journey felt like it lasted a lifetime. After getting home, I burst out of my car without even locking it. Suddenly, I slowed down as I noticed a small piece of cloth located just outside my front door. My heart was in my mouth as slowly I approached this dark red cloth. It was placed by my front door without any real care. My eyes were drawn to a piece of paper that was tucked under the cloth. I could see that on the opposite side of this piece of paper there was writing. Rapidly, I flipped the paper over. It read, Show me something I might not want to see. The words chilled my spine. Slowly I began to unravel the cloth with my shaky hands. The cloth felt really wet, but it needed to be opened one way or another. Something slipped out of the cloth and hit the floor with a mush sound. I looked under the cloth I was holding and began to scream. A human hand had fallen out of the piece of cloth. The hand was covered in blood and there was an item located next to the body part. It was a wristband. Jason's wristband. I screamed in horror and fell to my knees as the realization hit me. It's been a few months since this event. The police conducted searches in the local area, however they never found Jason. I told them about everything that happened regarding the chat room and messages. They didn't help at all. I moved back in with my dad shortly after this event and also sold my computer after doing a factory reset. I couldn't find the link to the chat room that I'd previously been in, so what was the point anymore? So much about that night doesn't make sense. I play it over in my mind every single day, but I can't figure it out. Can anyone help me rationalize this? There's only one thing that ultimately matters. I lost my best friend. The person who was always there for me. I haven't given up on you, Jason. If you're still out there, I promise I'll find you. It was my uncle's fault for dying. That might sound insensitive, but it's the truth. Because if he hadn't died, I wouldn't have found myself in the unfortunate position of cleaning out his house. And if I hadn't been cleaning, then I never would have had to deal with the rats at all. Here's the thing about rats. Most people just think of them as slightly bigger mice. Heck, I used to think that. In fact, I thought rats were pretty cool, and even wanted one for a pet when I was younger. But there's a big difference between the cute little guys you see at PetSmart and the real deal. Allie and Gutter will chew through the floorboards to get to your pantry kind of rats. The ones that fester in the shadows, bearing teeth that are way too long and glaring with eyes that are way too intelligent. 
The ones that hiss and lunge and scrabble around inside the walls. The ones that keep you up during the night and make your life hell during the day. All I can say is, Ratatouille lied. Rats are not your friends. They're mean, they're scary, and they're huge. I once saw one that was so big, I initially mistook it for a cat, and subsequently moved out of that apartment as quickly as I could. Not that it did me much good, because there I was, cleaning out Uncle Rob's disgusting condominium and dealing with rats all over again. Look, I truly don't have anything against my uncle. I barely knew him, so I'm not about to go making a bunch of assumptions about his character. I'm sure he was a great guy, or at the very least, wasn't up to anything notably immoral. And the last thing I need right now is to be haunted by an estranged relative, so I really don't want to risk speaking ill of the dead or whatever. But there is absolutely no reason that any human being should be living in that level of filth. When I say filth, I'm not talking about a sloppy bachelor pad. I'm certainly not the cleanest guy myself, so I can look past the occasional pile of takeout containers or a stack of old beer cans. Weird smell coming from the sink. No big deal. Dirty laundry on the floor. That's normal. What's not normal is the downright abhorrent living conditions of Uncle Rob's place. Literally every surface was covered in grime, mold, or both. A thick layer of dust was caked onto everything from the floorboards to the top of the fridge. Some sort of slime that I couldn't quite identify dripped from the ceiling and down the wall in places, forming vicious little puddles where it reached the ground. The stove and plumbing were rusted beyond what should have been possible, and gaping holes punched through the walls to reveal pipes that were... equally corroded. A few inches of brown, tepid sludge, trying its best to pass for water and failing miserably, pooled at the bottom of the toilet and the shower. Mountains of garbage transformed the relatively small condo into a twisted labyrinth. The kitchen sink was filled with what looked like clumps of hair mixed with human feces, and the insides of both the oven and the microwave were splattered with something equally foul. The withered corpses of spiders, centipedes, and roaches were sprinkled about like confetti, and as I walked through the house, they'd crunch under my shoes like the worst percussion solo you've ever heard. And the smell. Gosh, the smell. It was unbearable. That's really the only word I can think of to describe it, and it doesn't even come close to doing it justice. It was so bad that the first time I opened the front door, I nearly passed out from the sudden wave of pungent waste. The stench just about knocking me off my feet. Coughing, eyes stinging with sudden tears. I'd briefly wondered if maybe they'd forgotten to remove Rob's body after they'd found it, but even a two-week-old rotting corpse couldn't have smelled that bad. That was the first time I considered calling up my mom and telling her that there was no way in hell I'd be cleaning Rob's house. And it wasn't the last. But there wasn't really much I could do. I'd been taking a gap year for the past three years in a row, and the only thing I had going for me was my job at the 7-Eleven. I didn't have friends, or a girlfriend, or even a dog. My days were usually spent mindlessly scrolling the internet, watching TV, and making half-hearted attempts to figure out what to do with my life. Painful as it is to admit, I was aimless, living paycheck to paycheck in a state of perpetual stagnation. So between my comparatively free schedule, and the fact that I only lived one town over from Uncle Rob and was therefore the closest, it made more sense for me to be the one to clean out his place, rather than any of my extended family. Plus, my mother said she'd pay me 200 bucks, so there was that. I eventually decided to just suck it up and get to work. The sooner I finished, the sooner I'd never have to go back and I had already resolved that throwing in the towel wasn't an option. 
I didn't want to give my family one more reason to make disappointed comments about me behind my back. Maybe completing this task would be a step in the right direction, or at least a tally in the not completely useless box. I just needed to get it over with. It wouldn't take too long, right? It wasn't like I was getting the place ready to sell or anything. Just clearing out the trash, rubbing off the mold, and boxing up Rob's stuff. It shouldn't have taken more than a few days. A week and multiple Amazon searches for hazmat suits later, I'd barely made a dent in the mess. To make matters worse, that dent was just enough for me to finally start noticing the rats. Before, there'd been enough junk piled up everywhere that I wouldn't have noticed a moose if it was standing right in front of me. Not to mention, most of my conscious energy was going towards keeping myself from keeling over from the stench. Airing out the place wasn't working, and neither was Febreze. The only thing that mildly dampened the constant sledgehammer like assault on my olfactory nerve was my rapidly dwindling supply of face masks left over from the pandemic. I guess the pandemic was good for something after all, but as I gradually filled garbage bags and dumpsters, slowly but surely reducing those disgusting mountains of hoarded filth into molehills, I began to catch glimpses of them. A thin tail whipping around the corner of a teetering tower of moldy magazines, beady red eyes gleaming from between torn strips of wallpaper, before suddenly winking away. Shadowy figures racing around in my peripheral vision, bristly scratching beneath the floorboards, in the walls, from within the cupboards and couch cushions. The pitter-patter of unsettlingly tiny feet whittling away at my last dregs of sanity. It only took them a couple of days to get used to my presence, and they seemed to decide that I wasn't much of a threat soon after. Who could blame them? My decidedly unmanly shrieks each time I came across one of them made it clear that I wasn't the one wearing the pants in this relationship. My prior experiences with rats made me particularly jumpy, and while I wouldn't have called it a full-fledged phobia at the time, they definitely picked up on my fear and unease. So, they stopped bothering to hide. Instead, they'd hiss at me when I got too close to their nests. They'd pop out of the Swiss cheese walls like jack-in-the-boxes if I tried to remove the goopy, rotten crud that I guess they were saving for later. They really didn't want me interfering with leftover night. And they'd even charge directly at me on the rare occasion that I mustered up enough courage to take a swing at them with a broom. It got to the point where they were just leaping out and taking what they wanted, when they wanted it. Rats have been the devil's employee of the month for the last several millennia, and they weren't about to stop on my account. The worst part was, there was nothing I could do about it. I tried poison, I tried traps, I tried cleaning faster, hoping that cutting down on the trash would at least prevent more from coming, but no matter what I did, nothing worked. The rat problem just kept getting worse and worse, and with each rodential jump scare, whatever remained of my sense of masculinity would slowly crumble away. Finally, I decided enough was enough. It was time to splurge on an exterminator. I started by googling exterminators near me. Apparently, life wasn't done kicking me in the teeth yet because if the house and the rats weren't enough, now my phone was acting up. It took an unusually long time to load, almost five minutes, and colored pixels were flickering on and off the screen. I tried to shut the phone down a few times, but it wouldn't even turn off. It just kept loading the search engine. It finally finished buffering, and I nearly screamed when I saw that Google had given me exactly one search result. One. That shouldn't even be possible. Clearly, my phone was infected with some sort of virus. I groaned. One more thing to worry about on top of everything else. 
the map feature was glitching out too, so I couldn't even tell how near me this exterminator was. All I could see was the company name and a phone number just beneath it. The Rat Catcher. I frowned. The name seemed a bit on the nose and hyper-specific for a professional exterminator. Then again, it was memorable and catchy which is the main goal for any small business. And rats were my primary problem. So I clicked on the phone number. Despite whatever virus was currently wreaking havoc on my phone, the call went through. And a dial tone briefly sounded. Almost immediately, someone answered. You've reached the rat catcher. How can I help you? It was a man's voice. He sounded extremely bored and maybe even a little annoyed, as if me calling was some terrible inconvenience. Uh, yeah, hi. I, uh, there's, there's rats. A lot of rats. I face palmed as I spoke, mentally berating myself for being completely incapable of eloquent speech. Luckily, the man on the phone seemed to understand what I was trying to say. Alright, what's your address? I gave it to him. I heard the click clack of a keyboard on the other end. And then, it looks like we already have your address on file. Just then a rat jumped out at me from one of the mini holes in the wall. I screamed and battled it away. It hit the floor with a thud and hissed angrily as it righted itself. It scampered into the other room. I let out a shuddering breath. Sir? The man on the phone was saying. Despite having definitely heard me scream moments before, he sounded as disinterested as ever. Yeah, sorry, I'm here, I said. Damn rats. I asked if you've hired the rat catcher, the pipe man, or the electrician in the past. No, I, well, this is my uncle's place, so maybe he... My brain finally caught up to his words. Wait, what? family business, he explained. If you've hired any of them before, you'll get a discount. Oh, it looked like weird names were genetic then. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe my uncle did? I don't live here. The man made a non-committal hum. Make sure you're there when the rat catcher comes, he said, or you'll have to reschedule. Then he hung up. For a second, I just stared at the phone in disbelief. He hung up on me. What the hell? I wondered if I'd somehow gotten scammed, but I hadn't given the guy any payment information. An address, sure, but it's not like there was anything in Rob's place worth stealing. The absolute worst case scenario was some psychopath posing as an exterminator so he could kill me. And that didn't seem very likely. Something still wasn't right, though. The man on the phone hadn't told me, well, anything, really. Not rates, not availabilities. He hadn't even told me when to expect the rat catcher, only that I needed to be there. What did that mean? Did I have to stay at Uncle Rob's place overnight until the rat catcher showed up? I didn't think I could handle that, physically or mentally. Maybe I should just head home, use my laptop to find an exterminator that was less sketchy and go from there. Or maybe the guy on the phone had simply forgotten to give me the rest of the information. Everyone makes mistakes after all, and I could solve the whole problem with another painfully awkward phone call. I was seriously considering redialing the rat catcher's number when three knocks sounded at the front door. I looked down at my phone, which had finally quit glitching. Then back at the door. There was no way the rat catcher could have gotten there that quickly. Then again, there wasn't really anyone else it could be. I gingerly stepped over a pile of dead bugs that I'd swept up earlier, kicked at a rat that was gnawing on a strip of wallpaper, and opened the door. I'd been expecting a middle-aged man with a beer belly, 
decked out in a jumpsuit and rubber boots. Carrying, I don't know, whatever exterminators carry over his shoulder. Like the guy from Over the Hedge. But the sight that greeted me could not have been more different. The rat catcher was a girl. Not just any girl, a cute girl. She looked about my age, maybe a year or two younger. Her honey blonde hair was shortish with bangs and freckles dusted her face. Her eyes were a bright enough green that I wondered if they were colored contacts. She wore a sunny yellow Guns N' Roses t-shirt, a jean skirt, and faded sneakers. Hi, she said smiling widely. Her teeth were white, almost too white, like she just walked off the set of a Colgate commercial. You must be James. At the time, I didn't think about how there was no way she could have known my name, seeing as I hadn't even had a chance to give it to the man on the phone. I just nodded stupidly. As I floundered, trying and failing to form words into a cohesive sentence, she cheerfully bounced on the balls of her feet. You are the rat catcher? I finally stammered out. I immediately winced, realizing how it sounded a second too late. Thankfully, she didn't seem offended. Instead, she threw her head back and laughed. It was wonderful. It felt like the sun shining through clouds after it's been raining all day. Like your long lost dog finally coming home. Like the first sip of soda on a hot summer afternoon. Like... I get that a lot, she said. So I hear you've got a rat problem? At this, I finally shook my head out of my stupor. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty bad. I stepped aside, leaving the doorway open for her to enter. I turned around to show her into the condo, gesturing at the various visible rats as I went. Sorry about the mess. I don't know if the guy on the phone told you, but this is my uncle's place, and... I suddenly stopped, trailing off. Something felt... off. I turned around. The rat catcher hadn't followed me inside. She was still standing on the doormat, still smiling. She had her hands clasped patiently behind her back as she rocked back and forth on her heels. For a second, I just stared. I... you... you can come in, I said dumbly. Her smile grew impossibly wider and she stepped inside. As soon as she did, there was a sudden scuttling sound. Startled, I whirled around. I barely managed to catch a glimpse of the, all the previously unbothered rats scattering, disappearing into the shadows. The rat catcher let out a whistle. Wow, she chirped, cheerful as ever. I haven't seen this many in a long time. I've got my work cut out for me, huh? Though she'd seemed politely hesitant to enter the house before, she apparently didn't have much of a problem with it now. She stepped past me, peering around the room with her hands on her hips. I hung back, feeling awkward. I tried for some casual conversation. So, um, guns and roses. I began nodding at her shirt. Great band. Great band? I didn't know the first thing about Guns N' Roses. Almost as if she could tell what I was thinking, she shot me an amused grin. Then she returned to scanning the room. Well, that didn't work. Something else. Say something else. What's your name? She didn't respond. After a minute or two of silence, I shifted uncomfortably. She must not have heard me. Before I could work up the courage to ask again, she suddenly announced, I'm going to get started. And then she lunged. I yelped and jumped back instinctively, squeezing my eyes shut and throwing my arms over my head. It was really a knee-jerk response more than anything, and in my defense, 
I'd been dealing with rodent attacks for over a week now, so I was understandably high strung. Of course, nothing happened. That split second, irrational moment of terror was quickly replaced by a hot flood of embarrassment. As I prepared to give an undoubtedly pathetic excuse for my overdramatic reaction, I slowly opened my eyes. I wish I hadn't. The rat catcher was still standing in front of me. Rather than the tense, alert posture she'd held while searching the room only moments before, she'd returned to looking casually relaxed. When I met her gaze, she giggled. All sunbeams and butterflies. I couldn't smile back, though. I could barely tear my eyes away from her hand. Or rather, the thing in her hand. A giant rat squirmed and writhed in her perfectly manicured grasp. I was gaping. I knew I was, but I couldn't stop. She just... grabbed it. And she didn't seem the least bit bothered by it. Either, even as it frantically squeaked and twisted its head, trying to sink its yellow fangs into her delicate skin. How? I started fumbling for words. You... how'd you... She simply shrugged. In the dimness of the condo, her eyes seemed to glow an even brighter green, the way a cat's do when the light hits them. When you've been doing this for as long as I have, she said, you pick up a few tricks. She winked at me, and then she bit off the rat's head. I don't remember what my scream sounded like. If it was a stream of obscenities or just a wordless cry, but I'm certain that I screamed. I screamed as I flung myself backwards. I screamed as I stumbled over a pile of junk. And when I landed flat on my butt, staring up at the creature that couldn't possibly be a girl, I was still screaming. The rat catcher paid me no mind. In her hand, the rest of the rat was still twitching. Blood spurting from its neck and sending small droplets raining down on my uncle's grimy floor. Her chewing was an awful sound, tiny bones snapping and flesh squelching, and blood ran like a river down her chin. Two more bites, and then her hands were empty aside from the blood stains. She swallowed and wiped her chin with her arm, smearing a crimson streak from her elbow to her wrist. She licked the blood from each of her dainty fingertips. Then she glanced at me head tilted to the side curiously, one eyebrow raised. When she spoke, her perfectly white teeth were tinged red. You alright, James? I didn't respond. I couldn't. I just kept opening and closing my mouth soundlessly. A fish out of water. My heartbeat pounded in my ears. My entire body was shaking trembling like a leaf. I wanted to run. I wanted to run far, far away. Away from Uncle Rob's disgusting condo, and away from the rats, and away from this crazed girl who bit the heads off of live animals. But I didn't. I just sat there, on the floor, paralyzed with fear. The rat catcher gave me a knowing smile. And she set to work. The rest of the afternoon passed in a blur. At some point, I ended up on the rotting couch. It was clear of rats at that point, though there were brand new claw marks smashed through the curtains, along with flakes of black nail polish that must have chipped off in the process. And I just focused on counting the various holes in the walls. Rats weren't poking their twitchy little faces out anymore. I couldn't bring myself to feel relieved about it. Look, I hate rats. Hate them. Now, more than ever. But nothing deserves to die like that. The rat catcher was ruthlessly efficient. I'll give her that. She prowled from room to room, whistling a happy little tune to herself as she went. Sometimes I'd catch glimpses of her pouncing with inhuman speed out of the corner of my eye. 
digging her nails into soft underbellies and twisting, biting off tails and feet piece by piece while the rats shrieked. That was the worst part. The sounds they made. The sounds she made too. Crunching and slurping and splattering and tearing and laughing and gurgling and always, always the shrieking. She'd occasionally throw out some commentary that I guess was directed at me. Stuff like, the small ones are fine and all, but they're a little stringy, you know? And, I like it when they're not afraid. It's more fun when they think they have a fighting chance. And, my brother's come out this way before, but not in a while. He hates rats. And, aw, babies. You sure you don't want to come take a look, James? I didn't. I really, really didn't. Finally, she finished. She stood in front of me, bouncing on the balls of her feet just like she had on the doorstep when she'd first arrived. Her yellow shirt was splattered with viscera, none of it her own. Red speckles misted across her skin like a second layer of freckles. Blood dried stiff in her honey blonde hair. I looked at her numbly. She beamed. All done. She said in a sweet, sing-song voice, but there was a strange glint in her eyes, and I felt my pulse quicken once more. Now is when we usually negotiate the price. She continued. It was so fast I almost missed it, but I swear I saw her tongue dart across her lips. She took a step closer, and I involuntarily shrunk farther back into the couch. Her green eyes shone. Her smile was just beginning to stretch into a toothy, Cheshire grin when suddenly, the opening notes of Sweet Child of Mine rang out, blaring through the still darkness. The rat catcher paused. Something about her stance shifted turning into something that felt much less threatening. I let out a breath I hadn't known I was holding as she pulled a cell phone from the pocket of her jean skirt. Yeah? She answered. Then waited as someone on the other line spoke. No, not yet. I was just about... Oh, really? She hung up, then reached into her other pocket. She pulled out a folded slip of bright yellow paper. She unfolded it, squinting as she ran. Then she laughed. Well, aren't you lucky? She said almost teasingly. She tore the paper in half and stuck it back in her pocket. Looks like you get the discount this time. Thanks for keeping it in the family. She blew me a kiss with lips that, if I didn't know any better, I'd think were smeared with too much lipstick. Bye, James. And with that, the rat catcher skipped out the door, slamming it shut behind her. Well, I might not know exactly what the typical price for the rat catcher services is, I've got a vague idea, and I'm glad I didn't have to pay it. Sure, she did a great job getting rid of the rats, but she also left scratches, blood stains, and a boatload of trauma that I don't think going to a therapist will fix. I guess it could be worse. Even if I could find the rat catcher online, seriously, it's like she disappeared off the face of the internet. And even the phone number is gone from my call history. I'd be too chicken to leave a low business review. What would I say anyway? One out of five stars. Made a mess. Almost killed me. As if anyone would believe me. I know I wouldn't. At the end of the day, I'm really just lucky to have escaped the encounter alive. Not as lucky as I could be, though, because I think I have finally figured out what made all those holes in the walls. See, it looks like poor old Uncle Rob needed a plumber at some point, and going by the long, grasping arms that are now reaching out from every pipe and drain and faucet, it's not too difficult to guess who he called. I'm pretty sure I know why Rob's place was such a mess when I got here. Why he never did anything about the rats. After all, her brother hates rats.
This happened a long time ago. I was many years younger then, and so many years less experienced. I was recruited for a job aboard a research submarine, exploring the waters around my hometown. Reports of strange aquatic animal behaviors had been surfacing all along the coast, and being familiar with the field of marine biology, I was all too willing to help investigate. I signed up for the job without hesitation, needing both the work experience and the money. I wasn't all too familiar with submarines, however. When I arrived at the beach, I was surprised to discover that the vessel would have a crew of only two other people. I ran up to the pill-shaped contraption, which was being loaded with all manner of strange equipment that I hadn't seen before. The two men hauling equipment into it were almost polar opposites in appearance. One had dark, clean-cut hair, a bulky build, and a hard look in his eye. He was wearing what looked to be a scuba suit. The other was short and lean, with a sandy, tussled mane of hair and a more jovial, optimistic look about him. As I stepped onto the dock, the blonde one stopped to greet me. He held out his hand and shook mine with a grin. Pleased to meet you, he said in a friendly tone. I'm Sam. I'm gonna be your captain for the next few days while we get this whole situation figured out. What's your name? Danny. I smiled back. I then reached out to shake the other man's hand. He didn't smile and curtly introduced himself as Robert. You two can climb up into the sub and sit down in the back while I get her lowered down, said Sam. I took one last look at the ocean. It was a bright, clear day, and the sea was as calm and empty as ever. I mused to myself and wondered how anything unusual could be going on in those clear waters. I clambered in, closely followed by Robert, and then Sam a few minutes later, who latched the door behind him. It was much colder in the submarine, and being packed so close together with the cramped metal walls made me feel a bit claustrophobic. But I didn't have time to worry about any of that. Before I knew it, we were plunging into the water. The waves crashed against the front window as we hovered just above the surface. Outside the portholes, I could see the divide between the water and the sky. I thought to myself how different it would be. Being submerged for so long, not being able to see the sky. And then it was gone, swallowed up by the waves. The engine started with a dull roar, and we sped into the blue depths. Everything started out normal enough, so normal in fact, that I forgot all about our job. Fish darted by in shoals, then scattered as our vessel carved its path through the reef. I gazed out the windows to see crabs peeking out from behind rocks. Eels slithering in and out of crevices, and even a shark that drifted by the craft. Sam's voice brought me out of my reverie. You two seen anything strange yet? No, I replied hastily. Just that shark, Robert said gruffly. I paused for a moment. The shark wasn't strange, right? I had seen many sharks in these waters. It wasn't out of the ordinary at all. But then I looked more closely at its receding form in front of us. Something did feel off about it, but I couldn't place my finger on what. It was eventually swallowed up by the sea fog, lost from sight. Ah, I see. Sam said from the front of the sub. I say we keep a tail on it, find out where it's heading. The sub sped up, but Sam couldn't seem to find the shark. Robert was staring out his window, so I turned to look out mine. Stop the sub, he said suddenly. Why? Came an inquiry from the front. Because I've seen something. Robert said, a hint of exasperation in his voice. The craft slowed to a stop and Robert got up. Are you going out there? Asked Sam. Of course. Robert replied, already pulling on a scuba helmet. Okay, just be careful. I've done this before. He snapped back. I didn't understand why Robert had to be so standoffish. 
His unnecessary arguing made me almost want to turn the sub around and head back to shore myself. Looking back now, I wish I had. Sam led Robert into the pressure chamber, which would flush out all the seawater and make sure the pressure's changes didn't kill Robert. I could hear them scuffling around in there. For some reason, my nerves were already shot, and every bump and bang sent me into a slight panic. The walls were staring at me coldly. They were so cold, it had been a long time now. Five minutes, maybe six. I jumped when the door finally opened. Sam stepped out, sealing the chamber behind Robert. I watched as the diver swam out of the sub and along the ocean floor. Sam and I were silent. Robert stopped suddenly, digging something out of the sand. He began to swim back but then froze as if petrified. His flippers stopped moving, and he sank a few feet before he seemed to remember how to use them. When I saw what he was looking at, I gasped. It was a great white, a massive one too, but that wasn't the scariest thing. And then it hit me with what was so unsettling about the other shark. As this great white drifted right past the window, it didn't move a muscle. Its fins were completely still. Its eyes glazed over and empty. Behind those glassy eyes, there was nothing but a husk. The creature continued to float eerily, following almost the same trajectory as the other shark we saw. I turned quickly to Sam. Did you see that? But he was staring out his own window. Through it, I could see a shoal of fish. They weren't swimming, either. They were drifting lifelessly, perfectly in sync with each other. Sam turned back to me, a strange expression in his eyes. I don't know what's going on here, he said, but it's not like anything I've seen before. Just then, we were both startled by a pounding on the pressure chamber door. That, uh, that must be Robert, said Sam. Regaining his composure, he drained the chamber, then opened the door. A few drops of seawater still clung to the door frame. Robert stumbled into the room, prying off his helmet. He, too, had an expression that I hadn't seen before. If I hadn't met him, I might have mistaken it for fear. He collapsed onto the seat, and that was when I realized that he was holding something in his hands. Nasty thing. He said, parting his fingers. Like that other beast out there. I looked at the thing he was holding. It looked to be a silver surf perch, a common fish around here. On its side, though, there was a gaping wound. It looked to be a bite, but it was like no bite I had ever seen before. It was just a collection of vicious puncture marks going deep into the flesh. They oozed a disgusting green fluid. It bled out and was starting to drip all over Robert's gloved hands. Sam took a step back. What on earth? Robert, what? I was just as speechless. Is that safe? Sam followed up. It should be. Robert replied but he said it more to himself than to us. He shoved the lifeless fish into a small bag that rested next to his seat. Sam ran back to the front of the sub and started the engine. We need to follow those fish, he announced. The engine flared to life and the sub accelerated towards the empty blue waters ahead. I glanced at Robert. He seemed disgruntled, almost worried. But Robert wouldn't be worrying. Robert couldn't be worrying. I shifted in my seat and turned to look out the window. Was that a shark in the distance? No, probably just a trick of the light. I noticed we were beginning to descend along with the seafloor. The inside of the sub was getting colder, so cold that I started to shiver. I put on a heavy coat that I had been advised to pack with me. Then I saw the most terrifying thing up till that point. It was definitely a shark. Not a trick of the light because it was so close. 
It almost glided past us, like a mindless zombie, and I could see it twitching ever so slightly. Along its side were two clear bite wounds, leaking a cloud of green ooze into the water. The shark kept going, and I could see that everyone was unnerved. That was when there were more. It started as just a few more, just a light sprinkling of fish. There were some eels, a turtle, a hammerhead, all moving exactly the same. We should turn back, said Robert, making me jump again. I looked at him. Was it just the light, or did his expression seem less confident than before? Sam's voice sounded distant when I finally heard it. Turn back? Now? When we're finally getting somewhere? Then Robert stood up, bracing himself against the wall of the sub. Sam, we have to go back. Robert, please sit down. I don't see any good reason to turn back. These sea creatures are acting odd, sure, but they don't seem to have any interest in us. You don't understand. We can't keep going. This is getting bad. I turned to look out the window, and my heart dropped a few feet. There were so many more. Too many more. I could see at least five sharks right outside the window, surrounded by dozens of fish. Behind that, I could make out several more ghostly forms in the sea fog. They drifted in and out of view, but something told me that was because of the sub, not their movements. They made no movements. Outside Robert's window, it was the same. In front of us, it was the same. I looked down, only to see that the sea floor had completely dropped away from view. Below us, there was only... ghostly blue fog and somehow no aquatic creatures. It was like looking out of an airplane. Only it felt scarier because you couldn't see what was down there. It was so empty and yet I took no comfort in that emptiness. Not like before. I heard Robert's voice again. Please, this won't end well. He paused and sat down again. There's... there's... Before he could finish, a massive shadow blocked out all the light from the surface. Suddenly only a dim glow from the hull illuminated the sun. The moment was over almost as quickly as it came, but the terror was not. An enormous whale came into view above us, and for its size, it could only have been a blue whale. I had never actually seen one before, and maybe it should have been exciting, but now it only felt wrong. The animal drifted just as lifelessly through the water as all the rest. It didn't move its fins, its tail, anything. I couldn't see its eyes, but I could imagine them, all cloudy and dead. I could make out a faint trail of green following it. I thought I couldn't get any more unsettled. More scared, more terrified, but then everything stopped. All the creatures, the sharks, the fish, even the whale, they all just froze. The temperature seemed to plummet, the sub kept going. We passed under the whale again, and we continued through what could only be described as an undersea graveyard. They had to be dead, I thought, but they were so still and entirely too coordinated. Hundreds upon hundreds of empty husks. Nothing more, and yet... Was that a scratching sound coming from below the sub? I was sure I heard something. There was dripping, too. That must have been from the pressure chamber. Sam mumbled a few words from the front. I looked at Robert, who had gone as white as a skeleton. He looked like he'd seen one, too. And then he jumped to his feet so forcefully that he rocked the entire sub. Go up. He said, deadly serious, but with a slight hint of panic in his voice. Sam, I said, go up. He grabbed something that looked like a flare. Robert, you need to calm down. Sam, you need to go to the surface right now. Or one way or another, you're gonna die. I don't know if I agreed with the way Robert put it but I definitely agreed with the sentiment. Right now, my heart was clawing its way up my throat, and my arm hairs were standing straight up. 
That was definitely scratching. I thought about saying something. I hesitated. I froze up and no words ever came out. Maybe if I had said something, it wouldn't have happened the way it did. Maybe. I don't know. Sam took a deep breath from the front seat. I felt the sub slowly pull to a dead stop. The rumbling of the engine gradually tapered away into the silence that permeated the air all around us. He stood, turning to face Robert. He took another breath. The seconds crawl by like hours when I think about it. He takes another breath. There is no more scratching. There is no more dripping. The silence grows and grows, becoming this menacing thing that Sam is about to dispel with his next words. And then he breathes one last time. Crash. The hull is gone. Sam is gone. Crash. We're thrown upward and my lungs fill with water. I think I'm still in the sub. Bang. Everything hurts. I think I hear the scratching. I think I see something. I don't know what it is. Crunch. I'm thrust backwards, but an arm grabs me and I stop moving. I can't hold my breath much longer. My lungs are bursting. I think we're going up. I bump my head on something. We stop. Something pulls down on my arm. I'm coughing. I can't breathe. I... I... I can breathe. I can. I took massive gulps, inhaling the salty air as if I had never tasted oxygen before. I opened my eyes after what felt like forever. The sunlight almost blinded me at first, but I was ecstatic to see it. I also felt dizzy, faint, exhausted, and terrified. And my chest hurt. My chest really hurt. But I felt safe. Somehow not being able to see what was under the water made it all go away. I looked to my side. Robert was there. Sam wasn't. But Robert was. It took me a moment to realize that he was crying. His face was soaked, but I could see fresh tears rolling down his cheeks. Robert, are you... My voice trailed off. I'm sorry, he said. I didn't know. Didn't know what? I asked. I didn't know. I left it at that. I didn't feel like talking right now. We started swimming away. Away was the only way to go now. Eventually, we were too tired. We stopped. I saw the flare, still clutched tightly in his hand, and I asked him for it. He handed it over to me, listlessly, then turned away. It wasn't a big flare with smoke and fire. It was some sort of GPS device. I hoped that would help us, not hurt us. I pulled a little tab that activated it. Whatever happened now, help was coming soon. Robert had to keep me afloat after a while. I was cold and getting tired. Luckily, he could paddle for the both of us. Otherwise, I would have ended up dead. It only got colder and darker from there. The sun disappeared. I started to give up eventually. It was hard to breathe. I don't know how long it actually was. It felt like years. Decades. I don't know how Robert kept going. Finally, there was a light in the sky. I smiled. I hope Robert smiled too. I heard the blades of the helicopter draw closer and closer and a ladder tumbled down from above. I had never been more relieved. After that, it was a blur. A lot happened. They took us into the helicopter. We spent a while being questioned, but they were nice. Robert just kept repeating that he was sorry. I think he was in shock. I told them to look for Sam, but they said they couldn't see him. We made it to land after a while. The people on the helicopter determined that we needed medical attention, so that was what we got. The hospital was bland and stale. All I remember is what they told me. Apparently, I had nitrogen bubbles in my blood, and I was gonna die. 
Something to do with the sudden pressure change. They fixed that, though. Apparently, I also had a heart attack. They fixed that, too. I was surprised how much they fixed, and that I lived. I felt bad for Robert, though. He had a bad gash in his leg. It was bleeding that same green ooze, and the doctors couldn't figure out what it was. But they found that it contained harmful chemicals, and determined that it had to be removed. Unfortunately, the poison had spread to most of Robert's legs, so he had to get it amputated. And he really didn't deserve that. He saved my life. I made sure to thank him for it, too. It was strange, though, because when I did, he only shook his head sadly. I just couldn't understand that, man. I don't know what came of our research. Whether Robert told them anything, I never found out. I kept it private. No one would have believed me. I don't even really know what I saw. I mean, after the sub was ripped in shreds. My memories are all tangled and fuzzy. Nothing really fits right, so I left it to fate. Eventually, the reports died down, aside from a decrease in biodiversity. I don't think anything came of it. I've never taken a swim in those waters since, but that's just me being paranoid. The one thing that haunts me is the thought of Sam. They never found him. I wonder sometimes if he's still drifting down there. His face pale and gray, his eyes covered by the fog of death, not moving a muscle but still being pulled towards some singular point out in the cold. Dark. Lonely. Abyss. My wife Isabel and I met because of a murder in our freshman year at college. Her dorm had been blocked by the cops because a girl we both knew had been found stabbed 42 times in her bed. The killer has taken her eyes, mouth, nose with him. The strangest thing was that not one person in that crowded dorm heard her scream. Isabel lived a few rooms down from the scene and I saw her standing at the very center of the crowd. Her arms wrapped around Christy, the victim's roommate, who was white with shock. They looked terrified and still in their pajamas, but Isabel turned and her blue eyes met mine. Something in her gaze was so sad and scared that I knew right then in that moment I needed to protect her. I went up to ask if I could help in any way, and ended up spending the day helping Isabel look after Christy. After that, we were pretty much inseparable. I was there for her when the police announced they were trying to search for the killer but had no leads. He struck again a few towns over, exact same M.O., and then again a town over from there. The press began to call him the College Butcher. Isabel spent more time at my room after that. She was majoring in literature, so I'd find notes strewn across the room about everything from Dante's Inferno to Austin's Pride and Prejudice. I didn't mind though. Isabel was beautiful, kind, and funny and someone who had lived a very normal life until that point, so I could understand the shock. She loved her parents, had two younger sisters, and the first time I met her parents for Christmas, I almost resented my own parents for not welcoming me nearly as warmly as they welcomed us into their home. It was perfect. Too perfect, and I should have been smarter. Wiser, but I was young, stupid, and deeply in love. We got married a few years after college after I had got a job as a software developer and she had got a job working as a teacher at the local high school. We bought a house in a quiet, safe neighborhood in a quiet, safe town and for a while, everything seemed so good. For ten whole years, everything has been good. Until three weeks ago when I decided to clear out the attic because I could swear I heard something skittering up there when I was getting ready to leave in the morning. Thinking it was mice or rats, I told Isabel in the kitchen that night while she was adding the finishing touches to the bolognese and I was pouring us a couple of glasses of wine. 
I think there's something in our attic. I said casually as I passed her a glass of wine. I'm going to give it a clear out and see if it's a rat or something. When she said nothing, I looked at her face. It was completely pale and she was staring at me with something I could not place in her eyes. It wasn't fear, it was something else. Don't go up there. I'll deal with it. I frowned. I really think it's something small and I've been wanting to clean up that place for a while. Let me deal with it. She stared at me then and a sort of involuntary shudder went up my spine. Jack, do not go up there. Promise me. I nodded slowly, confused. We respected and loved each other and I wouldn't want to hurt her in any way. And given how stressed she was, I knew I had to listen to her. But she may as well have dangled a chocolate chip cookie in front of my face and told me to not ever touch it. So I waited until she left for work one morning and went up there. The attic was dark, but we had a light in the middle of the room. Regardless, I had my phone's torch I could rely on. Since ours was an older house, we had actual stairs leading up to the attic, as opposed to a ladder, and when I walked to the end of the hallway and opened the door that led to the attic, I swore I heard a creak at the top of the stairs. The kind of creak only a foot can make when it lands on a faulty floorboard. The hair at the back of my neck stood up as though a cold draft had blown into the hall. I squinted into the darkness at the top of the stairs and softly asked, H hello As the moments passed, rationality caught up with me. How stupid was I to think there was something up there? Annoyed at myself, I climbed, grasped my phone, and flicked the torch. And with more confidence than I truly possessed, I walked up the stairs, listening to each stair creak as I did. The attic was creepier than I remembered it. It was actually a space I had planned to convert into a game room of sorts, but Isabel had talked me out of it. And honestly, over the years, I had forgotten how big it was. It was your average attic in many ways. Dusty, wooden floors, a small window at the end of the room overlooking the neighborhood, but it was spacious. Sure, it held all our old junk, but even so, the boxes and a couple of pieces of old furniture took up such little space at the far end of the room. I remember thinking how nice skylights would be in the sloping ceiling. Why had Isabel, who was so organized and wanted all the rooms in the house to be used so keen to leave this as it was, a slight unease had started to make its way around the corners of my mind. As if on autopilot, I walked to the end of the attic where the five boxes which contained Isabel's things were lying. Part of me was screaming that this was a massive invasion of her privacy, but I didn't care by that point. I wanted to see what was in there that was making my wife act so strange about this particular room. I sat cross-legged on the dusty floor and pulled the box to me, opening it up. The first box was just some old clothes that she had kept for sentimental value. T-shirts signed by friends, a few old sweatshirts, nothing that really piqued my curiosity. The next box was just some old books which she didn't want to part with but for some reason wouldn't keep in the bookcases I had built her in the living room. When I reached the third box, something in me hesitated. I think a part of me knew that my life was going to change after I opened this box. Some strange sixth sense. Carefully I unsealed the box and looked inside, and a sigh of relief overcame me. It was just framed photographs and a photo album. I smiled and lifted the first one, Isabel and her sisters laughing as children at her fourth birthday. Some were of her parents and others of us. Then something struck me. Why hadn't she put this photo up downstairs? That weird chill was back. The box only held a large brown leather photo album now, and my heart racing, I opened it to its first page. It was a large black and white photo of a small girl on a swing facing away from the camera. That in itself was creepy, but the creepiest thing about the photo 
was another little girl in a white dress who was standing at the edge of the woods looking at the girl on the swing. It was almost as if she was looking at me through the photo. The next page had the same little girl on the swing playing on the jungle gym, smiling as she swung from the bars. Behind her, the strange little girl stood, watching her every move, her eyes cold, her mouth a thin line. Page after page of this little girl living her life and the strange girl standing on the edges watching her. As the girl grew up, I recognized her to be... Isabel. And the girl watching her looked like her. A darker, angrier version of her. I swallowed hard watching my wife's doppelganger grow closer, seeing photos of her in my room with the shadow of herself watching her. My vision swam and I felt sick. Snapping the album shut, I wedged it under my arm and fled the attic, taking the stairs two steps at a time from the attic. As I closed the door and leaned my head against it, I took a slow, shuddering breath. What is going on? That evening, I waited for my wife to come home at the kitchen table, nursing my strongest whiskey in my hand as she walked in through the kitchen door. Hi, hun. She greeted me with a kiss and dumping the shopping bags full of groceries on the table. How was your day? I paused and slowly cleared my throat. I found it, Isabel. She was pulling the milk out and was about to turn to the fridge to stack it when I said this. She frowned, putting the milk down on the table. What do you mean? I quietly lifted the album off my lap and put it on the table. This is why you didn't want me to go into the attic, right? The words came out harsher than I intended them to. She looked at the album, and her face turns pale as though she has seen a ghost. But when she looks at me, she says, I've never seen that before in my life. And without another word, walks out of the room. I chased after her. Isabel, who is the girl in this? Look at me when I'm talking to you. I grasp her arm and turn her towards me. She slapped me hard across the face. My wife, who wouldn't even raise her voice at our cat when he scratched her, slapped me. I watched in open mouth shock as she stormed up the stairs into our bedroom and slammed the door. The album was still in my hand, the weight of it an omen, and that's when I heard it again. The skittering I had been hearing from the attic, except now it sounded like it was coming from our bedroom. What the hell? I muttered. That's when the scraping started. It sounded like... like someone was very slowly clawing at the floorboards above me. My heart began to race as I slowly looked at the darkness at the top of the stairs. Why hasn't she switched the lights on when she went up there? Isabel? I called, my voice hoarse with fear. At first there was nothing, but then I heard it. Isabel. A high-pitched voice mocked from the darkness. My blood ran cold. I was terrified, but the thought that my wife could be in danger was more overpowering. I ran up the stairs to our bedroom door. I found it wide open with no trace of my wife inside. Is... Isabel? I walked hesitantly as I looked around the empty bedroom. That's when I felt it. A cold hand grabbed my ankle from under the bed. I screamed and pulled myself out of its grasp, stumbling backwards and I fell against... Isabel. She grabbed my hand and dragged me down the stairs. I told you not to go into the attic. She sobbed as she dragged me to the front door. Now you've let her out. You've let her into our lives. As we got outside, she rushed to the car. Hurry up before she finds us. I jumped into the passenger seat without saying a word. Isabel, what the hell is going on? She started the car and we zipped out of the driveway. I could see her knuckles were white from the gripping the steering wheel so hard. She finally spoke, her eyes focused on the road. 
She's always been there. Always angry. You see, I'm the one who got to live. What? I was more confused now than ever. I'm a twin, Jack. She said to me quietly. I'm the twin that survived while she died in the womb. I looked at her confused. So she's what? She's an evil spirit who wants a chance to live, and ever since I was born, she has been eating away at my life. That album was a way to trap her. Those photos were like talismans I used to keep her in there. Every single physical piece of evidence she exists. When we were in college and that awful thing happened, I went to a professional. She helped me trap her. And then... And then I opened up the album and let her out. I said softly. She nodded, a resigned sigh escaping her lips. She wants to be me. You understand? She won't stop until she has absorbed all of me. I was quiet. That's when I saw the movement in the mirror. Turning around, I saw the thing that wanted to be my wife sitting there, grinning at me. I yelled. Isabel slammed on the brakes. We didn't even see that truck coming. We didn't have a chance. When I woke up at the hospital later, a policeman was standing next to me looking grim. I blearily tried to get up, but my whole body felt like a bruise and I fell back onto the bed breathing hard. Isabel? I whispered. Every part of my body hurt. Where was my wife? Mr. Taylor? the policeman said. I am sorry to inform you that your wife was killed in the accident. The news hit me like a punch in the face. No! I strangled back a sob. No, no, no. Sir, I'm sorry for your loss, but you are going to need to answer some questions for us. The police officer pulled up a file and looked at me carefully. I nodded through the tears running down my face. We would like to know why your DNA has showed up in a string of murder cases. Are you familiar with the case of the college butcher? I've been a fire watch lookout for about a year now. I spent most of my life alone in a small window-lined one-room shack atop a steel and wood frame tower in the middle of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. My only companions are my collection of cheap novels, a laptop computer with infrequent and unreliable internet service, and the two-way radio I use to communicate with the few other nearby towers and ranger stations. Nearby is a bit of a misnomer, though. Using my high-power binoculars, I can just barely make out Tower 12 on a clear day. Situated several miles to my west, Tower 15, the next nearest to my location, only appears as a glint of sunlight to my east, when the sun catches it just right. I've been told the Parks Department intends to put up some additional towers in this area as soon as it gets the necessary funding, which is probably no time soon. That's fine with me though. I like the solitude. It helps quiet my mind, keeps the memories at bay, mostly. I occupy most of my days either with simple maintenance in and around the tower, or else scanning the dense sea of trees all around me for any signs of trouble. It's been a dry year, so the threat of fire is a constant one. This particular afternoon, I was clearing some brush from around the base of the tower that had begun to encroach on the fire road that led from my tower back to the main ranger station, 20 miles away. Even with the heavy suspension of the government-issued jeep parked nearby, that was a harsh ride in the best of times. I had just finished dragging some brush cuttings off into the tree line when the radio clipped on my belt squawked. Tower 9, this is Tower 12. Copy. It was Billy Johnson, my supervisor. A nice enough guy, I suppose. Tended to leave me alone most of the time. I straightened up and stretched my back, 
wiping the sweat out of my eyes with my forearm, and keyed the microphone attached at my shoulder. Go for Tower 9. I replied as I replaced the shears and bow, saw at the small storage shed near the base of the stairs. John, do you have eyes on a bit of smoke north of your position? Stand up, Billy, I said, snatching up my water bottle and jogging up the metal staircase that wound its way around my tower. I didn't bother locking the 8-foot chain-link fence that surrounded my little compound. Chances were that I'd be back down here soon enough. Reaching the top, I stepped through the trapdoor and onto the walkway that surrounded the cabin, closing it behind me. It was habit at this point. The last thing I needed was to take an errant step and tumble down through the open trapdoor. I'd probably end up breaking my neck. As I passed by, I reached into the open door of the shack and grabbed the binoculars hanging on a nearby hook. Rounding the railed corner of the walkway and turning my attention to the dark green blanket of trees stretching out before me, I saw the smoke almost immediately. A thin trickle of wispy white haze rose lazily above the canopy some distance off. Probably just some campers, I figured. Though there weren't any approved campsites in that area, we always had more than a few folks every season who decided that camping off trail in the deep bush sounded like a hoot. Most of them come back just fine, oblivious to the danger that this wilderness presents to anyone not adequately prepared for its risks. Some of them have to be brought out by search and rescue. Some of them just don't come back. A member of the rangers, or maybe even a random hiker, will occasionally trip across the deserted remains of a campsite and report it in. Those are the spooky ones. The ones where the people have just vanished and left behind a perfectly set up campsite. No explanation. No clues. Just a deserted clearing. Often with perfectly intact tents and personal effects. But there are bears and mountain lions, along with a handful of lesser predators that roam these forests, and sometimes they get hungry, enough to stalk and even kill humans. And that doesn't even take into consideration the much more likely probability that folks step out of their tents at night to take a piss in the woods, and very quickly get lost and can't find their way back to their camp. Most humans aren't suited to survival in the wilderness, unfortunately. My radio squawked again. Tower 9, what's the word? Yeah, I see it, Billy. I said. Looks to be a couple miles due north of my tower. What's your plan? He asked, and I knew what he was asking. Keep an eye on it and hope for the best. Or take a trip over and investigate. After a brief moment's pause, I sighed with resignation. It's probably just a campfire, but I guess I'd better head on over and take a look, just to be sure. I didn't relish the thought of a trek into that area of wilderness, to be honest. It was the only area I hadn't explored during my time here. There weren't many trails headed in that direction, and the ones that did were badly overgrown and too narrow for the jeep. A couple miles hike might not seem like a lot, but when you're out here, alone, the dense trees seem to stretch on forever. Two miles can seem like a hundred. Roger that, John, Billy replied. Take your pack and your rifle and check in periodically. Will do. Tower 9 out, I said. Replacing the binoculars to their hook and shouldering the red canvas backpack waiting dutifully in the corner chair. I grabbed the rifle from its rack over the door frame, checked to make sure it was loaded, and headed out. As I locked the gate behind me, I threw my pack into the back of the jeep and set the rifle beside it. The jeep wouldn't get me too far before the brush made the trail impassable. But if it saved me even a half mile of hiking, it was well worth it. The sun was still high in the sky. I had plenty of time to get there and back before dusk as long as I didn't dawdle. I started the engine and put the jeep into gear, turning the wheels towards the unmaintained trail to my right. 
After only a few moments, the trees and canopy obscured any trace of the watchtower behind me. I was actually able to push the jeep farther than I had expected. A pleasant surprise. I was probably a mile along the trail before it shit the bed and a massive pine lay across the path, much too large to go over. The dense underbrush around me precluded the possibility of going around, and I immediately lamented not bringing the chainsaw with me. Cutting it up and winching the pieces out of the way wouldn't have been too difficult and would have saved me a ton of trouble. With a quiet curse, I stepped out of the jeep and grabbed my gear from the back seat. I smiled to myself as a quote from a certain fictional adventure-seeking archaeologist suddenly came to mind. We walk from here. Making sure to mark the location of the jeep on my handheld GPS so I could find it again, I stepped over the thigh-high tree trunk and continued along the path. According to the estimate I had made before leaving, the trail I was walking seemed to head in the direction of the smoke, which was a blessing in my book. The less time I had to spend bushwhacking, the better. The trail continued to narrow as I expected, and before too long I was brushing branches and leaves with my shoulders as I walked. The trees which had been alive with the chitterings and chirpings of animal life back at the tower now seemed muted. The forest around me was growing denser, feeling oddly claustrophobic at times. I checked in with Billy a couple of times, advising him of my progress and promising to maintain periodic checks. He advised me that a weather relay had come in from the ranger station indicating an approaching storm that would likely reach us before nightfall. A quick check of my watch made me wince. I had already spent more time than I had predicted it would take to reach the suspected campsite. Maybe it was best to turn around and head back. The last thing I wanted was to get caught out here overnight with minimal supplies and in a rainstorm. I wasn't worried, but it sure wouldn't make for a comfortable overnight. If I had been farther from my destination, I probably would have turned back right then. I wish I had. Within another 20 minutes, however, I smelled the faint scent of a wood fire. Not strong, but it was there. I was even more certain of what I would find when I reached them. When I stepped out of the now almost non-existent trail and found myself in a sparsely treed area amidst a dozen or so wooden shacks, I halted in surprise. I had reached the base of a hilly rise, covered in heavy forestry, and these old forgotten cabins looked like they had been some sort of small settlement, perhaps an old logging camp, I thought to myself. I didn't know this place even existed, and made a mental note to research it when I got back to my tower. I keyed the microphone. Tower 12, this is John, do you copy? When Billy replied, his voice was staticky and distant. Hey John, Tower 12, what's your status? I frowned and looked around at the towering trees all around me. I suppose I was asking more out of the portable radio than was reasonable. I was lucky I still had any signal at all, to be honest. I found what looks like an old logging or trapping camp, I said, meandering along the decaying and derelict cabins. Most of them had decayed to the point of collapse, and there weren't any with intact roofs. The campfire has to be nearby. I'm going to take a look around a bit more. There was an odd pause before Billy spoke again. What's your current location, John? I glanced at my handheld GPS and relayed my position to him. Another pause. John, I think you should probably just turn around and come back. You don't have too many more hours of daylight left and that storm looks to be getting worse. Something in his voice sounded off, but I couldn't quite place it. Nervous, maybe. I don't think I can blame him, though. My safety was his responsibility, and the prospect of one of his lookouts being caught out in the storm overnight probably didn't sit well with him. Coincidentally, 
It didn't sit well with me either, I thought with a smile. You may be right, Billy, I replied, turning around and letting my eyes take in the entirety of the area. I think I'll just head... I stopped as my eyes caught sight of the bright yellow nylon tent just beyond the last of the structures. Repeat your last, said Billy. I didn't get that. Stand by, Tower 12. I said absently, making my way to what I now realized was a small cluster of three modern tents, situated around a central fire ring. The fire had been extinguished, but the embers still smoldered slowly, and the source of the smoke. I looked around for the campers, but didn't see or hear anyone. Sleeping bags and electric lanterns were still on in the tents though I couldn't find any backpacks or supplies. Hello? I called out, turning in a circle and trying to pick out any signs or sounds of human life. I'm with the Forest Service. Is anyone there? Nothing but the muted echo of my own voice. I was about to just dump some dirt on the remaining embers of the campfire and called a day when I noticed the narrow footpath heading towards the slope. I could see clearly the recent footprints in the soft dirt, heading away from the camp. I keyed the microphone at my shoulder again. Tower 12, this is John. I found the source of the smoke. It's a campfire, all right. Nothing to be concerned about. Billy answered almost immediately. Roger that, John. Head back home. I paused a moment, curiosity pulling me towards the footpath. I'll be heading back shortly, Billy. I just want to check something out first. I wouldn't screw around out there, John. Billy replied, an edge to his voice. Better head back now so you can beat the storm. His last sentence didn't exactly sound like a suggestion. Something had him rattled. I hesitated before I answered. Acknowledged, I said knowing full well that I was going to check out the path a bit before heading back. Still, I didn't feel like arguing with my supervisor about something so silly. Just a quick walk up the path, and then I'd be on my way. This path was even less established than the one I'd been on when I discovered the camp, but I could clearly see the prints of the campers in the soft dirt as I went. Before long, I emerged into a small clearing eyes widening with yet another unexpected discovery. The rough-hewn timber that framed the entryway was set into the near-vertical slope of the hill face before me. It created a dark tunnel entrance that had been sealed off with a heavy iron gate many years before, likely by the park service to keep inquisitive hikers from falling to their deaths in an old abandoned mine shaft. So, it had been a mining camp. Not a logging camp. Huh. I didn't know there were any mines anywhere near here. Hell, I'm not sure what they would have been mining for. Coal, maybe. Gold? Did they even have gold mines in Tennessee? Who knows? Certainly not me, clearly. Regardless, now that gate stood wide open on its hinges. The remains of a rusted chain and antique padlock laying in the dirt nearby. Hell, now I couldn't just turn around and leave. Not if these campers had decided it would be fun to explore a closed and restricted mine entrance. Tower 12, this is John. Do you read? Billy probably wouldn't be happy that I had continued my exploration after he told me to head back, but there was nothing to do about it now. I wasn't equipped or trained for any sort of cave exploration or rescue. The rangers had very specialized teams for that sort of thing, but I could at least poke my head inside and see if I could hear the campers or at least confirm that they actually went inside. No answer from the radio. I tried again with the same results. Nothing. I tried a different approach. Tower 15, this is John from Tower 12, do you copy? I said into the radio. I figured I might be able to at least get Nathan's attention if I was out of range of Tower 12. 
There was a burst of static that sounded like it might have contained the hint of a human voice, but it was too distorted and distant to make anything out. There was only a moment of indecision before I made up my mind. I knew it was reckless to go into the mine, especially when my supervisor was under the belief that I was currently on my way back to my tower. But I just had this nagging intuition that something might be wrong with this whole situation. Maybe someone was hurt and in need of help. I couldn't just leave them there, knowing that I might be their only chance of rescue. In retrospect, I should have turned back and called it into the ranger station. They could have mobilized the SNR teams that specialized in cave rescues. I should have, but I didn't. I pulled my powerful LED flashlight from my pack, turned it on, and headed into the pitch black darkness of the mine entrance. The walls and floor had been smoothly carved many years ago, which made my footing uneventful and the tunnel itself was mostly a straight shot. Several times during the first few minutes, I turned back to watch the bright square of daylight at the entrance gradually shrink to a pinpoint of light. By the time I had taken the first dog-leg turn of the tunnel, I was in complete darkness. It was a very strange feeling. Oppressive, almost. At one point, I turned off my flashlight experimentally, but after only a few seconds, I quickly flicked it back on. In that time, my heart had been pounding in my chest and some primal fear had begun growing inside of me. I took a moment to calm myself. The darkness was absolute. It was almost as if you could feel it pressing in on you. My footsteps seemed much louder than they should have on the dirt floor and the air was beginning to grow cold and damp the farther I went. After another hundred feet or so, the smoothly carved tunnel ended abruptly in a wall of rubble. I couldn't tell if it was a cave-in at some point, or if this was simply where the miners stopped digging and hadn't bothered to remove the debris. But either way, it certainly appeared to be the end of the line. And then I saw it. I almost missed it because of the way the light and shadows played over the head-sized rock strewn before me. But when I looked closer, I realized I was looking at a ragged hole in the wall. It was only five feet across or so, and definitely didn't look like the deliberate formation of the tunnel I was standing in now. It almost looked like the miners had broken into a natural void of some sort. Interesting, but there was no way in hell I was going in there. I was definitely not trained or outfitted for any sort of spelunking trip, but it didn't seem the sort of thing suited to the learn-as-you-go method. Just as I was turning back to make my way out of the mine, I heard the distant sound of voices echoing from the opening in the stone wall. The sound was faint, and may have just been my imagination, but I didn't think so. Hello? I called, pressing my face into the black abyss of the hole. Can you hear me? I'm with the park service. I'm here to help you. Nothing. The air from beyond the breach was cold and smelled stale. Old. Wrong. I felt as if I didn't belong here. None of us did. There was a long moment of unbroken silence, and then I heard a voice again, closer this time. Did you hear that? It said, presumably to a companion. It sounded like a young woman. Nervous. Uncertain. Hello? Is someone in there? That settled it for me. I carefully crawled through the opening and into the space beyond. Shining my light around, I found myself in a small natural chamber, maybe 30 feet across and with an uneven ceiling of jagged rock that barely cleared my head. The first thing that caught my attention was the cracked lantern laying on the ground. It looked old. Very old. Maybe a hundred years or more. A thick layer of grime and age covered its soot-blackened tin surface, and the glass was thick and uneven. Beside the askew lantern was a small, leather-bound book partially buried in the dirt and dust, with a moldering leather strap securing it closed. 
It looked like a journal, and without a thought, I tucked it into my backpack, raising my light back up to scan around the room. Hello? I called again. I couldn't hear the voices anymore, but the narrow beam of my flashlight illuminated another tunnel in the far corner of this room, mired in darkness. Can you hear me? Once again, I got that feeling that something wasn't right. Then the voice came again, closer this time. Did you hear that? Hello, is someone in there? She asked, her voice trembling with apprehension. I hesitated, frowning. Something didn't seem right about the voice, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Before I could summon my words to respond, another voice called out. This time it was clearly the voice of a young man. We can hear you moving around in there. Please help us. We're lost and our friend is hurt. Hear me moving around in there? I was shouting to them. I sure as hell wasn't trying to hide. Can they not hear me for some reason? I stepped forward to the secondary tunnel and raised my voice again. I'm with the forest service. Can you follow my voice? It was then when I reached out to steady myself against the wall of the tunnel entrance that my hand met something wet and I recoiled in disgust. Thinking I had just grabbed a handful of some subterranean slime. When I shone my light on it, however, it became very clear the reality was far worse. Blood. I stepped back, trying to keep the panic that was fighting to take control of my rationality at bay. I needed to keep a level head now. Panning my light around, I saw an astonishing amount of blood painting the wall and floor in front of me. Something had definitely been hurt, and badly. With blood loss like this, I wasn't sure I'd be able to stabilize them long enough to get rescue in here. What the hell happened here? And why did the hikers continue into the cave after one of them was injured this badly? Unless they lost their light and got turned around, there was no way for them to get lost. There hadn't been any branches to this tunnel since I first entered. All they had to do was turn around and walk until they saw daylight. The man's voice called again, colored with the unmistakable tinge of fear. What is that? Hurry up, Becky. Take my hand. He seemed to be getting closer, at least. If I could guide them to my voice, maybe I could get them out of here. Get to higher ground, and radio for a rescue evac. They had a helicopter permanently stationed at the main ranger station. It could be here in 20 minutes if I was able to reach them. The woman's voice came again, and this time I froze. Do you hear that? Hello? Is someone in there? All at once it hit me, and the indescribable unease I had been mostly successful in repressing now fought back with renewed vigor. I realized that moment what I had missed previously. The woman had repeated herself twice more now. No change in her reflection. No variation in emotion or urgency. It was exactly the same down to the syllable. It was like I was listening to a recording. What is that? Repeated the male voice, now even closer. Hurry up, Becky. Take my hand. Below the words, I thought I could hear the stealthy sliding of something soft over rocks. It seemed like it wasn't too far beyond the tunnel entrance now, but I wasn't going to wait for it. I didn't think that what I'd see emerge from the darkness would be a couple of college kids who'd had a rough time of it during a weekend camping trip. Now allowing my panic to run free, I turned and threw myself through the cave breach and landed roughly on the flat stone floor of the mine shaft beyond, skinning my hands to hell and banging my knee on a rock. Scrambling to my feet with a hiss of pain, I ran as fast as I could, not realizing until I finally burst into the waning light of the late afternoon light that I had lost my rifle somewhere in that cave. It was darker than it was when I first entered the mine, and a quick glance at the sky showed the angry black thunderheads that had moved in as promised, much faster than I had expected. 
I quickly swung the iron gate closed and screeching hinges and looped the chain between the bars as tightly as I could, securing it rather lamely with the hasp of the broken padlock. I stood there a long moment, bent over, and hands on knees as I tried to catch my breath outside of the mine entrance. When I felt the first drops of the coming storm on the back of my neck, I straightened and looked through the bars of the gate into the ominous darkness beyond, realizing how ridiculous my barricade really was. It wouldn't do much good if something tried to get out, but at least it made me feel a little better until I heard the voice echoing from the mine shaft getting closer. It was unmistakable, uncanny. Hello? Can you hear me? I'm with the park service. I'm here to help you. You've got a new match. My hormonal teenage self couldn't have been more excited. I quickly lost interest in the homework I had been working on that night and opened my phone. Almost as fast as it could light up with the notification, I clicked on the icon, staring intently until Tinder opened. Of course I was excited. I ran all the possibilities in my head. All the things that could happen. This could be the girl of my dreams. No, it didn't appear as though I matched with the girl of my dreams. This looked more like the girl from a nightmare that would shake the vilest creature in the deepest pit of hell to its crooked bones. Smiling from ear to ear, literally, was my match in the first picture of her profile. No name, no age, only a picture. The photo itself seemed to be professionally taken. It was a full-body picture. She was dressed in some sort of very formal black dress, and there was nothing about her that seemed out of the ordinary. She had black hair that was down and presented nicely, likely for this picture, or whatever event this picture was taken for, but I didn't give much thought to that, and you'll understand why. Her skin was well-kept and seemingly unblemished. Come to think of it now, her face was the only off-putting thing about the picture, but the face. Her eyes didn't sit inside where the sockets should be. They bulged out, seeming far too large for her face. They had no whites. The irises were everything. They were a dark purple, almost black. The eyes had no details. They were just blank, empty. Her teeth were normal, human teeth, and there would have been nothing wrong with them if she didn't have many, many more than any person should have. Her jaw opened wide, very wide. It opened from the bottom of one ear to the other. Teeth showing in their entirety as she gave a nice, big smile at the camera. I was disgusted by whatever Photoshop job this must have been but I was also intrigued. It was a really good edit after all. I thought it must have been some artist who wanted to show off their skills or something, but before I engaged in any chats with this match, I noticed they had more photos. Five more. I swiped to the second one. The same girl, in the same dress, and all the same grotesque facial features was front and center in this photo once again, but both the quality and setting of this one were much different. It looked like it was taken with a cell phone. The picture wasn't even level, but that's not the detail I first recognized. She was levitating off the ground. The ground, as well as the walls and the ceiling, were seemingly made of corpses. All that provided light in the photo were half-melted candles on the ground and the flash from the camera. This one looked too real. The bodies all had pretty distinct features. It almost made me sick. Some looked like they were mere skeletons with everything decomposed. Others looked fresh, very fresh. One thing that many of them seemed to have in common was they were missing a lower jaw, an odd detail. 
I scrolled past this one quicker than the last. It upset me the more I looked at it, but the third was more confusing. The third picture was of her, once again, and in her black dress as she hovered in the middle of an empty field this time. The quality of this picture was like that of the first. It seemed as if it were professionally taken and edited. The sky was an impossible shade of red. As a consequence, the entire image had a sort of red tint to it. Other than that, it simply looked as if it were some sort of farmland. This one didn't disturb me like the last, but it had an eerie feel to it. It was as if this picture was taken in the apocalypse and like it was showing me the end of the world. Once again, I thought this must be some sort of artist trying to compel these sorts of feelings with the pictures and the way they took and edited them. I was impressed as I was disturbed. The fourth photo made my heart sink a little. The picture of the girl was taken in front of a building on my university campus. A building not even a five minute walk away. It was nighttime and she was alone. She was, once again, floating yet this time above the stairs, in front of the columns of the building. She didn't look any less real in this photo. I scrolled back through the first few and noticed how surprisingly alike she looked in all the pictures. Despite their different angles, this art was too good. It was making me sick. The fifth picture, I thought, must be impossible. It was of her inside another building, but I knew what building it was. I knew it from the colors on the wall. I knew it from the lights above her floating body. Most of all, I knew where she was because of the numbers on the door behind her. It was only a few doors down from my apartment. The apartment I was in right now. I quickly scrolled to the last photo. It was a close-up of her right in front of my door. I dropped my phone and ran to my door to make sure it was locked. Luckily it was. I am always good about that, but out of curiosity, I thought I would peek through the peephole to see if someone did happen to be there. I placed my eye upon the hole where I got a glimpse of shoulders and the back of a head with long black hair. In a quick motion, the head turned around while the shoulders remained still. It was her. She widened her smile, ear to ear once again. I jumped back from the door. I ran back to the desk and picked up my phone. Of course, the disgusting picture of her in front of my door was the first thing to pop up as I opened my phone. I quickly exited Tinder and dialed 911. An operator picked up. 911, what is your emergency? I knew that location was the first thing you should give out in a 911 call because if something happens to you while you're on the line, they only have the possibility of helping you if they know where you are. I gave the operator my location, which I am leaving out of this story to not expose myself, and then have a brief, detail-scarce summary of the past few minutes. I left out some of the more extreme details because I wanted to be taken seriously. There's someone outside my apartment door. I just got a match on Tinder. When I clicked in to see the photos, she had a bunch of weird ones of her in. Look, it doesn't matter, but she is messed up. Very messed up. The last two photos were of her outside my apartment door, and when I went to look in the peephole, she was still there. I don't know how, but please send help. All right, sir. Has she threatened you in any way? Has she tried to break into your apartment? We can't just send an officer because you feel scared of some girl you met on Tinder who happens to live in the same apartment building as you. Are you calling because she looks... different? I was speechless. I was infuriated. How could they do this? Did they think it was ridiculous I was calling them because of a girl? I exploded into a rant over the phone. So what if she hasn't done anything yet? What the hell is wrong with you? She found my apartment, my exact apartment, and is standing outside of it. We only matched minutes ago. This isn't right. 
I need... There was suddenly silence on the other end. I felt like I was about to scream. 911 just hung up on me. I was eyeing up my door for a second when I heard someone on the phone once again. It was someone different. He talked once again. This time my phone was up to my ear. Sir, can you hear me? Hello, sir. Yes, I'm here. I replied desperately. Sir... Who you were just talking to was not 911 dispatch. I need you to listen to my next instructions very carefully. If you hear another voice other than mine on this call, you need to hang up immediately and wait for me to call back. If the entity you have encountered attempts to communicate with you in any way, for the time being you need to ignore it. Do not leave your apartment unless I instruct you to. Now, I need your precise location. We caught on to this one early on, so we should be able to contain it with ease. I was hesitant to even talk. Are... are you the police? No. I work for an agency whose purpose is to locate and contain or eliminate entities like the one you have had the unfortunate luck of encountering tonight. I need your location now. Maybe I was stupid for giving this man on the phone my location, but with everything that had just hit me, I didn't hesitate. I gave him my address and apartment number. He was silent for only about 15 seconds. Alright, a team is en route to your apartment. Sit tight. Now we need to lay out a few more rules. I have the floor plans for your apartment. It looks like you've got a studio with one closet and one bathroom. Can you fit inside your closet? Uh, yeah, but why would I need... If the lock on your apartment door unlocks, I need you to quickly shut off the lights and climb into your closet. Be silent until you hear the door shut once again. If any sinks or your shower turns on, I need you to shut them off as quickly as possible. If you hear splashing coming from your toilet, I need you to flush it immediately and close the lid. I need you to repeat these instructions back to me so that I know you understand. Okay, if I hear my door unlock, quickly shut off my lights and hide in the closet. Turn off any sinks or my shower if they turn themselves on, and flush the toilet and close the lid if I hear anything from it. I don't understand how these things can happen or why I would do any of this. If you want to live long enough to see the sunrise tomorrow, You'll follow those instructions exactly. Write them down if you need to. I'm going to need any details and evidence you have that you haven't said over the phone already. Yes, I could still hear what you were saying at the beginning of the call. You said you matched with her on Tinder. Does she have a name? Yes, I matched with her on Tinder, but her profile didn't have a name or age. Just pictures that... Once again, I was interrupted by the new operator. It seemed he was urgent to exchange as much information as possible. Witnessing what I had, I didn't object. I need you to screenshot those pictures if you can. Is it still possible for you to access them? Yes, give me one moment. I opened Tinder up again and clicked on the profile. I quickly screenshotted each picture. Now what? What do you want me to do with them? Text them to the 911 number. Trust me, it'll work. I sent each picture as fast as I possibly could. Alright, looks like I've gotten seven. Give me a moment while I send these over to our intel team for identification. We might be able to find out enough about this thing to get rid of it right away. I need you to keep an eye out your window on the street. There will be... Wait, wait, did you say seven? I sent six. Her profile had six pictures. How did you get seven? I quickly opened back up my texts. I did send seven. The first six were of her profile, but the seventh was of me. It was taken from right outside my window. Right outside. And it was recent. I recognized the clothes I was wearing today. 
On the upper left hand side of the picture was a hand pressed against my window. I quickly turned towards my window to see no one there. There couldn't have been. It was on the third floor and there was nothing on that side of the building that would allow someone to climb that high. No one could have been up there to take a picture. I was quick to let the operator know, though I was not calm. I didn't send the last one. It's sent by itself through my phone somehow. It's of me just a minute ago, while we were talking. Alright, calm down. It's trying to scare you. It wants to get in your head. It wants you worked up so that you'll do something rash. But you're not going to do that, are you? N no sir. Alright, good. Now as I was saying, there will be one man and one woman in black suits and holding briefcases that get out of a large SUV. The driver has been instructed to drop them off on the side of your apartment. He knows where it is. They should be arriving right about now. Go check outside your window. I looked outside my window down to the street below but I didn't see an SUV or two people in suits. All I saw were a few pedestrians and a university bus. I don't see anyone down there. Are you sure they're on that side? It's easy to end up on the wrong street down here. Yes, I am sure. You are certain you don't see anyone? No SUV? I'm sorry, but... No, I don't. Uh-oh. I heard him mutter under his breath. I then faintly heard his voice yelling towards someone else. That ain't it. Tell them to keep moving. He then adjusted his mic and began to talk to me again. Alright, they've been swindled by the entity. We're figuring that out now. Just be on the lookout for them to arrive. Once they get there, we can start the process of getting rid of this thing. Right then, I heard a firm knock at my door. I quickly walked over and peeped through the hole again. One man and one woman, both in very nice black suits. I think your agents are here. They just knocked on the door and I saw them through the peephole. Should I let them in? The operator practically screamed through the phone. No, no, do not let them in. Those are not our agents. That is the entity trying to get you to open the door. Don't do it. Our agents will not knock. They won't try to get into your door. Get back to your window and watch for them to arrive. Tell me when they do. After a few more minutes of waiting, I finally saw a large SUV pull up in front of the apartment, and two people got out. One man, one woman, nice suits and briefcases. After they got out of the car, they looked up at my window as they made their way towards the entrance. The SUV drove off. Alright, they're here. Good. They're going to scout out the building figure out what we're dealing with, and assess if another team needs to be called in. I'll let you know anything you need to do when I find out. Just stay on the line. I had started to feel relieved, albeit more confused. I did believe these people were here to help, but I didn't know what they could do to help me. How could two people from whatever this organization was possibly deal with this thing at my door? I contemplated the possibilities as I sat down in my chair for the first time in a while, finally calming down a little. This little moment of peace was just that, for not long after I sat down, I heard an electronic click from my door as I jumped from my seat. I remembered the operator's instructions. I quickly hit the light switch and picked up the kitchen knife before hopping into my closet. The door just unlocked. I'm hiding with the lights off as you told me. I whispered into my phone. He responded quietly and with as fast a message as he could muster. Just be quiet and don't move. She can't open your closet door and she has no interest in taking your things. No matter what she says, do not respond and do not react. Do not leave the closet until you hear the door close again. Do not hang up this call. As soon as he finished speaking, the door opened. 
I didn't hear any footsteps, but I knew she was in. I focused on controlling my breathing to make it as quiet as possible. I must have been in there for a good five minutes before I heard any noise. Nothing. Not a step. Not a door opening. Not a single thing moved around. I couldn't even hear breathing. I was tempted to leave, but I did as I was told and stayed still. Doing that had served me well up until this point. I just about gasped and gave myself away when she eventually spoke. In a sweet and dulcet voice. What's wrong? Don't want to hang out tonight? After she got no response, she would wait about 10 seconds and say something new, trying to be more provocative each time. This went on for a few minutes. Come on, we matched and you know it. You know you want me and I... I want you. Well, if you're not ready, that's alright. I can wait. I can wait a long time. I'll wait for however long I need to for you to come out. You know I don't bite. I'm just a very, very good kisser. You can ask the others. You can meet them too. But why don't you try it yourself? Just come on out. What have you got to lose? I know how lonely you are. I know I'm the only one you'll ever have a chance with. At least I'm the only one who will love you forever. You know you'll always be nothing without me. I'm the only one. The only thing that will ever bring meaning to your life. She got more assertive. I could hear her voice getting closer each time she spoke, trying to get me to come out. Eventually, she was so close to the closet door, she was practically touching it. She might have been. It was obvious she knew I was in there, but the operator said to sit put and that she couldn't open the door. I trusted him for now. You know you're a worthless, rotting sack of crap. You are not even good enough for the maggots. You have done nothing with your meaningless, short life and you never will. Even if I let you live past this night, you can come with me, or you can burn. No one is coming to save you. No one can. She stopped for a moment. I think she heard what I heard. There were steps in the hallway. Someone was walking around on my floor. Oh, you talked to them. She let out a giggle. One that would have seemed innocent and cute if it were given in any other context with a normal girl, but I found it to be far from it. You'll pay for that. You won't even get what I gave the others. I'll rip your guts out right before your eyes and make you watch all of it. You'll wish you were dead, but I won't kill you. Not until... Approaching Entity Manifestation now. Stand by. I heard a man's voice say from just outside my apartment. She screamed in fury before I heard my apartment door slam shut a split second later with a force. I don't think I could replicate with all my might if I tried. I exited my closet and turned my light back on as I ran to the door to look in the peephole. I couldn't see anything. What just happened? I think I heard one of your people outside of my door before she charged out, really angry. I asked the operator, who I had hoped was still on the line. One of them tried to catch her right there, but it didn't work. It wasn't fully manifested. He, as well as his partner, are trying to locate the entity now, but we're having no success. A larger team is very close. No need to look out for this one. We know how to get there now. Our priority has changed from containment to extermination. This one is much more dangerous than we could have predicted. What am I supposed to do now? The voice on the line immediately changed from the man's voice to the girl's enraged voice. You should open the door and let me in. I immediately hung up as I was told. This may have saved me for the moment. As in the process of hanging up, I noticed my phone was at 2% battery. 
I quickly found a charger and plugged my phone in. A minute later, I got a call back from 911. I promptly answered. Are you still there? Did it try to use someone else's voice? It used its own to tell me to open the door. I heard shuffling from outside my room. I first thought that she was back, but I noticed it was a lot of people this time. I could hear faint dialogue from outside the room, and it sounded like they were assembling a piece of furniture. Do you know who is outside my room right now? I asked the operator. Our second team arrived a few minutes ago. Some of them are downstairs setting up a base for this operation. Others are up by your room preparing equipment. Just let them do their thing and this will be over real soon. As long as we're fighting what we think we're fighting? Dear God, I hope so. What about my neighbors? What about the people walking around in the hallways and everyone else in this building? Do they know about this? Are they in danger? What happens to them? Oh, I forgot to tell you. They're just not here. I don't know how to explain it to you in a way you would understand. They won't be seeing our team, you, or this entity for the time being, and we won't be seeing the... They certainly aren't in any danger if that brings you any comfort. But I'm afraid you still are. I was once again confused by this new piece of information, but I didn't have the energy to question it at this point. I just wanted this to be done and over with as soon as possible. It's here. I heard a woman assert from right outside my door. I heard a few different things turn on. I don't know what they were, but I take it they were some sort of machinery or equipment they had just finished setting up. A few moments of silence passed by before I heard a man mutter. Uh-oh. Seconds later, I heard light bulbs explode before gunfire erupted in the hallway outside my room. I sprawled out on the floor and got as flat as possible. Though no gunfire ever made its way into my room, these gunshots were quickly followed by an even louder scream from what I assumed to be the girl. The shooting went on for only a minute or two, after which I heard a few magazines drop to the floor and some rifles being racked as well as some louder dialogue and cursing. I started to put on my shoes, hoping this was over now, but besides that, I felt safer with shoes on anyway. Did they get it? I hopefully asked the operator. No, it plowed right through our guys and got away somewhere in the stairwell. She killed a couple of them and injured a couple more as well. We underestimated her again, but now we know what we have to do. We're almost through with this. Just keep a level head and you'll be alright. I sat down, silenced. Two people just died on my behalf. Two people died because I, being the stupid teenager I am, had to be on Tinder messing around. I checked my phone. It hadn't gotten much more of a charge by this time. It was only at 7%. I waited there for another 5 minutes. I just sat in guilt with my head resting in my hands, thinking of how all this could have been avoided before I heard something coming from my bathroom. I picked up my phone, unplugged it, and walked over, pushing the door open to get a peek. Hands were coming out of the toilet bowl and gripping the seat. She pushed down against the seat of the toilet as she attempted to force herself up out of my toilet. I screamed and fell back against the wall. Her head made it out. She was wounded, blood covering her face and arms. I could see that one of her eyes had been shot out and blood still ran out from the socket. She turned towards me as she attempted to pull the rest of herself up. She clenched her jaw, but revealed all of her teeth to me, also covered in blood. Oh my god, she's climbing out of my toilet. It's too late. Go, run, now. Do you understand? Get out of your apartment. I unlocked my door as I charged out. All of the lights were out. They had all been shattered. The hallway looked like a trench from a war. Blood lined the floor and was splattered along the walls and ceiling. 
There was broken equipment. Equipment that was alien to me all up and down the hallway which I narrowly missed while running away from my room. I could feel the spent brass underneath my feet. The worst sight was the bodies. Two men in body armor, with rifles strapped around them, lay lifelessly on the ground. One was flipped over and had a trail of blood behind him as if he was thrown. The other had his upper body propped up against a wall. His lower jaw had been ripped out as blood came from his mouth and throat and colored his black uniform red. I dearly wish I was watching the ground in front of me as I ran because I took not two steps ahead and stepped right on this man's jaw. I can't even begin to tell you how I felt, feeling that beneath my foot as I ran, I could feel his teeth. Where do I go? What do I do now? I frantically asked the operator. Get to the stairwell, go down. I know you're used to there only being a few flights of stairs because the first floor is where they ended. You'll notice they go down further this time. I need you to proceed until you reach the bottom. There you'll find where our team set up their base of operations. I ran down the stairs faster than I think I'd ever run down a flight of stairs before. I didn't feel like I was going to trip or my legs were getting too tired. Rather, I felt as though my legs were outpacing me. It must have been a good ten floors worth of stairs before I reached the bottom. But, I got there quickly with the energy I had. At the bottom of the stairs were tons and tons of boxes. They looked as if they were military grade, or just made to carry really expensive things. A number of them were open, and their contents were emptied. I guessed this is where all of their fancy equipment came from that they were trying to use upstairs. On a few of them were laptops. As I walked over to one, I was startled by what I walked past. Between a couple of rows of those boxes, I found another corpse. This one I recognized as being one of the two in suits who had come in earlier. It was the woman. She, like the one man and... I assume, the other from my floor, had her jaw ripped out as well. In her hand was a revolver, a very shiny and quite beefy looking 357 Magnum. I set my phone on a box for a moment as I checked it out. I opened the cylinder and found that none of the six primers had been struck. This poor woman couldn't even get a shot off before being ripped apart. I found another one of your team members dead. It's the woman who came in first with the man earlier. I notified the operator. What? That's not possible. We just had communication with her. She was supposed to stay there while the rest of the team... Oh no. What? The rest of the team had another engagement with the entity on a higher floor. Their last known contact was with it four minutes ago. Our last communication with the agent you were next to was less than a minute ago. The thing is in there with you somewhere. Just then, the lights in the stairwell from top to bottom all exploded in rapid succession. I jumped into a corner and aimed the revolver at the stairs. A moment passed before I began to see a red light illuminate the stairs above me. Despite being shattered, the lights began working once again. One by one they turned on as they had been shattered. I heard humming from many floors above, but I could hear it getting closer. She's coming. What the hell do I do now? Get on one of the computers down there. We've cracked its code. I'm sending you a sound file. Turn up the volume on the laptop. When it gets close, Play the audio file. Once it... My phone was dead. And I thought I was too. Fortunately, I kept a level head as the operator told me to. I kept myself as calm as possible. As the humming got closer and made its way down the stairs. I ignored it. Set the revolver down next to the laptop and looked through what I could. 
It was in some sort of weird operating system and I had no idea how it worked. I found some sort of messaging system, like an email, though I don't think it was quite that and found a recent message. This had to be it. I downloaded and opened the contents, turning up the laptop volume to max. The humming stopped as I heard a giggle from right behind me in a playful voice say, What do you think you're doing? I already told you what was going to happen to you. Are you ready for a kiss now? I stood up, taking a deep breath and slowly turning around, with one hand still on the box in front of me. Well, you better come give it to me. I somehow was able to deliver with a straight face, despite being more afraid than I ever have in my life, which I assumed was about to end. She approached slowly, opening up her smile from ear to ear once again. Slimy, vicious saliva gushed out of her mouth as she came closer. I hit the space bar on the laptop before throwing myself to the ground away from her. An annoying, constant, high-frequency noise filled the stairwell and hurt my ears. But it did much worse for her. Her feet touched the ground, no longer levitating. She covered her ears tightly and her massive jaw practically unhinged from her head as she screamed in agony. I reached up for the revolver next to the laptop. I pulled it in close before cocking it. Then I got two hands on it and pointed it forward. I was shaking from the adrenaline, but I managed to get my breathing under control for just long enough to level the rear sights with the front. I squeezed. Blood splattered on the stairs behind her as part of her head was blown clean off. I stood and backed up, pulling the trigger as many times as I could. Even when the cylinder was empty, I pulled the trigger a few more times. Once my ears stopped ringing and application opened on the laptop, the sound file finished playing and I heard the voice of the operator once again. Anomalous presence no longer detected. You did it, kid. I have no idea how, but you did it. It's over. I stood for a moment and observed the carnage. The red lights faded until they were gone. In darkness, once again, I was in disbelief, both of what just went down and what I was able to stop this thing. Whatever it was, I don't think I'll ever know. I began to walk up the stairs, slow and tired. After I made it up a few flights, I saw bright beams coming from flashlights above. A couple of dozen people in body armor. Strapped with expensive rifles and submachine guns ran down the stairs past me. The man in the suit reached down and grabbed the revolver in my hands as I was passing him. I think subconsciously I jerked it away and aimed it at him. He backed up for a moment. Easy now, son. It's all over. You can relax. I took a deep breath out and handed over the empty revolver to him. I walked back up to my room plugged my phone in and started it up. I just sat with my head resting on my desk for a while before I got another call from 911. I picked it up and the operator began to speak once again. Well, you did it. We've been hunting this one for a while now. It's gotten more victims than almost all of the others combined, but now it's gone thanks to you. Are you injured? I can get the paramedics to you if you need them. I just sat in silence. I didn't have the energy to speak anymore. Alright, you need a minute to decompress and catch your breath, it seems. Stay in your room for the next hour and everything will be back to normal outside of your apartment. Our team, all of the equipment and the chaos left in the wake of all this will be out of sight and out of mind. I know it doesn't make any sense to you and that will only make processing all of this harder. Just know that if you call your emergency line again, we'll be listening. We'll be here to help. Oh, and one more thing. You would be doing not just us, but the whole world and yourself a favor if you never spoke about this. Our anonymity and secrecy let us help everyone else out there. I hope you understand. 
Goodbye now. Stay safe. If you've read this far, you know I've ignored the last thing the operator said to me. I want everyone out there to know. I want everyone to know that you could become the victim of one of these things in the blink of an eye. I want you to know that there are people out there hunting them down and they seem to not exist by any publicly displayed government information. I want people to know what to do when they call 911. I have no proof. My apartment building did return to normal. I am suddenly missing the text history I had with 911. I am not matched with that profile on Tinder. I have nothing. I also want to know more. Have any of you fallen victim to one of these things? Have any of you heard of them? What are they? Do you know more about this organization? How was my apartment building changed that night? How was reality bent and shaped back to normal? Please reach out. I need to know more. I was just about to hit the post button when my phone suddenly blew up. You've got a new match. My phone displayed it a hundred times over. They're coming for me now. I need to make a call. I recently moved into a new apartment with my dog, Marbles. It's not a nice place by any means, but it's the only option I had. I'm just starting a new job and I barely have enough money to cover rent, ramen, dog food, and a Netflix subscription. So I settled on this small dirt cheap apartment on the outskirts of town, partly because it's cheap and partly because it's pet friendly. No, it isn't ideal, but it's only temporary while I save up some cash. The apartment is small, with only three rooms. The first room you enter is the kitchen slash living room, with a hallway in the back. The door at the end of the hall leads to the bathroom. In the hallway is a door on the right side to the bathroom. I don't have any furnishings or personal belongings, so the apartment remained very bare. I never bothered to worry about sprucing the place up because it was just a temporary home. We had been in the apartment for a few weeks and everything had been fine. As we really settled into the place, Marbles took a liking to the couch in the living room. It wasn't my couch. It came with the apartment. Well, Marbles started sleeping on the couch at night. That said, Marbles likes to get up and relocate in the middle of the night. She would get up and come to the bedroom door and hope to get inside. I always sleep with the door closed, so she would start to whine and paw at the door. Marbles had long nails that she hated getting cut, so you could hear her walking throughout the apartment if you were awake, and it made her pawing pretty loud. After a few nights of this, I just started leaving the door open for her. From then on, she would come and get in the bed with me at all times of the night. This never bothered me. Many more weeks went by, with nothing noteworthy happening. Well, one weekend my Netflix binging session lasted much longer than usual, and I was still up at 2 in the morning. I was just wrapping up Stranger Things Season 2 when out of the corner of my eye I saw it. In the doorway to the hall, there was something peeking at me. I turned to look directly at it. It looked like the top half of a face peeking from the left side of the doorway. The only thing I could see were two eyes, beady and black staring at me. I was frozen, not sure if it was fear or shock stopping me from moving. I blinked. It was still there. After a few more seconds, I started panicking and yelling out, Who are you? Get out! For a few seconds it kept staring and then slowly began to pull away and out of view. Once I could no longer see it, it took a few moments to regain control of my body. Once I had, I jumped up and slammed the door, locking it. Marbles, who had been laying on the bed with me, was now sitting up and alert. I called the police and told them someone had broken into my apartment. 
After a while, I heard them knocking on the front door. Eventually, I mustered the courage to step out from the room and run to the front door. They investigated, and the landlord was called. No one was found in the apartment. And when the police had arrived, the front door was still locked from when I got home. There were no signs of breaking and entering, but I insisted that I saw someone. The police did one more sweep of the apartment before leaving, telling me that there was nothing more they could do. The landlord, to whom I must give credit, swapped out the locks the next day, giving me all new keys. He told me that it was possible a previous tenant still had a set of keys to the room and had come in. The thought unnerved me, but the more I thought back on it, the less human the thing seemed to be. It took a few weeks and many sleepless nights to go back to normal, if you could call it that. I told myself that I could handle the stress, that we would only be here a little while longer. During that time, I also bought a baseball bat, which I now kept beside my bed. Now, I still kept the door to the bedroom open at night, but only slightly ajar so marbles could slip in or out. I didn't feel comfortable seeing the doorway where that thing had been. One night, Marbles came in and hopped up on the bed like she usually does. She settled down and rested her head on my thigh, a common occurrence. I had been asleep and never bothered to open my eyes. I started drifting back off to sleep when I heard a sound. It was a familiar sound of scratching on the floor. It was Marble's nails on the floor as she walked. It came from the living room and was approaching the bedroom door. I was facing the side of the room with the door and I opened my eyes. Marbles was there, pushing the door open and coming in. A chill ran up my spine. Slowly I looked over and down at the bed. It was there. The thing was resting its head on my thigh, looking right into my eyes. For a second I got a look at it. It had a humanoid form, but it was impossibly inhuman. Its face was horrific, with those beady black eyes, long greasy black hair, and a mouth without lips. Its body was elongated, and it looked as though it was made up of only bones with skin wrapped tightly around them. Its face started to creep closer to mine, and I was finally able to move. I threw the blanket over the thing and jumped out of the bed, running to the front door. I could hear it scurrying behind me, along with marbles running behind. When I got to the door, I turned to see both Marbles and the thing following. Marbles made it to the door first, and once she was out, I slammed the door closed. I heard and felt the thing slam against the door, scratching and banging against it. I could also hear its raspy breathing. Eventually, it all went quiet. My phone was still inside, but after a while, one of the neighbors opened the door after frantic knocking. They phoned the police for me. The police weren't as friendly this time, but I told them I trapped the person inside my apartment. After a long search of the entire apartment, the police found... Nothing. I couldn't believe it. They scolded me and told me that if I called for this again, I'd be arrested. I felt like I was going insane. Refusing to go back in alone, the landlord accompanied me while I packed up all my belongings. I wasn't staying here any longer. My parents had an extra room they offered me, and it was going to take a long time before I felt comfortable being alone again. I'm typing all this out from my parents' house, laying in the guest room. Well, a few paragraphs ago, I noticed something. Over in the corner is a closet with folding doors. It's slightly open, and in the crack of the doors I can see two beady black eyes staring right at me. Sorry to disturb you, sir. Miss Morton said with a sense of nervousness and urgency, 
Can I have Aoife, Molly, Joseph, Kieran, Troy, Chloe, Ryan, and Michael? Her voice wavering as she called my name last. All of us, in ritual unison, did as she asked, packing our bags and following Miss Morton out the door. We were used to this. Most of us had been doing this every year, on the 29th of November, since we were in primary school. Every year, around 2 p.m., we would be let out of school early. None of us really knew why. Our parents never knew why either, but we had our theories. Bet it's the government doing some experiments, Troy always used to say. A conspiratorial attitude that followed him through to his adult life. Police exercises for terrorism, was Aoife's diagnosis. As we walked through the corridor, I saw notices up on the walls and doors. Bold letters exclaimed. Message from Haringey, Barnett, and Camden London Councils. Residents of the following Trafford on Thames areas. Wolverhampton Street, Barnett Street, Fallowfield Crescent, Scarisback Avenue, and Griggs Road. 4 p.m. curfew, 29th November 2012. Ensure all doors and windows locked and curtains closed. Bit dramatic. Ryan said sarcastically as he glanced over at the poster. What's your theory on all this? Police exercise? I replied. I didn't really have any theories of my own and I didn't really care. I was just happy to be out of school early, and my mind was more focused on getting home to play some video games. Any plans this evening? I asked Ryan with the same courtesy he'd given me. Probably just finish watching Breaking Bad to be honest. You? Probably play some Borderlands too. I don't know, I'm gonna be home alone. Mom and Dad have gone to Cornwall for the next few days. Romantic getaway. House party? Ryan said with a laugh. You wish. I clapped back. Not today of all days especially. We continued our long march through the dull brown school corridors, joined by other kids being pulled out of their lessons to join us in our early finish. Sometimes looking in the classroom's doors to see the other kids carrying on with their lessons. Joseph decided to be funny and started pulling faces resulting in him receiving a stern telling off from the head teacher, who was also escorting our ever-growing group. Joseph, stop being silly. Miss Mansfield yelled at Joseph. Christ, you're in year nine. Grow up. We continued through the drab corridors before finding our way to the school car park. The bright sun was already beginning to set. It shone against the November frost. Mist masking the horizon. A few of us, like Ryan, were getting picked up by their parents, but most of us were herded on to one of the five minibuses, each for our different year groups. The only people from year nine on the bus were me, Aoife, Kieran, Troy, and Chloe. Chloe Fairview, my crush. She was the most beautiful girl I'd laid eyes on. She was perfect. From her big, cute brown eyes to her long, flowing brown hair and her small red lips. I never got the nerve to talk to her, always admiring her from a distance, always daydreaming about her. As we go on the bus, I sat near the window by myself, whilst Chloe sat at the back with Aoife. The journey started as soon as everyone had boarded. Miss Morton jumped on as well after taking a register to ensure we were all present. Trafford on Thames was a strange part of London. It wasn't as urban and trendy as places like Shoreditch or Camden, or a built-up concrete jungle like Stratford or Finsbury Park. Where my school was, it had more in common with a rural village of the Shires, only being home to about 4,000 people. The nearest tube station was a 40-minute walk away, and it seldom had anything in entertainment. 
The only amenities being a park, a corner shop, a McDonald's, a Chinese takeaway, and a few pubs. It was the sticks, essentially. As we drove through the hustle of bustle of Finsbury Park and onto the carriageway, I alternated between looking out the window at the winter sunset, watching the world go by, and sneaking glances at Chloe as she chatted and laughed with Aoife. She looked so cute when she laughed, my mind also alternating between thinking about my plans for the night, which consisted of playing Borderlands 2, and having the leftover dominoes from the night before and thinking about Chloe. Even though my chances with her were non-existent. She was the most beautiful girl in our year. I was a 4 foot 11 specky lad with a stick thin body. I usually liked being home alone, but this would be my first curfew on my own. The thought unsettled me. Little did I know at the time, unsettling wouldn't even begin to describe what happened. Before we knew it, our bus hit its first stop at Griggs Road, with Troy departing, still laughing from whatever joke Kieran had told. The Skyris Brick Avenue, Aoife's stop, in which she waved at Chloe with a farewell smile. Then Barnett Street, in which Kieran departed, leaving me and Chloe as the only two on the bus. I really wanted to talk to her. My heart was pounding. A part of my brain sang, Go for it, Michael. Go for it, lad. And a bigger part of me screaming, It's pointless. You've got no chance. My internal dialogue continued bickering before I noticed I was staring at Chloe. She noticed too. I quickly averted my eyes in sheer embarrassment, making Chloe laugh. Not a mean-spirited laugh, but a happy bellowing laugh, as I, one of her friends, told her one of those jokes. That would cause an entire group of people to lose their stuff, too. My cheeks were absolutely hot red. If I could have seen myself, I imagine I'd look like a bloody strawberry with spectacles. She stopped laughing as I looked back and she gave me a warm smile. My heart felt like it was on the brink of imploding. I almost breathed a sigh of relief as the bus stopped at Follow Field Crescent, Chloe Street. See you tomorrow. She said with a smile, with my response being a pathetic and awkward wave. My heart rate slowed slightly as the minibus hit its final stop. Mine. Wolverhampton Street. I alighted the bus and head to my home, making sure to lock the door behind me. I headed into the kitchen and took a slice of cold leftover pizza from the fridge. As I closed the door, I noticed a note attached to it. Help yourself to the pizza and remember to lock every door and window and draw the curtains. We'll be back Monday. Love, Mom. It was 3 p.m. now, giving me an hour to lock everything before the curfew. I quickly went through the house, from the kitchen to the living room to the bedrooms, my mind still fixated on Chloe. When I was sure I locked everything and closed the curtains, I went up to my bedroom, jumped on my PC, and began playing Borderlands 2. The new DLC, Torg's Campaign of Carnage, had been released recently and I was excited to play it. After a few hours of killing mobs, completing quests, and a few hits at trying to get legendaries from bosses, I was feeling a bit peckish. It was about half past seven, so I went downstairs to get the rest of the leftover pizza. For some reason, on my way back up, I went into the living room and looked through the gap in the curtains. The dark streets outside were lit by streetlights, the November mist dimming their rays. Just as I was about to turn around to go back upstairs, I saw it. 
Limping barefoot through the cold November night was a woman. The only article of clothing on her was a dark stained white shirt. Her dark hair was covering her face. The most distinct aspect of her was the fact she seemed to be missing on her arms. My eyes were fixed on this woman, almost the same way one would with a train rack. I noticed more about her as she strolled under the street lights. Her legs had numerous cuts and lacerations, as did her remaining arm. The stains on her shirt were dark red, almost blood-like. As the woman was passing my house, she suddenly stopped and turned in my direction. My heart dropped, my stomach nodded, and I felt the color fleeing my face with the speed of cockroach exposed to light. The woman moved the hair from in front of her face to reveal she had an ear-to-ear -ear grin. Her eyes were as wide as those of a hungry tiger, and they were laser-focused on me. I wanted to move. I wanted to run, but my body was frozen still. A part of me thought she was a woman who just happened to be locked out during the curfew, and another part slowly realized this was why we had the curfew. As that thought entered my mind, with an unnatural speed that no creature, fictional or real, could muster, the woman ran to the window. I almost fell over in fright, dropping the plate of pizza. My senses came back to me and I sprinted up the stairs, adrenaline pumping through my veins. As I ran, I could hear that creature tapping on the window with desperate fervor. The sound getting quieter as I approached the safe haven of my room, engaging the lock on it for good measure. As I sat down on my bed, I heard the door knock. Please let me in. I've been kicked out. I need somewhere to stay during the curfew. A dainty voice cried out as the door knocked again. Please. The voice trailed off. Let me in. An almost cackling, screeching voice bellowed with caustic rage. As the knocking on the front door got louder and more aggressive, I could hear movement around the side of the house, and the sound of the gate that leads to the back garden rattling, almost as if something was climbing over it. Please let me in. The voice reverted to a dainty damsel in distress, an almost sweet quality to it. I'll be all right, I said out loud, the adrenaline starting to dissipate. Yes, this woman would be annoying and frightening, but there's no way she could get in. Everything was locked. I'm safe. My heart dropped when I heard the distinct sound of the back door opening. Some words left my mouth involuntarily. Whilst I was ensuring everything was locked, I was too busy thinking about Chloe to double-check everything. My heart was pounding like a jackhammer as I quickly hid under my bed. The only thing I could think to do, there was a box under there, big enough so that I could fit my tiny frame, which I climbed under as added layer of protection against the horror that entered my home, creating a gap so I could peek out. As I hid in my sanctuary, I tried my best to calm my breathing. As I could hear the creature searching downstairs, opening cabinets and slamming doors, the creature was talking to itself. As the reverb of its cackling witch-like voice echoed around the house, the beating of my heart increased in speed and volume as I heard that thing climbing up the stairs. It seemed that every uneven step she took, my heart rate increased by a few more beats per minute, meeting its crescendo when I heard the sound of the floor creak as the creature outside my door. I put my hand over my mouth to muffle the sound of my breathing, hoping the creature would hear me. The door jiggled as she attempted to open the door. A wave of naive relief washed over me. I hoped she would have given up and left me alone. My relief was disturbed by the loud bang of the door violently bashed open. 
The wave of relief was replaced by a cold, sweaty wave of dread. The discernible smell of rotting flesh filled the air. Hide and seek? I love this game. The cackling voice chuckled with macabre humor. My computer monitor was still on, and through the bright light, as the creature limped on, I could see her legs were a mess of lacerations, glass and debris protruding from some of the open wounds. I held my hand firmer over my mouth, paranoid that the sound of my breathing would give my location away. The monstrosity began searching through my wardrobe, rummaging around, checking if I, its quarry, was in there. Unsatisfied, it turned around. I could see its mutilated legs face in my direction as the creature slowly crouched down. As it did so, I noticed that the fingers on its singular arm had razor-sharp, long claws on them, almost Freddy Krueger-like in a twisted way. The creature crawled under my bed, looking around with its sunken in, insane eyes, searching around like a predator hunting its prey. I can smell you, the creature said in a low, creepy sing-song voice. As it got closer, I noticed that what I thought was a smile earlier was the farthest thing from the truth. The creature's smile was instead a deep ear-to-ear -ear Chelsea grin sliced into its face. Its lips were also removed, exposing its chipped and rotten teeth. The stench of decay intensified as the creature got closer to my hiding place. The relentless beating of my heart was the only sound I could hear as the creature's eyes met mine, glowing with sadistic madness. For what felt like hours, the creature stared. I couldn't take my eyes off it. That's it. I'm going to die. I'm dead. Was the only thought that filled my mind as the creature continued to stare, its smile seeming to grow wider, its rotten halitosis almost making me vomit. Suddenly the creature simply got up from under my bed and walked away, searching the other bedrooms before I heard it walking down the stairs and leaving through the back door. I didn't dare sleep or move until the sun had risen. At 8.30 the next day, I arrived at school, sleep deprived and still shaken up from the night before. I stopped by a corner shop to grab a few energy drinks, realizing I probably wouldn't be able to get through the day without them. The visage of that creature still stuck in my head like a song. As I went into my forum room, I sat next to Ryan. You look like hell. Up all night? He quipped. I didn't really have the energy to tell him the whole story, so I just nodded. I noticed Chloe wasn't in today, which was very strange as she was always the type to be in early and rarely called in sick. Where's Chloe? I asked Ryan. Probably just sick. Probably not feeling it today. He chuckled. Our form tutor came in, looking solemn. After quieting everyone down, she made an announcement. First period is cancelled. There's going to be an assembly for the year 9s and year 11s. So, as soon as the bell rings, head to the hall. After she took the register and bell rang, we all packed our bags and headed for the hall. The assembly hall was absolutely filled by the time we got there. At the front was the head teacher, Miss Mansfield, our head of year, Mr. Burke, the deputy head teacher, Mrs. Descopta, and two police officers. My heart began to sink, the color in my face drained. My gut feeling was telling me this had to do something with Chloe and that creature. We all sat down, a rapt audience. Good morning, Year 9, Miss Mansfield's son. I... She was struggling to find the words for her announcement. The feeling in my gut intensified. I have some really bad news. She finally announced, surveying the room, momentarily locking eyes with me for a second. 
Chloe Fairview is currently in the hospital. She's very badly injured, and it's not looking good. She almost choked up. Unfortunately, her sister, Roseanne Fairview, and the rest of the family have sadly passed away. That is all we have prepared to say for now. I felt like I was going to throw up. My gut feeling was correct. Something at Chloe's house must have accidentally left a window unlocked or forgot to double check the locks on the back door and now, Chloe was fighting for her life and her family was dead. I felt dizzy and nauseous. Not just about Chloe and her family, but the fact that could have easily have been me, either dead or gravely injured. The next few months and years were a bit of a whirlwind. I visited Chloe in hospital. The extent of her injuries was almost indescribable. She looked like she'd almost been cut to ribbons. Lacerations and bandages covered her entire body, and she was in medically induced coma. It was heartbreaking to see the girl I liked so much in such a dire state. She made a full recover eventually, but she ended up having to move in with family up in Warwickshire, and I never saw her again. After I told them my story, and when they heard about what happened to Chloe, my family sold the house and moved to Crouch End. I'm still haunted by the events of that night. I've had almost constant nightmares about that creature ripping me to shreds. Even years after I moved away from that area, I've been drinking a lot to cope with the memories. Recently though, curiosity got the better of me, and I did a bit of reading to try and find out what the creature was and what its origins were, and the origins of the curfew. The only things I could find was about the murder of a prostitute in the 1960s. They found her body mutilated beyond recognition, but apart from that she was intact, left arm included. But I found that the curfews had been going since the 1600s. The next thing I found was a bit more chilling to say the least. In 1634, a woman accused of being a witch was brutally lynched by the townspeople of Trafford on Thames. When the dust settled, her crumpled form, missing her left arm, was burned. As she screamed in agony, it was said she cursed the town, coming back once a year to inflict the same agony she suffered onto them. In the article I saw on artist depiction of the lynching, and a cold chill ran down my spine, and the memories of that night flooded back. In the painting, dated 29th of November, 1634, as the witch was being dragged by the mob, I saw her face almost smiling, grin sliced from ear to ear, and lips removed. But that wasn't the only thing that terrified me during my reading. I found an article from the Trafford Post, dated 30th of November 2021. Family of four found brutally murdered on Wolverhampton Street. She's still out there. I recently started university. I had to move to a dorm because campus is far away from home. I moved into a standalone dorm house with five rooms. Me and one of my friends both ended up in the same house. I haven't really talked with the other three people living here. They're barely here anyways. The dorm owner, Carl, is a friendly guy. He's always smiling and making jokes. Sometimes he can be corny, but it's better than having a creepy dorm owner. Our contract states that every weekend they come to collect the trash. Carl made additional mention to this when handing me the key. What I didn't notice back then, but probably should have, is how he worded it. And remember, every weekend they come to collect the trash. The first week was a bit eerie, but I find that's normal when living somewhere new. You'll notice all the smaller details, the little sounds, every creak. 
It's something you get used to after a while, but it made the first couple of nights a sleepless hell. It doesn't matter that I could hear the neighbors arguing every single night. I finally got some rest the third night. After that, I stopped locking my door at night. I know rationally speaking, I didn't have to lock it. The rest of the week went by relatively smoothly. I had to adapt to university and living alone. I am lucky I have my parents to support me and pay for my bills. When the first weekend came around, I was woken up at 10 a.m. by the sound of the front door opening and closing. I figured it was Carl collecting the trash like he said would happen. Now that I was awake, I really had to pee, but to avoid social interaction, I waited until he left. After about 30 minutes, the door opened and closed again, so I went downstairs to use the toilet. Out of curiosity, I checked the trash cans. As expected, they were emptied. The second week went by and I decided to head home over the weekend. When I came back on Sunday, the bins were once again empty. I was the first one back home, it seems. Everyone leaves over the weekend. I have decided I would stay at my dorm whenever I want to work for school. I knew that if I went home, I would get distracted easily anyways. On week three, I stayed at the dorm again. On Saturday, I heard the door at 9 a.m. and decided to get up and work for school. At around noon, I was about to head downstairs to get a glass when I heard the front door again. I waited a couple seconds but didn't hear anything. At first, I assumed it was Carl leaving but then realized it had been three hours since he supposedly entered. Maybe it was one of my dorm mates who forgot to mention he was still home. It was weird, but I didn't think too much about it. I wasn't home again for week four. For week five, however, because of the slightly off-putting experience from week three, I wanted to see what Carl was up to when he came to collect the trash. I know it sounds a bit rash, but I suffer from GAD, Generalized Anxiety Disorder, so I decided to do this to calm myself. I fully expected nothing to really come from it. On Saturday, I decided to head downstairs at 9am. That way, I would surely see Carl. I waited downstairs for hours until 1pm. I figured he might be coming tomorrow instead. He did say they would come on the weekend, not specifically on Saturday. I went back upstairs and the second I closed my door, I heard the front door open. To say I was freaked out would be an understatement but I gathered some courage and decided to go back downstairs, only to find nobody there. The front door hadn't opened a second time, so whoever came in should still be there. I checked the trash, and to my surprise, it was empty. When things got weird and scary, your mind does two things. It tries to rationalize the situation, and it comes up with the most illogical explanations at the same time. But with this, there was no rational explanation. Even if I just didn't hear the door the second time, no way he was able to empty two full trash cans in just 10 seconds and disappear afterwards. I went back to my room and locked my door again. I texted my friend about it, but he didn't respond. He could very well just be busy. Only then I realized... Whoever opened the door is still in the house. But who the hell do you call in these situations? I mean, cops won't believe you. And my parents will just think I imagined things. So I did what any logical person would do. I locked myself in my room until Monday, when my dorm mates return. After about an hour, I get a text back from my friend. He responds thinking I'm just setting up some sort of joke. I mean, I don't blame him for thinking that, but I also know he won't believe me. I've been very dedicated when making jokes before. It's like the boy who cried wolf. Throughout the rest of the weekend, I heard nothing except the ambient sounds of my neighbors fighting. When I finally hear people arrive on Monday, I leave my room. First course of action is going to the electronics store next door. I'm not staying here this weekend. I'm not crazy. 
but I am going to install a camera. Friday rolls around and I place the camera somewhere hidden, looking at the trash cans. During the weekend I can't stop thinking about what I'll see when I return. I decided to take the train on Monday extra early instead of on Sunday evening just to be safe. When I arrived back at the dorm, the trash was empty. I take the camera, head to my room, and lock the door behind me. I spent hours looking over the footage trying to find something, but there's nothing. Not a single person entered the frame, nothing interacted with the trash cans. I frantically look through the video trying to find something. Maybe a splice, a time skip, but there's nothing. Absolutely nothing. As scary as this is, now I have proof. I wait for my friend to arrive and practically drag him into my room. I drag my mouse through the preview slider to show him nobody was here all weekend. He just gives me a dead stare and says, You're not fooling me. Just because you're moving fast over the preview bar doesn't mean I don't see him. That sentence sent chills down my spine. I asked him who he saw and he took my mouse and dragged it to Saturday, 10am. I'm not blind, I can clearly see him. He sighed and he turned around to leave the room but I stopped him. I asked him to trust me. I don't see anyone on the camera. He told me if I was really worried I should just call Carl and ask him about it. I could tell he was worried about me but just didn't believe me. However, I hadn't considered calling Carl. He probably has an explanation. At least, I hope he does. This is all becoming a bit too much for me. I can handle things. I've trained myself to control my fear, but this isn't something irrational. This is real. I called Carl, hoping to finally have an explanation. When he picked up, I started ranting. I told him everything that had happened only to be met with bone-chilling silence. After what felt like an eternity, he simply said, Don't leave your room when they arrive, and hung up. I tried calling back, but he didn't answer. I couldn't go home regardless of what had happened. I couldn't miss class. Believe it or not, being haunted is not a valid reason to skip class, and because of the study point system, I couldn't really afford to fail, literally. I would avoid leaving my room whenever I can. I'd use the bathroom in school, I'd skip showering altogether, and would keep all my food in my room. I only left to go to class, otherwise I would be sitting safely behind my locked door. Sleeping was hard, but I managed. It wasn't until Thursday when the reality of my new situation kicked in. I cried a lot that night. I really wanted to go home, but I know nobody would believe me. I had a lot of projects due and at home. Well, I wouldn't be able to get them done, so I decided to try and ignore everything and just focus on my schoolwork. Saturday morning, I get woken up by the sound of the front door at 10 a.m. I double check to make sure my door is locked and wait behind it until I hear them leave. It only took them 15 minutes to clear out the trash today. I sighed with relief when I heard the front door a second time. I still wasn't going to leave my room though. I opened my curtains, put on my headphones, and started modeling. At around 3pm I heard a faint knock. I removed my headphones to make sure I was hearing it right. After about a minute I heard it again. It was louder. I looked at my door and heard three more knocks. They were coming from the window. Now I know something is wrong. Because my room is on the second floor. The knocking becomes more frequent, but I don't dare turn around. Instead, I walk backwards to the window and close the curtains behind my back. Just then I saw a shadow of a tall silhouette on the wall. Whatever was knocking was very much real. I closed the curtains and the knocking stopped for a minute, but I still didn't turn around. I was unsure of what to do next. Maybe it's gone. Or is that the they Carl was talking about? Before I could really find a cohesive trail of thought, 
the knocking on my window started again, but this time louder and even more frequent. And then I heard three knocks on my door. This is it. I'm dead. No way I'm making it out. I started crying. What else could I do? It's me, Carl. Carl shouted from the other side of the door. I could barely hear it with the knocking. I had no way to know if it was really Carl or not, but what choice did I have? I opened the door and was greeted by a big smile. Carl told me to wait outside my room with my eyes closed, hands covering them and everything, so I did. He gave me a pat on my back and entered my room. I could hear him open my window and the knocking stopped. Two loud thuds followed and I could feel the air move behind me as Carl guided whatever was outside my window downstairs. I could hear heavy footsteps going all throughout the house, until the front door opened and closed again. But I didn't move. I didn't speak. I didn't open my eyes. I stood still for what felt like an eternity, until I heard Carl shout at me that it's all clear. I slowly turned around and opened my eyes. I saw Carl walk up the stairs with a smile like always. I tried talking and asking him what had just happened, but I tripped over my words. I was in too much shock to form a full sentence. I call them collectors. I'm not sure where they came from, but I also don't know why you are able to see what you see. Normally their existence stays unknown. They are able to mask themselves. That's why your friend was able to see someone take out the trash, but that never happened in reality. As Carl started explaining, he pointed to my chair. Sit down. You're coming back from a panic attack. We don't want you to faint. Once again, I tried to speak, but I found myself only able to speak gibberish. But that didn't matter. Carl knew what I was going to ask. It was able to sense you were in the house, either through heightened senses, or maybe it recognized a change in patterns. I'm not sure myself. These things, they show up to keep things the same. Every week they show up and clear out the trash because they want to keep the trash cans the same as how they first saw them. Empty. It may seem helpful, and most times it is, but sometimes... Well, let's not get into details. I finally started to calm down, and just then I noticed all my trash was gone. But I know for certain that creature didn't have any time to take it. Just like on the camera, the creatures never showed up. Maybe they can clean it from a range. Whatever it is, I'm glad it's gone now. Well, kid, I should leave. And don't worry too much, this window incident was a one-time thing. Carl stood up smiled at me, and left the room. I made sure to lock the door behind him, however, just to be sure. The rest of the night, I kept thinking about what to do. I mean, I have to get out of here, right? I can't stay here. Now that they know I'm special somehow? But maybe Carl is right. What if this was a one-time thing? I couldn't hear anything that evening, and decided to head to bed early. I could hear the neighbors arguing again, and I took notice of what they said. I never realized it before, but they kept repeating the same things at the same time every day. I felt a cold chill as I realized that this is probably what Carl meant with the sometimes where they aren't as helpful. It makes me happy he showed up because maybe I would have ended up like my neighbors. I was freaked out the rest of the night. You can't really blame me, can you? Sunday morning rolls and I hear the front door open at 10 a.m. It was weird, but I assumed when Carl led the creature outside, he managed to change their schedule somehow. Either way, I wasn't leaving my room, nor was I going to open my curtains again. At 10 past 3 p.m. I heard three knocks on my door. It's me, Carl. Carl shouted from the other side of the door. It was odd he was here, but I opened the door anyways. When I opened the door, 
I was greeted by a big smile. Carl told me to wait outside my room with my eyes closed, hands covering them and everything, so I did. He gave me a pat on my back and entered my room. I could hear him open my window and stop. There was no knocking, no thuds, just silence. Only then did I realize I never heard the front door a second time. I ran to the bathroom, locked the door, and decided the only place where people would believe my story is here. So please, please listen to me. Don't investigate them. Don't wonder about them. Don't let them know you are aware they exist. But most importantly, don't leave your room when they arrive. My name is Michael Sully, and me and my friend were the sole survivors of a horrific event. It's been nearly 40 years now, and until recently, I was sure this story would never see the light of day. It was only after my recent visit to the doctor, where I received some very bad news, that I was suddenly struck with a certain sense of... sentimentality for what happened. It sounds odd, I know. Don't get me wrong, what happened was horrible, and I would do anything in the world for it to not have occurred. But alas, that isn't possible. What happened happened, and as it stands, I don't feel as if I can let this particular tale be lost to the sands of time. So I'm writing this here, now, in the hopes that after I'm gone, the tragedy that occurred can be remembered, and who knows, perhaps others have been through similar things. It would be nice to know I'm not alone. Anyway, I'm getting off track. I'm sure you're itching to hear what I'm on about, right? It all started at a party. I was only 22 at the time, recently returned to university after a long year of traveling the Americas. My friends were glad to see me, and as soon as the weekend rolled around, I could hardly say no to a good old-fashioned night out. Unbeknownst to me, my friends invited friends of their own, and some of those friends asked their own friends to come along. When the day arrived, what began as a small get-together between a tightly knit group of five friends had turned into a romping boozer with a group of eleven or twelve half of which I didn't know at all. Although I was a little disheartened at not being able to catch up with my friends as intimately as I had hoped, the company did turn out to be quite endearing. Between five hours, seven bars, and more taxi fares than I care to remember, I drank, made conversation, and bonded with these newcomers. It felt as if within one week of returning, I had, in fact, made more friends than I had in the three years of college prior. As the end of the night rolled around, our group exited the final bar, laughing and chatting amongst ourselves. The atmosphere felt giddy and yet very calm, as the small white van we'd called to take us back to the dorm rattled slowly to a stop at the curve. We bid a drunken goodbye to those of us heading in a different direction, and opened its back doors, stepping inside the gloomy interior of the vehicle. The van wasn't quite tall enough for most of us to stand, so we ducked down and laughed as we scraped our heads against the roof until we eventually fell into our seats at the side. My best friend Jewel sat opposite me, staring at me with a gormless smile that made me laugh. As I leaned my head back against the smooth surface of the van's wall, I opened my mouth and beamed back. Not just at him, but at everyone in the van. Even the middle-aged, balding driver who turned to us from the front seat and asked where we wanted to go. Someone else answered him, while I simply lay back and basked in the glory of the universe. For the first time in my life, I felt truly happy. It was a strange experience as if realizing that every positive emotion you've ever felt had simply been a fake, 
a pale imitation of the true sensation which I was only now feeling. I was so grateful for the present which felt utterly flawless, so hopeful for the future which seemed brighter than ever, and so, so forgiving of the past which now felt like nothing but a rocky road leading to my ultimate destination in the here and now. It was nothing less than euphoric. As my friend's drunken chatter became background noise in my enlightened mind, I breathed in deep and disappeared into pure ecstasy. The next moments felt like they lasted an eternity, and at the same time, they flashed before my eyes in a matter of moments. I daren't try to explain it further. It makes no more sense to me than it does to you. With that same carefree, stupid smile on my face, and the gentle rumbling of the engine passing through my bones, I sat there, feeling like I had never felt before. Then the noise stopped. I don't quite know how to describe it. One second my ears were filled with the muffled sounds of traffic and the hum of the van. And then... nothing. The vibrations passing through the vehicle ceased as well sending a chill through my body just before the whole thing lurched forward. It felt like a descending elevator slowing to a stop far too quick. I, like almost everyone else in the van, was jolted upwards, making a resounding thump against the roof as my head smashed against it. As we fell back down into our seats and the world fell still again, our eyes began to wander between each other. Now, I know it may seem stupid given what had just happened, but every single one of us still had a smile on our face. The feeling I felt, what we must have all felt, was like a pull, drawing us into ecstasy and refusing to let go, refusing to even acknowledge the possibility that anything bad might have happened. Despite that, my naturally curious nature beckoned me to stand up from my seat and poke my head between the back of the driver and passenger seats to see into the front of the vehicle. The driver, looking even older and frailer than he did before, lay face down against the steering wheel, unconscious. Buzzed as I was, I reached forward and grabbed his shoulder, shaking him gently while muttering something totally inappropriate to the situation. I can't remember exactly, but I assume I jokingly told him he needed to get more sleep, or to wake up so he could join the party. It wasn't until I finally raised my head and saw out of the windscreen that my smile finally faded. What I saw was only darkness. No rear lights from the cars ahead of glaring yellow from street lamps. No traffic lights or buildings. I saw only black. At first I assumed a logical explanation, that the van had crashed into something black or a blanket had been tossed over the windshield, forcing the driver to brake. But as my eyes narrowed and I leaned in closer, I was proven wrong. It wasn't just darkness. It was more nuanced than that. The more I stared, the more I could make out other colors. Brown, sickly green and purple, floating and blending like clouds in a nebula. I turned around to my friends, suddenly concerned. Although the feeling of euphoria still lingered somewhere in me, they were still buzzing, a couple now drunkenly stumbling toward the back doors. When Joel reached for the handle and pulled, my eyes went wide. Before I could leap forward or shout a warning, the two doors at the back of the van swung open, suddenly revealing an all-too-vivid window into the horrid void I had seen through the front. The air did not change. No wind flew in from the outside, nor did it vent from within, save for the suddenly looming sight of this seemingly infinite expanse just beyond the safety of our small shuttle. Nothing seemed to have changed. Even the van, which was clearly no longer on solid ground, did not shift or tilt. It was perfectly still, and by that point, so was I. Joel slowly turned around, a mumbly chuckle beginning to reach up from his throat. I couldn't possibly understand what he was so jolly about, but I knew immediately something was very wrong. 
As his head turned, his eyes met with mine, and I saw a sight that haunts me to this very day. Joel's eyes were inky black, shiny, and reflective enough that I could see myself clearly in them. They were leaking vicious black fluid, flowing down his face like tears. He wasn't crying, though. His mouth was still upturned, a grin so wide I could see his lips trembling from the strain. He stared at me, the rest of his body unnaturally still. At this point, I could see a few of the others had noticed, but strangely, none of them seemed concerned, except for Harry, a lanky man I had met only that day. The others' expressions were shifting, twitching as if some internal battle was taking place to decide how they should feel about the horrifying situation. I was dumbfounded, paralyzed on the spot. As I fell still, Joel began to move again. He turned around and stepped closer to the edge of the van, practically teetering over the abyss. Then he turned to face me one final time. Even though I'm certain his mouth was already as wide as it could go, I could have sworn that he smiled at me for that moment. A smile that meant more than simply what was on his face. Without a word, he stepped out into the void. He didn't fall like I expected him to. He simply hovered there, floating slowly away as his other foot let go of the van, and his body became wholly unsupported. I did nothing. I merely watched in abject horror as my best friend was snatched by the abyss. That is my biggest regret to this day. Suddenly my attention was stolen away as another friend of mine, Elsa, snickered. It was an infectious laugh, one that demanded reciprocation. I was so terrified that it had no effect on me, but I could see the others struggling to hold in laughs of their own. One by one, they succumbed, giggling and wheezing as a bout of laughter overtook them. Their stifled smiles were broken wide open into huge grins, and I could see as their eyes darkened, as a thick liquid began to seep from them, and they slowly rose from their seats, making their way to the back of the van. Only Harry remained in his seat now suddenly fighting for control over his face as the twitchings of a smile assaulted his visage. I was frozen, forced to watch as the others stepped out into the void one by one, floating away into the infinite void. Some of them twirled as they flew, others turned around and grinned at me as they mimed swimming through the air. It was entertaining. I know all sounds sadistic saying that, but at the time, that was just how I felt. Even with all my fear, I could still understand how they were feeling. The world seemed so wonderful in that moment, so much so that nothing could be looked at in a negative way. The void was dark, but it looked comfy. Their eyes were black, an amazingly dark black the likes of which I would never seen. I felt the smile begin to rise on my lips, but I quickly pushed it away. I held my mouth tight and blinked rapidly, my heart beating out of my chest faster and faster. As I fought that battle, I saw Harry finally succumb to his urge. He stood, eyes already taken by the darkness, and made his way towards the back of the van. As his foot stepped from the edge, I finally broke free of my shock and dashed forward, grabbing his arm and pulling him back with all of my strength. His face stared back at me, grinning as if I was the mad one, ruining his fun. I pulled with all my might, grabbing one of the van's doors with my other hand as I tried to shut off his escape. The pull outside was so strong, yet it wasn't the slightest bit physical. My face was still twitching, and a warm feeling in my belly beckoned me out into the darkness. However, every time I looked out, my mind raced back to Joel, my best friend, the man whom I had had so many good memories with, taken from me. I refused to succumb to the blind comfort, the false hope. As I pulled with all my might, finally starting to make progress, 
My eyes were drawn to something within the void. Something now far away in its depths, still floating even farther. To my utter terror, it was Joel, his body straight as he floated slowly down into the gloom. His hand was moving, and it took me a second to realize what he was doing. With that unnatural grin still on his face, he was... waving at me. At that moment, I couldn't take it any longer. I pulled and pulled and eventually was able to wrench Harry back into the van. As he fell onto his back, I grabbed the doors and slammed them shut. When they connected and sealed the exit, the whole van shuddered again, the overhead lights flickering on for a moment, then on and off repeatedly. I could see the whole van shaking each time it lit up, until suddenly, everything went dark. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. I jumped up screaming at first, or at least, that's what the nurses said. It's a fuzzy memory for me. All I remember is the bright, glaring lights, the stark white walls and the warmth of the hospital instilling me with dread. When I came to my senses, the doctor explained that I had been found in an alleyway with severe bruising and several muscular tears. I asked them about Harry and the van, but they seemed to know nothing about it. I was found alone. I didn't even try to tell them what had happened. I knew they wouldn't believe me and could have done without being locked up in a psychiatric unit. I stayed in the hospital for a few days before I was discharged, and the first thing I did was try to find Harry. It took me almost a week, but I did eventually track him down. He was in a hospital in a completely different part of the city, miles and miles away from mine, and even further from the place the van had picked us up. He was so relieved to hear my voice when I visited. His eyes remained black, the doctors diagnosing him with some condition, or other to explain his sudden and total blindness. Only we knew the truth, and Harry, too, seemed inclined to keep it a secret. He never did get his vision back. For the first few months, I looked after him as got used to his new condition. Although he eventually moved away to be with family, we did keep in touch until his passing some years ago. As for myself, I spent a lot of my time after that researching events similar to mine, desperate to make sense of what happened. I never found anything, and was eventually forced to give up. I tried my best to go back to living a normal life, and for the most part, I succeeded. Though, every time I see a white van rolling down the street, I still feel my stomach drop. It's irrational, I know. I'm as certain as anything that the van and the driver had nothing to do with it. The fault, if anything, was ours. It pains me to think that we, in our youthful arrogance, doomed that innocent man to a fate still unknown. And that concludes my story. I know most of you reading won't believe it, and that's fine. I just hope that one day it can serve as a comfort for the next person who finds themselves a survivor of that horrid, horrid place. And remember, because this part is important, if you ever find yourself in a moment where you are so blissfully happy, a moment that seems to transport you, one you feel like you could stay in forever, whatever you do, don't smile. This might be the first and last story that I will be able to share with all of you. I have been hooked on fishing ever since I was a little boy. There was a river a couple of kilometers away from the place we lived, to which we would always go at least once or twice a week with my dad. Each week it was the same thing. My dad would come home from work and ask me, Waylon, did you finish your homework? and I would always cut him off right before he could even finish saying what he was about to say. Yes, Dad. Now, please, let's go to the river. 
I would then say to him in an excited manner. He would then give me a faint smile knowing that I probably haven't even looked at my homework. And right he was, most of the time. At first we had a rule that I would have to finish my homework first, and then we could go to the river. But after a couple of attempts and a couple of missed fishing trips, that rule was quickly dismissed. That might have not been the best decision, but we couldn't help it since we both loved fishing so much. We would then go late in the afternoon, camp at the river the whole night, and come back home somewhere around lunchtime. Those were the days, I'm telling you. Anyways, that was a long time ago. Ever since he passed away, things just haven't been the same. I have tried going fishing a couple of times, but I just couldn't enjoy the fishing experience by itself. But rather, I would reminisce about old times and how good things were. I used to work as a delivery man, and most of the time I worked alone. I started enjoying the time alone, being able to listen to whatever music you want, and not having someone on your head the entire day. A couple of months passed and my boss decided to upgrade my truck to a bigger one. The problem was that I would have to deliver much heavier stuff and it would be pretty hard to do that by myself. Problem solved. I had a new colleague accompanying me then. His name was Dave. He had been working for the company for a long time, but we never spoke to each other. At first I thought, here goes my peace and quiet that I love so much. But after we got to know each other, I found out that Dave was not a bad guy at all. People might have thought bad of him because of his appearance, but he had a kind heart. One day, we were going back and forth in our conversation. So, what were you up to this weekend? I asked him. Oh, not much. Just went on a little fishing trip. There's a lake nearby and it's full of fish, I'm telling you. My eyes widened up a bit. Dave didn't strike me as a guy who would like to go fishing. No way. I snapped back at him. What? He asked me. We talked a bit, and he got really excited when he learned that I loved fishing as well. That's the story of how we became fishing buddies. Fast forward a bit. It was Friday, somewhere around lunchtime, and we had to deliver a package to a rural village right next to our town. On the way there, we saw a lake a couple of kilometers before the village. We never knew about this lake, and it piqued our interest. We always carried our fishing gear in the truck, so there was no way we wouldn't visit this new spot we just learned about. Package delivered. We went around the village searching for a fishing store, because we had to buy some supplies first. And surprisingly, we found one. Hey there, boss. I said to the cashier as soon as I entered the store, Hello, mate. What can I get for you? He replied, Ah, uh, just a bunch of worms and a can of corn. I said, Anything else I can get for you, mate? He asked as he was typing on the cash register. No, that's all, thank you. Oh, and by the way, do you know anything about this lake that's a couple of kilometers before the village? I went back to ask him. His face dropped. This surprised me a bit because he had such a big smile on his face the whole time. I'm sorry I can't tell you anything about it. He replied coldly. I just assumed he didn't know anything about this lake, so I just grabbed the bag with the supplies, gave him the money, and headed towards the exit door. Have a nice day, sir. I said to him as I exited the store. Good luck was the last thing I heard as I was leaving the premises. We were really excited about going to this lake despite not knowing anything about it, so we entered the car and took off. The way he said, good luck, I didn't quite like it, Dave said to me. Why, he probably meant good luck with fishing or something. I replied, yeah, probably, Dave muttered. It was getting kind of late, the road that led to the lake was really bad, but that didn't stop us, and we finally reached the lake. The place was beautiful. Not a single ripple on the water, surrounded by thick shrubbery and tall pine trees. I was surprised how there was no one else besides us here. 
As we were getting our fishing gear out, a tall bearded man approached us. Hello there. I said to him as he was coming towards us. Are you the owner of this lake? I asked him. Nothing again. He then reached his hand into his bag that he was carrying with him. I got scared for a second, but then he pulled out a notebook and started writing something down in it. A couple of minutes passed and he was finally done. He left the notebook on the ground and he started walking back towards the forest. Not long after he was gone, all of this really weirded me out. Hey, what's up? Dave asked me. During this strange encounter, Dave was in the truck so he had no idea what had happened. And so I thoroughly explained. For some reason, Dave found this to be really funny. Don't think much of it, Whale. He told me while giggling. Dave started setting up the tent as I was getting the fishing rods ready. Maybe because the shock from all of this, I completely forgot about the notebook. An hour or two later, I had to take a piss, so I headed towards the woods. On my way there, I caught a glimpse of the notebook, but it wasn't on the ground where the mysterious man had left it. It was pinched underneath the wipers of the truck. I thought to myself, this is really weird. There was no way for the notebook to get over there by itself, and we haven't seen a single person go by. I forgot entirely about taking a piss and I headed for the notebook. I opened the notebook and the following was written down on the first page. It requires you to abide to the following rules as soon as you read them. 1. Don't have more than 5 fishing rods out at once. 2. Do not litter. 3. Release all fish that weigh under 2.66 kilograms. The first set of rules seemed normal, setting aside rule number 3 which was oddly specific. But then the rules started getting weird. 4. You can light a fire twice, and each must contain no more than 6 logs. Only after the first fire has gone out can you light a second one. 5. You must write down in this notebook everything important that has happened in the last hour. After you do that, you must tear off and burn the page with the things you have written down on it, within 6 minutes of writing it. 6. You cannot talk to each other about anything regarding your experience throughout the night, but you can read it from the notebook before burning the page. 7. If you break any two of those rules, you will be unable to leave the lake for the next six hours, starting from the moment you have broken the given rules. If that happens, you must pay close attention to the notebook. 8. If you make it through the six hours, you will be able to leave, but you must never speak to anyone about anything regarding this lake. You have been warned. At first, I was unsure if I read the rules correctly. Is this some kind of joke? I ran to Dave with the notebook and I gave it to him. He read through the rules and started laughing. There is no way you believed any of this, right? He asked me while laughing. Yeah, right. I replied, letting out a nervous giggle. Come on, this guy is probably just trying to scare us so that we don't do anything stupid and ruin this beautiful lake. And by the looks of it, he succeeded in scaring you. Dave said. Nah, you're imagining things. I replied, trying to not look scared at all. Anyways, let's get back to fishing. Dave said. As we only had four rods in total, we were respectful enough towards nature to not litter, and we didn't catch a single fish for the first couple of hours. So we complied with the first three rules without even thinking about them. It got cold really fast and Dave said that it's time to light a fire. While he was chopping wood for the fire, I decided to play along with rule number five. And so as soon as the next hour came, I started writing down what had happened. I wrote down that nothing out of the ordinary had occurred during this last hour. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw that the tip of my rod had started to bend a little. I immediately jumped out of my chair and I set the hook. And there it was. The first fish caught for the day. 
It was a catfish which weighed around two kilos. Dave said it would be perfect for the grill. I teased him and said, aren't we going to keep up to the rules? He just looked at me and laughed. Dave put his knife through the fish's head and started filleting it. I then used the page that I had just written down on as fuel for the fire. The fire had seven logs in it, so while Dave wasn't looking, I removed one of the logs. The other thing that was bugging me was the time. Six minutes hadn't passed, so rule number four and number five were complied with. We ate, and we got back to fishing. The next hour came. I opened the notebook to start writing down what had happened, but then I saw that rule number three had been erased from the first page. I mentioned it to Dave, but he didn't believe me, and he thought that I was trying to scare him. I brushed it off as a coincidence. Man, how naive could I be? I wrote down what had happened during the last hour, and I poured myself a drink. As we were talking to each other, Dave suddenly stopped talking. I asked him what was wrong, but he didn't answer. I thought that he was mad at me for some reason, so I decided to not bug him for the time being. Here comes the next hour. I reached for the notebook, but Dave got it before me. When I took a closer look, I realized that he was shaking a little. I asked him what's wrong, but he didn't answer. I've never seen him look scared ever. This was a first for me. After he finished writing in the notebook, he handed it to me. It read the following. I know you might not believe me and think I'm trying to scare you, but I kid you not, I saw something on the other side of the lake. It resembled a deer in a way. Or only it did at first. I think it realized that I was looking at it. And when it did, it stood up on its two back legs and it started staring at me. I know my eyes might be playing tricks on me, but it looked like its flesh was rotting, and it was hanging down from parts of its body. I just couldn't take my eyes off it. Please tell me I'm not going crazy. As I was reading this, I took a glance at Dave. I could see the terror in his eyes. I was scared to look at the place he mentioned this creature was, but I did. There was nothing there. Dave looked as well. Confusion was written all over his face. I ripped the page out of the notebook and I threw it in the fire. Maybe we should slow down on drinking, Dave. I said to him. I am perfectly sober, Whale. I don't think alcohol has anything to do with this. He replied. His voice was trembling. It was midnight now. We both took turns writing down what we thought about this strange occurrence. As I was writing in the notebook, we both heard some branch break in the distance. We both looked in the direction of where the noise came from. To our relief, it was actually a deer. A normal looking deer passing by. I started laughing. On the other hand, Dave got mad that he had been scared for nothing. He took an empty bottle and he threw it at the deer as it was running away. Hey, you should go pick that up, I told Dave. Yeah, yeah, my bad. I just got really mad for a second there. He replied and we both started laughing. Dave went off to look for the bottle that he threw at the deer. I decided to write down for the last time what had happened in the notebook. I thought to myself, maybe the person that handed me the notebook is the owner of this lake, and he likes reading about the experiences of the people that visit the lake. I took my pen and opened the notebook only to see that all of the rules from the first page have disappeared. I started getting scared again. What's going on? I asked myself. Then I realized that Dave just broke another rule. No littering. As I was starting to panic, I saw a new rule appear right before my eyes on the first page of the notebook. Do not move. What? I muttered. As soon as I read the new rule, I felt a presence standing behind me. Chills went down my spine. Dave? I whispered. I could feel and hear something breathing right next to my ear. Chills went down my spine once again, and the smell. It smelled like something had died and had been rotting there for weeks. 
I wanted to scream, but I was horrified of what might happen if I do. So I just stood there staring straight ahead, not moving a muscle. A couple of minutes passed and that thing finally started going back into the woods. It had only been a couple of minutes, but for me it felt like hours had gone by. I started running towards the truck. I got in, but when I tried to start the truck, nothing happened. I whipped out the notebook to see if a new rule had appeared, but it hadn't. The only new thing on the page was the following sentence. I warned you. I once again felt like something was watching me, and unfortunately I was right. When I looked in the side mirror of the truck, I could see it. It looked exactly how Dave described it. It was standing behind a tree, peeking at the truck. Taking a closer look, it had arms and legs like a human would, but the torso and the head of a deer. It was holding something in its left hand. When I realized what or who it was, I wanted to throw up. It was Dave. I guess all of this was too much for me and I passed out. I woke up in the morning with tears flowing down my face. The notebook was gone and so was Dave. Everything was right where it was the night before. The tent, the fishing rods, the stools, everything. I started looking for Dave. I was way too scared to scream his name because I thought that that thing might still be out here. The feeling of helplessness overwhelmed me. I went back in the truck and this time I managed to start it. Without a second thought, I floored it, leaving all the stuff that we brought here behind. As I was driving on the bumpy road, I saw that the tall bearded man was staring at me from the edge of the forest. I never looked back again and I drove straight home. People have asked me what happened to Dave. I was never able to tell them the real story because I was too scared of what would happen to me. Well, no more. This burden is too much to carry and that's why I'm sharing the story with all of you. I do not know what might happen to me, but I can't blame anyone for it. We had been warned. For lack of a better word, I have an imaginary friend. A common house fly that lives in my peripheral vision always. If I am looking at a blank white wall, the fly will stand perched in the upper right hand corner, just out of my reach. If I am looking at my phone, the fly will flit across the screen, always nearly avoiding the swipes of my finger. It's like having one of those eye floaters that re-enters your field of vision no matter where you look. My mental health has suffered. It's not lost on me that flies are associated with decay and disease. Sometimes I feel like a corpse. The fly is a circling vulture, waiting for my body to wither away so it can consume me. Sometimes I feel diseased. The fly, an embodiment of some malady, rotting away my insides. Something undiagnosed and killing me slowly. It has always been this way, for as long as I can remember. I remember waiting for the bus as a kid. We were sitting nervously on the bench, me and my neighborhood crush. We somehow stuttered our way into both saying we wanted to kiss each other. So hand in sweaty hand, we leaned in. At this moment, I realized I needed to aim. The moment I looked down at her lips, the fly crawled out of her mouth. I ran away. She didn't seem too interested in me after that. Of course, I've tried to kill it. I read a thread somewhere on the internet. You have to clap your hands above where the fly is. So that when it takes off, it flies into the impact. I've tried fly traps. One day I cracked and went to a reptile show. I remember feeling the pinch of the chameleon's feet on my skin as I marveled at its 360 degree eyes. It never once perceived the winged passenger I wanted it to catch. Nothing works. The fly has plagued me for years and years. I do an okay job at ignoring it when I can. It's a matter of basic survival. 
If I cared when a fly landed on my food, I'd starve. Sometimes I mistake my illusion for the real thing. I thought nothing of that fly that landed on Mike Pence's face during the 2020 vice presidential debate. Just my hyperactive imagination, once again. Until someone else in the room shouted, Do you see that fly? It stands perched on the bezel of my computer screen as I type now. If I were to reach for it, it would fly away at the last second. If I were to capture it, it would escape the moment I looked away. So I started therapy. And it didn't take long before I made a discovery. My therapist put me into a suggestive state. Some kind of light hypnosis. She asked me to remember everything I could about flies. From the depths of my subconscious, a repressed memory emerged. A classmate told me that you could put a fly on a string and it would zoom around like it was on a leash. So I caught a house fly under a glass. Slipped a piece of cardboard underneath it, then put the fly in the freezer. When I took it out, the fly was disabled. Only able to watch paralyzed as I mangled its tiny body with my clumsy child hands. My father caught me. He sat me down and explained how, even though this was a bug with no discernible emotions to the human eye, it still likely felt pain. It is not immoral to kill bugs, but it is immoral to torture. The measure of a man is how he treats those who can do nothing for him. My father's glasses flashed, reflecting my shame. It was the first time he'd looked at me in weeks. The fly then crawled out from my father's nose onto the peak of his upper lip. From that day on, I've been haunted by a damn bug. A bug that represents my father's shame in me. My shame in myself for not measuring up to a man when I was only a child. How is that fair? While the fly remains, other creatures I've killed have come and gone. I remember catching a fish as a teen and being taught how to kill and scale it myself. It gave me nightmares for weeks. The kind of nightmares where you wake up, but you are still in the dream. I threw off the covers to see a gourd fish, floundering bloody and hopeless, tangled in the sheets at my legs. Another time, my buddies and I spent a summer afternoon burning ants alive using a magnifying glass and the sun. Four weeks afterwards, when I spit out my toothpaste, little incinerated ant bodies emerged from the froth in the sink. I don't eat most meat for this reason. I've found that I don't look directly at veal, for example. It rises and falls like it's breathing. Believe me, therapy has helped. Therapy brought the genesis of my problems to light, but if identifying the problem is step one, and you don't know how to perform step two, you're kind of out of luck. I don't think my therapist really believes me anyway. So I drink. Or at least, that's what I've done since I was 13. Dad sure seemed to pay more attention to me once that started at least. And I drink. Is there such a thing as justifiable alcoholism? The fly seems to at least perch itself further away from me once I'm sufficiently blasted. It's been this way for a long time. All I remember is that I was driving to my father's house. I was going to do it. I was going to accuse him of not loving me. Show him what a barely raised child looks like. Tell him how badly messed up I was. I remember getting behind the wheel. All I feel now is sterile air. The smell of my own fear. The before the storm ache in my head that will multiply into a full-blown hangover. I open my eyes, squinting in the light. There's a tube sticking out of my arm. I'm in a hospital room. I've been drinking for a while. This isn't the first time I've woken up somewhere I don't remember going to sleep. I can't really move my neck. I ache and hurt all over. Feels like road rash underneath these bandages. I crashed? The nurse comes into the room. She's asking me questions and refusing to answer mine. She leaves without revealing anything. She left a breakfast tray. I opened the heat lid. 
What should have been breakfast was a plate of a thousand writhing maggots. I throw the tray across the room in disgust. It lands at the feet of a family. A husband and wife sitting with their two children between them. Why am I handcuffed to the bed? I demand answers from the family, but they don't reply. Their eyes are vacant and don't leave mine. I turn away, calling for the nurse through the closed door. The family slowly stands up, and like an eye floater, re-enters my field of vision once again. I'm writing this in hopes someone might be able to help before it's too late. It all started about a month ago when I was walking home from the bar I work at. It was late by then, and the small town I live in looked like a ghost town. It was honestly pretty creepy, and I quickened my step, thankful my house was only a few blocks away. I took out my phone and checked the time, 12.32 a.m., and that was when I saw him. I was in the process of putting my phone back in my pocket when I happened to glance across the street and noticed the man standing stock still under a street light. He looked to be about six, maybe seven feet tall, but it was hard to tell because he wore a very dirty, very old trench coat. For some reason, the sight of him standing there got to me and I sped walk the rest of the way home, constantly checking over my shoulder just in case he chose to follow me. I breathed a sigh of relief as I turned onto the pavement leading up to my door and made my way inside almost unconsciously locking the door behind me. I quickly shook off the creepy feelings from before and plopped down on the couch to eat dinner and relax before bed. The rest of the evening went by fast. I watched a few programs on the TV and decided it was probably time to head upstairs to get some sleep. I made my way up the stairs and to my room at the end of the hall making sure to turn off all the lights on the way there. Growing up, my dad had always screamed at me for leaving the lights on, saying I would cost him millions, and I guess the rule stuck with me to my adult years. I got to my room and shut the door behind me and began my nighttime routine to get ready for bed. After all that was finished, I slipped between the covers and closed my eyes, ready for the morning. All of a sudden, I jerked awake and checked the time. 5 a.m. Way too early to be up, but my body had needs. I quickly used the bathroom and drank some water and headed back to bed, repeating the chore of turning all the lights off. As I crossed my room, I heard a very loud noise outside and jumped. I ran to my window and looked outside, trying to see the source of the disturbance. I held my breath anxiously as I heard more sounds approaching from down the street getting closer by the moment. I let out a sigh of relief as a couple of drunken teenagers appeared from around the corner of the street and down the sidewalk, singing loud rap songs and swaying back and forth, more than likely on their way home from a party. They passed my house and continued on, still singing until they disappeared, engulfed by the early morning fog. I turned to go back to bed and froze in my tracks. My eyes fixed to the street below. There, standing maybe five houses away, was the same man from before, barely visible despite the street lamp he was standing under. Had he followed me home? The thought escaped my lips and I started at the sound of my own voice. Looking away for a few seconds to compose myself, I glanced at the street again but he had vanished. I look every direction, but I couldn't see him, so I gave up and returned to bed, giving in to sleep. Things after that were pretty normal. I went to work, came home, slept, and did the whole thing again. I hadn't seen the man since that night and pretty much forgotten about him until a week ago when I decided to have my friend Stacy stay the night. She was a nice girl I had met at work, and we had become fast friends, bonding over our love for horror movies. A horror movie, in fact, was the reason she was coming over that night. 
Some new slasher I hadn't heard of had recently come out and she wanted to watch it with me so we planned a sort of sleepover, complete with snacks. I had just finished setting out the various chips and popcorn I had when the doorbell rung and I went to open the door. There stood Stacy, a slightly troubled look on her face and I invited her inside, asking her what was the matter. She set down her coat and turned to me. Did you see the man who was behind me on the sidewalk? Her words made my blood run cold and I quickly walked over to the door and peered through the peephole. Once I was satisfied no one stood there, I turned back and we both headed into the living room, trying to lighten the mood by talking about the new movie. We sat down and she put it on and I quickly forgot about the events of earlier and became engrossed in the movie. It was actually pretty good. We watched the movie, talked and ate snacks till the credits came on, and it was time for bed. The couch pulled out into a small mattress, so that's where she slept and I headed up to my room, once again turning every light off on the way. I stopped for a moment beside my bedroom window, but saw nothing outside and got into my bed, quickly succumbing to sleep. Maybe about an hour later I woke up to a slam downstairs and ran down to see the front door hanging open, and Stacy slowly walking across the porch and down the steps. Hey Stacy, what's going on? I called, but no answer. It's as if she was in a trance. I went to go grab her and get her back in the house, but stopped dead in my tracks as I looked at who, or should I say what, she was walking towards. It was the man, except this time he looked impossibly tall. He wasn't wearing his trench coat. Instead, where the coat should have been was a long cut in the man's chest and stomach and through the gash was unfolding hundreds of arms, long and ghostly white, which reached to grab Stacy. I couldn't move as I watched her get snatched up and seemingly pulled into the man's torso, her body crunching and cracking as the arms stuffed her corpse inside. After that, he smiled at me and put his trench coat back on, raising a finger in a shushing motion and walked down the street. Finally, my legs started working again. I collapsed onto the carpet, trying to make sense of what I had seen. That thing had just shoved my coworker into its body. What if it would come back for me, unsatisfied with its meal tonight? I slammed the door and shakily made my way to the bathroom. After emptying the contents of my stomach, I wiped my mouth and sat down on the toilet, still in shock from what had happened. I went to my room and looked down upon the street below, looking for any sign I wasn't losing my mind. When no sign showed itself, I gave up and went to bed, or at least tried to. I woke the next morning with a massive headache and called into work sick. I popped a couple of Advil and sat down on the couch, rubbing my temples. All of a sudden, I heard a knock at the door and jumped slightly, the events of last night still playing in my mind. I hesitantly made my way to the front door and looked outside, but saw nothing. I opened the door and looked down to see a piece of paper laying on my welcome mat. I picked it up and turned it over to see two words that sealed my fate. You're next. I haven't been to work in two weeks and I refuse to leave the house. Even when friends keep calling me to hang out, I know if I go outside he will get me. There was one night recently I woke up to find myself downstairs with my hand on the front door ready to open it. I immediately pulled away and ran back upstairs. Since then I lock my bedroom door. I know he's coming for me and I don't know how long I have till he gets me. Please, if anyone can help me. Please. I don't want to die. After several failed attempts at guessing the password, I finally connected. It was hard to type this all out, but I need help, and this really seems like my only avenue. 
I was able to connect to a few other social media sites at first, but they all became blacklisted before I could send a message. I need someone to help me before they realize I've logged on and turn off the internet completely. I don't even know where to start. When I first moved into my apartment, I was so excited to finally get a place all to myself. I've never lived alone. I lived with my parents and then I went to the dorms at school, and then from roommate to roommate after that. That was the first time I would have a space that would be 100% my own. I could decorate however I wanted, and I could leave the kitchen a mess if I wanted. I was the only one who'd have to deal with the mess. The place itself wasn't too special. It was a studio, but I didn't care because it was all mine. It was an older building, and I noticed the first week I was here that it was quite drafty. The neighbors didn't bother me, though I could hear footsteps and doors slamming at all hours of the night. Lucky for me, I was not a light sleeper, so I only noticed when I was already staying up late. The hot water was short-lived in the shower, but I got into a groove within the first few days, and figured out just when to get out to avoid the sudden cold water that would hit after a few minutes. One of my favorite things about the new apartment was the wall of windows. My apartment building was built on a hill, so my unit was slightly underground, and the ground outside was level with the window sills. It made a perfect spot for people watching. For the first couple of weeks, I would wake up early, make some coffee, and sit watching the stream. Things felt really calm and safe there, and I really enjoyed watching people walk their dogs, or go for a family walk. Then construction started out front. I was super annoyed because the building manager never mentioned it when I was touring. They were doing extensive construction, too. They tore up the whole sidewalk and even the little flower beds that lined the building. Eventually, they erected a bunch of scaffolding over the entire front of the building and sidewalk. It was completely closed in and was covered in dozens of copies of the same poster. They all said, coming soon. There was nothing about what was coming soon, though. Eventually, I got curious enough to ask the building manager what the deal was with the construction. I mean, I had to go out the back of the building to get in, and out of my apartment every day. It was a real hassle, and there was nothing giving me an idea of how long the construction would be going for. I couldn't even see out the windows at all anymore because the closed-in scaffolding completely blocked them. I would open the blinds to see, coming soon, on the inside of the scaffolding. That struck me as odd because... Why would they advertise to just me and the other tenants who were the only ones who could possibly see these posters? So, like I said, I reached out to the building manager. She didn't answer any of my calls. I sent her an email asking her what they were constructing, and how long it would take. She replied within an hour, and said it was just some light construction and that it should be done by the end of the week. At this point, it had already been two weeks, which seemed a bit more than light construction, but I figured if it was almost done, then no big deal. Then Friday came. Friday morning, I woke up to find all my windows had been replaced entirely. Like, right out of the wall. How they did it without waking me, I will never know. But I'll be damned if instead of windows, I was suddenly seeing mirrors over the entire wall that faced the street. They went from floor to ceiling and had no blinds anymore. I was pissed. I rolled out of bed, grabbed some pants and a shirt, and went to my front door to go outside and check out what had been put in the front of the building. Unfortunately for me, there was no front door. The whole wall was just that. A wall. At this point, I was at a loss. I kept pacing back and forth from the bedroom to where my front door had been before. Nothing changed. I was still faced with a wall of mirrors and a solid wall. I couldn't leave my apartment, so I called my building manager several times and texted her. Nothing. No response at all. 
I went back and emailed her and told her I was now trapped, and she needed to come down and figure out how to let me out and fix this. She replied again within an hour, and said that was odd, and that she'd contact the construction company for me. She apologized that I was not happy with this situation. After an hour, I started to think, screw this, and figured if they were going to have to fix my wall of mirrors anyway, then I should be able to break my way out. So I started taking items in my apartment and slamming against the mirrors. I took a chair, a large pot, my own fists. Nothing I did worked. The mirror stood there as solid as it was before. I called the police. I called 911. I called several friends and even my boss at work because no matter how many calls I made, no one answered. The phone just rang and rang and rang. I emailed and texted and went on social media. No one replied. Not even so much as a read receipt. The only person I could get to reply was the building manager, but all she kept saying was, That's odd. And telling me she will follow up with the construction company. After several hours of panic, I heard shuffling from out in where I assume was still the hallway. A loud beep could be heard in my kitchen which shared that wall with the hallway. I walked in to see the fridge had been replaced. I hadn't even noticed. Had it been that way when I woke up, I couldn't remember. I opened the fridge to find it much more well stocked than I had left it. Did they give me food? I ate what I could and continued to think of ways out of this place. Nothing was really coming to me and I kept going back to old solutions. I called so many times and the results were always the same. Not one person replied. I tried new combinations of things to throw at the mirrors on the wall and they stayed just as intact as before. This went on for hours and hours and at one point between my 50th and 51st social media message that my feed wasn't updating. It had all the same posts that I had cycled through all morning. I checked the internet on my phone and realized that I had no cell service. But I was connected to Wi-Fi. I could not for the life of me figure out what was going on. But the only response I would get is the same can message from my building manager's office. This went on for hours and eventually I started taking naps to pass the time. At one point, I woke up from one nap, checked my phone, saw no change and rolled back over to go to sleep. It took several days before I realized I was no longer sure whether the time on the clock or my phone was AM or PM. Did my phone used to say AM or PM? I can't remember, but it didn't now. It's scary how quickly you lose track of time when you have no access to looking outside and can't leave. I can't say for sure how many days it had been. At this point, I guess based on how often the fridge would be restocked. Seemed that they refilled the fridge every three days or so. It was always the same foods. It had to be about six days or so. Because they refilled the fridge twice. When I woke up to a large box in the living room, how in the world had it gotten there? How did it get there without me hearing whoever dropped it off? I opened it at once and inside was a card. It stated, Enrichment Kit. There were a few model airplanes, an old favorite hobby of mine, a deck of cards, some craft supplies, three books, two fiction and one history, and a ukulele with a laminated practice chord sheet. I lost it. I started banging on the mirrors like no tomorrow. I screamed at the top of my lungs. I screamed until my throat was on fire with how sore it had become. It suddenly became very clear that someone was doing this on purpose. Look, the thought had crossed my mind at this point. Somewhere on the first day, actually. And every time the fridge was stocked all over again. Clearly I was here on purpose, but this box confirmed that I was not going to be getting out anytime soon. 
It was sometime on day 12 or 13 that something shifted. At this point, I'd been marking the days by scratching them into the wall next to the fridge. I'd gotten a steady routine down. I'd wake up, do some banging on the wall and or mirrors. Then I'd make some food. At this point, I'd take a break to read the history book again. Then I'd spend time trying to refresh my feeds on my phone to no avail. They still showed the same posts I'd seen days prior. Well, on day 12, or 13, still hard to say for sure, I decided to check my Wi-Fi connection again. It was the same as ever, connected to my home Wi-Fi hotspot. I hadn't had a chance to change its name from the generic string of numbers and letters. Instinctively, I clicked on my hotspot name. That's when, for the first time, I saw other Wi-Fi networks. I can't believe I hadn't thought to check this before. The list was short, though. There was only one option besides my own Wi-Fi to choose. I couldn't connect to it no matter how many times I clicked on it. At first, I thought the name was a joke. I'd read the name several times before really thinking about what it said. When I did finally realize, I lost it all over again. I bloodied my knuckles pounding on the mirrors. Then I kicked until my toenails cracked, and my feet were swollen and bloody. Wincing from the pain in my hands, I picked up my phone and looked once more at the Wi-Fi hotspot name. It said, Human Exhibit Guest Wi-Fi. As I mentioned earlier, it was at this point I was able to select the Wi-Fi hotspot, and it asked for a password. It took me so many tries, but I eventually guessed it right. It was Preserve at 1-O-N. I was able to navigate to a few social media sites, one of my friends had just posted a link to a website asking if anyone else had seen this, and had anyone heard from me in the last few weeks. I'd never heard of that site before this moment. When I clicked on it, I saw my own apartment on livestream. I watched as I stood and walked around in my apartment, and the me and the livestream moved at the same time. I started typing a message asking for help before the connection broke and the web browser said that the site was blocked. I tried several other sites, and all had the same results. As soon as I tried typing a message to someone, the connection broke. So I typed out this message in my notes so I could post it quickly on this site, which is the last one I'm still able to get to on this Wi-Fi. Someone please help me. I don't know who made some exhibit out of my home, but it's not right. I need to be let out. If you are out there, please reply. Don't leave me locked in here like this. Can anyone help? Once, and only once, when I was 9 or 10, I spent the summer at my Uncle Pete's farm in the Appalachians. I knew Uncle Pete from our various encounters at birthdays, Christmases, and Thanksgivings, but I had never visited his farm, and I had never spent much time with the strange, silent old man. Despite this, my parents decided that it would be character building for me to help him out for the summer. They were probably motivated by the prospect of a few child-free months. Neither me nor my uncle were particularly happy about the arrangement. The farm lay on a sloping foothill, nestled in a wide open patch of field, surrounded by deep, dense forest. These are the kinds of woodland which are always wet, always damp and mossy and dewy to the touch. The property was pretty small, aside from the crooked old farmhouse. There was a cow shed, three pastures for the cattle, and a large cornfield which spanned the breadth of the forest edge. I became used to waking up early, helping to herd the cows to graze, assisting Uncle Pete in milking. The work was hard. 
I became perpetually sore and covered in small nicks and bruises as I came at odds with the elements. But I enjoyed the hardship. I enjoyed the rugged landscape and the fresh air and the feeling of a job well done. Sometimes, Pete and I would go on long walks through the woods. Out there, when you are properly and completely isolated, time moves slower. It is only in a forest that you can truly view the cycle of life and rebirth, as mud and rot and weeds sprout new shoots and spores. Even death is not the end in a forest. Dead things still swell and writhe and multiply, constantly rejoining the great, intertwining web of the living, breathing wilderness. My uncle and I hardly ever spoke, but we both connected in mutual appreciation for the natural beauty around us. I remember Uncle Pete like that. Always quiet. He was a man who never wasted energy on speaking except when absolutely necessary. He would never use words when a grunt or a nod or a vague motion could suffice. He was getting on in age, but he was incredibly tough. Like an old sheepdog, grizzled and hardy. I couldn't imagine anything ever disturbing him or knocking him from his calm, solemn stillness. One night, Pete and I were walking back up from the bottom of the southernmost field. A cow had just given birth. I can still remember kneeling in the mud and feeling the bloody, warm mass of the calf in my hands. It was later than usual, already. The total and enveloping darkness of the mountains had settled in. We were guided by the lights of the farmhouse and the bright full moon. It was as we reached the porch, and I turned to glance at that same moon that I saw it. A long way off, right at the end of the cornfield was a black silhouette. Against the pure white backdrop of the moon, it stood at the edge of the tree line. Although I could still make out no features, only its shape. I recognized four legs and a broad, powerful set of antlers. I gasped softly, my young self reveling in the complete stillness and size of the creature. I turned excitedly to Pete. Look, Uncle Pete, is that a deer? Even for a stag, that's pretty big, right? Uncle Pete wheeled very slowly to squint at where I was pointing. There was a long pause as he breathed in and out, still staring. The three of us. He and I, and the black shape. We were motionless together for a moment. Then he replied softly, almost under his breath. Ain't no deer. He turned around again and entered the house without looking back. I didn't even have time to question what he had said. Although I was confused, Uncle Peter was rarely the kind of man to explain himself and I accepted that he knew these hills and everything in them like the back of his hand. I shrugged it off and I followed him into the house, but I couldn't tear my eyes away from the dark silhouette, so boldly outlined against the moon, still standing so perfectly still. Briefly, it was removed from the line of sight, and when I had reached the kitchen window, it was gone, disappeared back into the trees. From my bed, I could see across the landing directly into Uncle Pete's room. That night, I awoke at some point late into the night. As my eyes flitted open, I saw Pete. He was sitting in his old rocking chair beside the window of his bedroom. In his hands, he held a large, high-powered flashlight. He had the flashlight beam pointed out of the open window, trained at the tree line. Again, I was confused, but... I was also tired. My eyes closed again and I slept. I thought little of it in the morning. It was only now, so many years later, that I tried to put all the memories together. The next week, Uncle Pete had to make the long drive to the nearest town for his monthly supply run, buying canned food, replacement tools, fuel for his jeep. 
Uncle Pete, unwilling to take me with him, was not fazed by the prospect of leaving a 9 or 10 year old on their own in an isolated farmhouse. It was a day and a night's journey to town. Pete would be back in the morning and I would spend the night alone. On the night in question, I had already spent two nights on my own like that. In previous months on the farm, I went about my usual routine, making a sandwich for myself and then turning on the television. It would have been about 10 or 11 at night. I liked to go to bed late when I was on my own. I was glued to the TV screen. I remember there was a light rain and the house was buffeted by low level but persistent wind. Gradually, above the noise of the television, I began to hear something from outside. I cocked my ear to listen properly, and I muted whatever program I was watching. I wasn't worried... yet. You hear all sorts of sounds out in the country at night. I went over to the back door and stepped outside. Immediately I was hit by a really weird feeling. I can't explain it or even really describe it, but as I stood there, rain trickling down my face, I felt inexplicably certain that something was deeply and terribly wrong. Now I could make out that the sounds were coming from the cow shed, several hundred yards away from the farmhouse. The cows were making a lot of noise. I could hear them mooing and snorting and kicking the corrugated iron walls of the shed. At hearing the commotion from the animals, I began to grow nervous about the possibility of a coyote or even a black bear nearby. I scanned the almost impenetrable darkness of the fields. Then, all at once, the noise stopped. It was as if every cow had silenced at the exact same instant. Now it was just me, standing alone in the silent night, and then, out of the darkness, a voice began to call my name. Michael. The voice was deep and slow, and cracked on each syllable of my name, a shuddering rasp. It mixed with the wind and became almost a echoing howl. I stepped back inside and locked the back door. Then I closed all the windows and I turned off all the lights in the house. I sat down on the couch in front of the television, catatonic with fear, tears streaming down my face. Once, twice, three times that ghastly voice circled the house, still calling out my name. Michael. I sat, nails digging into the flesh of my thighs, shaking uncontrollably. For what must have been 15 minutes, there was a deathly silence. I began to wonder if perhaps I had imagined that awful voice. Then from behind me, I heard a faint, almost indiscernible sound. It was a dull impact against the large kitchen window, the one which looked out over the vast cornfield. Clunk, clunk, clunk. It didn't sound deliberate. It wasn't a noise meant to toy with me or make me turn around. It was an unintentional sound, the kind produced when something large attempts to go unnoticed. It sounded like antlers scraping against glass. There was another agonizing pause and then the voice again. It's so cold out here, Michael. Won't you let me in? Now that the voice was so close, just outside, I could hear how wrong its cadence was. It was utterly alien. It sounded as if the speaker knew what sounds to make, but had no grasp of the words or their meaning, could not produce anything except the correct vocal contractions in the right order. Still violently shaking but compelled by something deep and unnatural within me, I turned my head to face the window. Where the pale moon should have been, there was nothing. A black silhouette was blocking the window with its form. I was sitting in the dark, but I strained my eyes to differentiate the shape of the figure from the night sky behind it. I could hardly make out anything. 
I think that it was squatting on all fours, or maybe resting on its haunches. Only the outline of a wide, misshapen set of antlers was unmistakable. The pitiful blue glare of the television gave me just enough light to see the thing's face. Its wet snout was pressed against the glass of the window. The dim glow allowed me to make out that its skin and hair was stretched out far too tight over its skull. I remember feeling that the shaking was getting worse. I remember black spots dancing across my eyes. I remember nausea and the feeling of falling. I woke up splayed in the middle of the living room floor. I got up, rubbed my head in time to see Uncle Pete's jeep appear from the trees and pull up the farmhouse. I never told Uncle Pete about that night, about the things I heard and saw, partly because I was sure I wouldn't be believed, and partly because I was still deciding if I dared to believe it myself. Christ, I was just a ten-year-old kid. I only had a few days left to spend at the farm. I stuck by Pete's side at all times, and I didn't look out of any of the windows after dark. Thankfully, we didn't go on any walks through the woods. As I grew older, I tried a mixture of repression and denial about my memories of the farm. I never visited again. I think I managed to achieve some semblance of forgetting, however unhealthy or damaging it was to bury my fears. At last, I reached a point where all I would feel was a shiver up my spine and a vague sense of unease whenever I glanced up at a full moon, or walked through dense trees in the twilight. That was until a few years ago, when it all came flooding back. Uncle Pete is gone. Some of the people who knew him in town noticed when he failed to arrive for his monthly supply run. When he missed the next one too, they sent someone down to see if the old man was alright, and he was just gone. His jeep was still in the driveway. There were no signs of a struggle. The house looked untouched, although the front door was wide open. There were no footprints anywhere around the house or the surrounding fields. Everyone accepted that he must have had a dizzy spell or a fall when walking through the woods. They combed the mountains and forests for miles, but they never found a body. The only clue they ever found, the only thing at all that was out of place or wrong, was a set of cloven hoof prints, imprinted in the mud, leading up to the farmhouse, and then away again. Everyone dismissed these tracks. I'm the only one who can't stop thinking about why they were found in sets of two, not four. I'm the only one who can't stop thinking about what it was that came up to the house on its hind legs and carried Uncle Pete away. Far off. Deep into the hills and the trees. And the dark. So I've been home alone for the past few days. Grandparents out of town, dog with a sitter because of my long hours. This is usually fine, but lately something has been... different. Yesterday when I got home from work, the back door was unlocked. I could have sworn I locked it when I left, but it's a sliding glass door, so I brushed it off as me not flipping the lock latch far enough. I forgot about it and went on with my night. I smoked a bowl or two, made some dinner. At this point it was dark, probably close to 2 a.m. The only lights were the ones I had turned on, which weren't many, as I was in the process of shutting everything down for the night. I was brushing my teeth for the night when I saw it. Out of the corner of my eye, a shadow. It moved across my periphery so fast I almost didn't see it. I brushed it off as my hair moving in the breeze of the AC or something. I have anxiety, so it's not unusual for me to get freaked out over nothing like that. Assuming it was just that, I kept getting ready for bed. But then I saw it again. It ran down the hall in front of my door, gliding like a black shadow rather than a person. 
A trick of the eyes, it must be. But the door to my grandma's office creaked open. My heart froze. Anxiety going full force adrenaline coursing through me, I mustered all my courage and went to check out the office. I slowly pushed open the door, shining my phone's flashlight around until I was comfortably sure the room was empty. I don't know why I didn't just turn on the light and go in, but it was as if something was telling me not to. So I simply closed the door and left, trying to tell myself it was all just my imagination, that I had left that door open a tad earlier. I would go to the bathroom one last time, go to bed, and everything would be normal in the morning. At night before bed, I like to pee in the dark. It's a weird habit I've developed over the years to try to help make sleep come easier. My bedroom is right next door with a lamp on. It's bright enough to see by from the bathroom. As I was washing my hands, the light flickered. Instinctively, I turned to look. I wish I hadn't. There was nothing in the hallway, but when I turned back, something was different. My blood felt like ice in my veins as I tried frantically to both find the difference and stay calm enough to sleep. And that's when I noticed. My reflection in the mirror. It was staring at me. No, not just at me. Into me. I was sure my face must be frozen in horror, but the reflection didn't look scared at all. It looked like... it was smirking. It looked like me, but something was off. Her hair was too tangled, eyes too dark and sunken, her cheeks too gaunt and bones poking through the skin in a way I was sure mine hadn't in years. I didn't know what to do. I bolted to my bedroom and pulled the covers over my head like it would protect me from it. Like it could protect me from it. I'm sitting here typing this now. It's set to auto-upload tomorrow. I don't know if I did the right thing. Something in me is telling me I shouldn't have stopped looking at her. That I should have left the bathroom light on. That I should have never looked in that mirror after dark. I see the shadows more clearly now. I don't know how I could have ever confused them for humans. They're waiting on me to come out. On me to turn the light off and fall asleep. It's her fault, I know it is. I'm praying that this was just my anxiety, and if it's not, that she's still stuck in that mirror. I work in a seasonal Halloween store. You probably know the one I'm talking about. We typically pop up in the plazas or mall fronts that are run down in your small town. We show up for about two months and then are gone. It's not a bad job. I'm able to work around my school schedule and as a Halloween fanatic, it's pretty neat. I've done this enough where I've been able to become the key holder slash shift lead. We get all kinds of customers. Small kids looking for costumes, adults looking for party decorations, Dad's going all out to make their houses the spookiest spot on the block, etc. I've done this a couple of seasons now. I was never surprised until lately. It started as a normal day. I was fronting all of the decorations and putting back the costumes that people haphazardly put in the wrong place. I was scarfing down a frozen burrito down on my lunch break when I saw him come in. This dude... He had to have been about six foot six. He was wearing an orange jumpsuit and had on a mask. This mask was very elaborate. It was pale gray slash blue. The eyes were hollow and blacked out. So, mesh hiding his eyes. The lips were stitched. So this isn't out of the ordinary. People do this very often. They dress up come in a shop and try to get a reaction out of some kids or record TikToks. Get a load of this guy, I told Penelope. It was just me and her closing the store. We had one of those relationships where we weren't a couple, but everyone wondered why, and I think we wondered why too. 
Yeah, that guy sure is scary. His mask is a winner. I've never seen it online or in any other store. The man casually browsed some of our decorations and I let him be. He came for attention. I wasn't going to validate him. Not until he walked through some of our displays where we have the animatronics, a vibrating floor, and a fog machine. It's really just a fun walkthrough for kids to get a quick spook in. Well, a small boy was walking through already nervous, and this man jumped into the path and let out a mighty laugh. The boy screamed and ran to his mother, leaving behind a puddle that I'd have to clean. I went to confront the man and ask him to leave, but before I could, the child's mother came up to me and gave me an earful. I apologized even though I had done nothing wrong, gave the kid a costume, and sent them out. Suddenly the man was gone. I walked back to the register and put on some campy horror movie that sits at the TV by the register. I started talking to Penelope about classes I was taking, and was going to invite her on a date. Two ladies walked in that I happened to recognize from around college. They went to the sexy costume aisles and grabbed about three or four costumes apiece. Penelope guided them to the private changing rooms that we keep available. She came back and had a smirk on her face. Sexy cats, playboy bunnies, nurses, and poison ivy. How original. We both let out a chuckle and I had built the courage. Hey, when we get out of here, do you want to catch one of those midnight showings at the drive-in? I can swing by the house and grab some snacks and set the truck up for optimal viewing. She bit her lip and looked at the ground, then at me. She bust out laughing and punched me in the shoulder. Hell yeah, I'll go on a date with you. She said, I felt on top of the world. She went to help a horror dad look at the yard decorations while I was having my celebration internally. I went to put in a new CD in the store PA when we heard a woman screaming. Penelope and I took off as fast as we could towards the changing rooms. The tall masked man had ripped open one of the changing room doors and threw a gallon of fake blood all over one of those girls while she was changing costumes. Penelope quickly grabbed one of the ponchos we sell and covered the crying girl. Her friend heard the commotion and came out of her stall, helping Penelope lead the girl to the staff bathroom to get the fake blood out of her eyes and attempt to clean her up. I was livid. I quickly raced to the man and yelled, Hey pervert, I don't know what game this is, but you have to leave now. Another customer chirped in. Hey, step away from him. The police are on the way. The man turned and stormed out of the entrance doors. Some minutes later, local PD came out. I talked with them while Penelope gathered the woman's street clothes. I told the officers all I knew, and I pulled up what security camera footage I could. But all of it really was useless. I mean, the dude was in a costume. I have no true description of him other than him being tall. We did see that he pulled off in an old Ford Festiva, but we couldn't make out the plates. He had parked far away enough that the footage was grainy. The officers spoke with the two women and went on their way. I gathered up the mob to clean the mess that the man had made. Closing time came around and Penelope told me she was heading out. It was my job to do closing operations, such as security codes and counting the tills at the end. So I told her I'd be leaving in an hour, and would swing by the house to get the truck ready and pick her up. She gave me a small kiss on the cheek and left. I quickly went to the office and counted the money, and locked the office on my way out. Heading to the front door, I noticed another spill. Great. More punk kids and fake blood. Back near the changing rooms again. I figured some kid made off to play while some parent wasn't paying attention. I opened the curtain and my stomach dropped. Penelope lay there in a pool of blood, mouth bubbling and tears falling from her face. She managed to look past me before she grew silent. I quickly called EMT and told them that there was a murder. First responders would be on the way, but it would take them at least 10 minutes. I felt two hands on my shoulder, and then I was flung into a display of pitchforks and sling blades. Looking up, 
my eyes met him, the man with the mask. He sat on me and put his hands around my throat. I could see his tongue licking the stitches while I was reaching for anything I could find. There was nothing in my reach and I put my hands on his face. The mask felt like real skin. I managed to put my thumbs closer to his eyes and in a moment of pure instinct, I jammed my thumbs into his eyes. The mesh broke and I was able to get a pretty good hit there. However, it only lasted a second, but it was enough to clear my airway and swipe his ankle on my way out from under him. I took off to the front door to escape only to find it locked. I banged on the door until my hand bled. I ran into one of our walkthroughs, hoping I could wait it out until maybe the cops could bust the door. I curled into a corner and held my breath. Minutes later, I could hear the man whistling and laughing as he checked in containers. He made his way into the encampment I had burrowed into and triggered some lights and fog. Doing so set off an animatronic witch. She began to rock back and forth and it exposed me. He saw me and pulled out his knife. He put his hands on me and I managed to knock the witch over as he pulled me out. She fell against him. She wasn't heavy, but it was just enough resistance I could run. At this point, I saw the blue lights and police working on opening the door. They barely had it cracked and I bust out crying. They stormed in the area, but couldn't find the killer. EMT examined me and I was stable enough to go home. They checked in on Penelope, but it was too late. She had been gone the moment I was with her. Be safe this season and... Watch out for people in costumes. Before my divorce, I thought being home alone was so relaxing, so freeing. A moment in which I didn't need to worry about anyone but me, and if I laid on the couch the whole time and left the dirty dishes in the sink till later, there was no one to criticize me. After my divorce, when the kids were at their dad's, it just felt lonely. Not all the time. Sometimes it really was nice to just eat chips and do nothing, or take an hour-long bath with a bath bomb and a good book. But today, I was feeling lonely. I needed friends. Part of my bedtime routine is to go around the house and pick up any last dishes and trash as I turn the lights off. The dogs normally walk with me, but tonight they were in the backyard and hadn't been quite ready to come in. As I reached my son's bedroom and reached for the light switch, I frowned. I had thought I had already turned this one off. Maybe I was more tired than I thought. I flicked the switch, picked up a plate off of his bed, and moved on. After I convinced the dogs to come in, I made my way to my own bedroom. My son's light was on. I had turned that off, didn't I? My husky, Chloe, stood next to me this time, ears back flat. A low growl sounded from her throat. I quietly made my way to my bedroom and grabbed my phone and my gun. 911 keyed in, ready to hit the call button. Chloe and I walked through the room, joined by my lab, Max. I checked under the bed as they sniffed corners. We checked the closet together. Nothing. No one. I checked the windows. Still locked. Chloe relaxed as we walked back out of the room. I flicked off the light. I walked through the rest of the house with both dogs by my side. It's a small enough house. Three bedrooms, but barely. No basement. No attic. My skin prickled with goosebumps. I made sure the doors and the windows were all locked. Maybe I was losing my mind. Maybe there was an electrical issue. I would call the electrician if it happened again. I brought the dogs into my bedroom and shut and locked the door. Phone plugged in nearby. Gun went in the bedside table drawer. Normally I kept it locked tight in a safe. I swear I'm a responsible gun owner. But the light thing had me on edge, and the kids weren't there. I'd felt both relief and loneliness at being home alone before. Some anger at my ex for putting me in this position. Fear was new. 
I didn't like it much. As I lay in bed, I reassured myself that it was just me being silly. The doors and windows were all still locked, and I had two dogs who barked if anyone so much as walked past the house. If someone was here, I would know. I needed more sleep. That's why I must have forgotten to turn off the light twice. I fell asleep with my face to the door. I woke up to my dogs barking. It took one groggy second to realize that my bedroom door was open. It was still dark through the windows, but light streamed through the open door. I had 911 dialed before I'd formed my next full thought, and I fumbled in my drawer for my gun. My heart stopped as I emerged from my bedroom to find every light in the house on. I was sobbing on my neighbor's porch when the police car pulled up minutes later. My dogs barked from behind her front door as she did her best to comfort me with a blanket and a cup of tea. They searched the house but didn't find anyone. As kindly as they could, they asked if I was on any medications or if I'd been drinking. I wasn't, and a glass of wine didn't make me sleepwalk around my house and turn the lights on. They cleared me to go back in, but my neighbor offered to let me sleep in her spare room if I wanted, and I took her up on it. When I went back the next morning, it was with a heart that beat too quickly, and with dogs who could sense my nerves. We re-inspected every part of the house, but everything seemed fine. The lights were still on, probably left that way by the police though. It was fine. I checked every inch of that house, made sure all of the doors and windows were locked, and sat on the couch trying to decide what to do next. I got a locksmith. It was more expensive than I would have liked, especially asking them to get there that day, but rekeying all of the doors seemed like a good idea given that someone had entered my house and my locked bedroom door. I shivered thinking about it. I had one more night alone in the house, till next weekend. I wasn't sure if I felt worse about being alone or the possibility of someone trying this when my kids were here. I decided it was better that I was alone for it. I couldn't imagine the added terror of someone breaking in with my kids. When bedtime came, I was methodical, room by room, starting from the furthest point, turning off all of the lights. I made it to my room and glanced back down the hall. The kitchen light was on. I had started in the kitchen. Gun gripped by my hand, I took a step back down the hall. The light flipped off. I screamed and locked myself in my bedroom as I called the police. I spent the night at my neighbor's again. I called my ex-husband and explained the situation. I asked if the kids could stay with him while I figured out what was happening and he agreed. In the morning, I called an alarm company, another expense I didn't need. They put sensors on each window and helped me install cameras at the front and back door. If someone triggered an alarm and I didn't punch in the code, they would send someone out. At least if whoever was messing with me tried something, they would be caught. That night, no lights were turned on as I made my way to bed. I barely slept, waking up from a dream of someone standing over me several times. I walked out of my bedroom and the lights were on. I called the police who checked the house for the third time in as many days and told me they couldn't find anyone. The sensors hadn't been triggered and there was no one on the cameras when I watched them. Was I doing this? Maybe I was sleepwalking. Stress could make you do that, couldn't it? That night, triple checked everything. The dog slept in my room with the door locked. I awoke to the sound of glass shattering. My bedroom door was open. Dogs nowhere in sight. Light flooded through the door. I ran to the kitchen and stopped just short of stepping in. The floor was covered in glass. My cabinets were all open. Every single glass, plate, and bowl were on my floor in pieces. I was on the phone with the dispatcher as I looked around frantically for my dogs. I heard Chloe bark and peered out the window into the dark. They were outside. After the police showed up, 
For the fourth night in a row, I cried myself back to sleep in my neighbor's spare bedroom. In the morning, she helped me clean up the glass, and we sat down and watched the security footage together. I wasn't sure how whoever was doing this had gotten in now that I had changed the locks and secured the windows. But surely they couldn't avoid being on camera as they lured my dogs out of the house. And yet, there was no one. We went through the footage for both the front and back door. No one comes anywhere near my front door. We slowed down frame by frame when we got to the point that the dogs went outside. The back door opens. My lights are already on. Chloe appears in the doorway, head cocked. Her ears are up, as if she's paying attention to something, but she doesn't appear nervous or frightened. Max walks up next to her, and appears to jump as if he were greeting someone. Then both dogs run outside. After a minute, the back door closes again. I need to move. I need to move now. I can't live here anymore. My neighbor helped me pack. It was a haphazard rush job. I stayed with her the next few nights and only packed during the day. Each morning when I came in, all of my lights were on. Boxes would be overturned. I got a nice apartment, similar living space size, really even if there's no backyard. I started moving boxes in at the end of every day. I was relieved when everything was moved in. I've been in my new apartment for a week. And today when I awoke, all of my lights were on. A while ago, I was looking for a new game to play. I was a bit bored of the new Battlefield and Call of Duty. I like almost all types of games, from shooter games to puzzle games to horror games. I was looking on the internet for new game releases or other fun games to play when I stumbled on a game called Obscure. I went to their site and saw that their new game just released. The game was based on Silent Hill, Layers of Fear, and those type of games. Me still being salty that Silent Hill PT was cancelled, I thought I'd give it a go. The game was from a small developer, and it was only $15, so why not? The game was about a man who got into a car crash and somehow entered a separate, gritty reality. In the opening cutscene, he was driving home from a long day of work when he got a text from his wife telling him to stay safe on the road. When he looked back onto the road, a deer jumped in front of his car which caused him to swerve off the road and crash into a ditch. Anyhow, I played the game for like an hour or so. Eventually I had to go into a building, but every single time I went through a certain door, the game would freeze and it would crash. I tried it a couple times, but it was always the same door that made my game crash. I went back to the game's website and looked through the forums, and I noticed other people had the same problem. I also noticed multiple people saying they experienced nightmares from the game and trouble sleeping. I thought, it can't be that scary. So I just jokingly brushed it off. Then I saw a comment about someone taking his own life because he couldn't take the nightmare anymore. I thought it was some kind of sick marketing stunt, so I once again didn't think anything of it. Eventually I found a fix. Someone said to put the game into windowed mode enter the door, and then put it back into full screen or whatever. That worked for me. I played for another 30-ish minutes. Eventually a jump scare happened with a face appearing in the mirror behind the character, which really scared me. I then decided it was enough for that night because it was getting late. That evening is when the trouble already started. I indeed had some trouble sleeping. I never had any trouble sleeping, so it was kind of strange to me. I kept waking up in the middle of the night, like every hour or so. This went on for a couple nights, but it kept getting worse and worse. I started to have very realistic nightmares. Those kind of nightmares where you'd wake up the next morning and would be relieved it was just a dream. 
My nightmares all revolved around me being in a bad situation. In one dream I got kidnapped. In one dream I got glass stuck in my wrist. And in another dream I also got sent to a separate reality, and so on. Every morning I'd be relieved it was just a dream again. My girlfriend, who always sleeps next to me, jokingly said, whispering obscure in my ear in the middle of the night, really isn't going to turn me on. This really frightened me because I never told her about the game, but also, I was apparently whispering the game's name in my sleep as well. That same night, me and my girlfriend were watching a show. She paused so she could get a snack, and I could go brush my teeth. When I was in the bathroom getting ready to brush my teeth, I looked at my own face in the mirror and I just zoned out. I felt like I was being watched. But I was just too deep into my own thoughts to move. After what felt like two minutes, my girlfriend came in to ask if I was okay. She said I was gone for like an hour. She thought I decided to go to bed, and she didn't want to wake me up, hence her not coming up to check on me sooner. I told her I was fine, and I decided to go to bed that night, and once again, I had a very realistic nightmare. I remembered the comments on that thread, but I still didn't believe it. It just couldn't be. I decided to delete the game from my PC, which I haven't played since the first time after that one mirror jump scare because I didn't have time. When I tried to delete the game, it said the game wasn't on my PC anymore, even though I saw it sitting in my files right there. No matter what I did, I got a message along the lines of, couldn't find obscure.xe, or can't find obscure.xe, u-n-i-n-s. I did launch the game, and it launched just fine. Eventually, I decided to factory reset my PC, and thankfully the game was gone. After that, I was slowly able to sleep normally again, but I still had so many questions. Did all those people really have those nightmares just because of this game? Was there something evil attached to this game, and was it trying to make its way into my life? I tried to go back to the game's website, but I couldn't find it anywhere anymore. I really don't believe in any paranormal stuff, so I still brush it off as one huge coincidence. But it's still not sitting right with me. But one thing I know for sure is that if I ever stumble upon that game again, I'm staying away from it. My wife, Sa Woon, and I knew the house was haunted when we moved in. The previous owner was upfront about it. It was part of the reason the place was so cheap. Well, officially it was because his dog and daughter had died here horribly. Just give them what they want and you'll be okay. He asked the realtor to tell us. She handed us the keys and smiled, shaking her head. Don't worry about all of that, though. His psychosis is your gain. This place was a steal. It's not like the ghosts can just come out and tell you what they want, but they definitely have their ways of communicating. Like the first night we got here, I left a moving box full of plates on top of one of the dining room chairs. We woke up in the middle of the night to hear it crashing down. The plates all shattered into a million pieces and scattered all over the floor. And that's how we learned their first rule. Lesson 1. Always leave the chairs empty for the ghosts. Other rules would follow. We learned not to leave anything on the floor of the pantry after the ghosts wrote a nasty message in Cheerios all over the floor. We learned not to run the dryer at night after two fires. We weren't sure if the first one was from the ghosts, or just a lint buildup. Sawoon and I tried to make these little acts of revenge in stride, cleaning up the Cheerios, curse words, with a smile, and joking with each other about our picky house guests. For a while, it seemed like things would be just fine. We listed out the rules on a small whiteboard affixed to the refrigerator so that we could continue to cohabitate. 
Lesson 5. No bananas in the house. Lesson 6. The car should always be parked in the driveway, never the garage. Lesson 7. No house plants. Maybe just no ferns. Worth investigating more. Lesson 8. Downstairs shades must be drawn down at night at all times. No exceptions. It became a bit of a game between us, each of us trying to remember all the rules better than the other. But then one night, Sawoon tried to get a glass of water downstairs after midnight. Don't do it, I said. They won't like it. I'm thirsty, she said. They can live with it. She went downstairs and I heard a scream. I ran downstairs to find her grabbing her foot in agony. She said she'd tried to get ice and then heard a loud snap. She looked down to see her big toe bent away from her foot at an impossible angle. Okay, I said. No ice after midnight? No ice at all? I took out a whiteboard marker. What do we write? I can't live here anymore. She said, we have to go. We'll never be able to afford another place like this. I told her, especially now that interest rates are up. It's just ice, right? But she shook her head. I drove her to the ER in silence. The next morning, Sawoon tried packing her things. Don't do this, I said. Why did we leave our previous apartment? She asked, looking at me with cold, angry eyes. Huh? Why did we leave? Because it was too small. I lied. There had been a group of teens who lingered outside of the front of our building. The types who sat on cars and rolled packs of cigarettes into the sleeves of their t-shirts. Every day when Sawoon entered the building, they hurled insults at her, mocking her weight, sometimes her race asking to see her naked. I had called the police several times to report them, but it never went anywhere. In time, we decided to move to the suburbs. You never stood up for me, she said after a bit. You should have fought those boys. You should have rattled a baseball bat or a crowbar at them. That's illegal. Before that, it was your mother's house. Almost a full year sleeping in separate rooms. Her house, her rules, I said. And whose house is this? She asked, zipping her suitcase shut. She drove off to her mother's house. The next morning, I woke up and went to the store. I bought bananas and a house plant. I bought a shirt in a dark red color I knew the ghosts would hate. Finally, I texted Sawoon and told her I'd be a man she could be proud of. She didn't respond. Last of all, I took a single glass of water and placed it on a chair. Then I stood there as minutes passed, almost an hour. I stared into the emptiness of the dining room. Then, all of a sudden, the glass flew across the room and shattered on the wall. I stood in place, trying not to blink. Then one of the shards rose from the floor and moved slowly towards me. The shard pierced my ankle drawing a line straight up my leg, working its way under my underwear and up my thigh. I tried not to flinch as blood pooled in a small puddle at my feet. This is my house, I said softly. Mine. The glass rose right up to my eye, and in that moment, I realized that the ghosts had died to make this their house. Was I willing to do the same? I blinked. I'm sorry, I said. I'm sorry. And then I got a broom to clean up the mess. Since then, I've been doing my best to keep playing by the rules. Lesson 15, don't make any noise when descending the stairs. Lesson 16, no hats inside. Lesson 17, do not enter the closet beneath the stairs, ever. And the final lesson had been hardest to swallow. At night, I must leave Sawoon's side of the bed empty. Must not even stretch a leg onto it. 
As I close my eyes, I feel something cold and damp settle onto her side. It will not let me look at it. My heart beats fast and my blood runs cold, but no matter how much I want to scream and sprint out of the house, I remind myself that if I just play by the rules, everything will be okay. I was visiting my parents for the day as it was my dad's birthday. It was a six hour drive, but I didn't mind it, as I hadn't seen them in a few months. I showed up and the house was filled with childhood friends that were basically forced on me due to the fact that their parents were good friends with mine. They were all pretty chill anyways, apart from the fact that they all made fun of me in high school and even snapped my glasses one time. However, those days were in the past. I got over it and started to work on myself. I could never help the eyesight though. I stepped foot in the house and was greeted like I had been gone for years. I felt kind of bad though as it was my dad's birthday and it made me feel like I was stealing the attention from him. He was just probably going to drink with his friends like always, so I'm sure he didn't mind too much. My mom gathered everyone into the lounge and my sister and I cringed as she pulled out the dusty picture books from the back of the shelf. She was going to embarrass the whole family. While everyone was laughing at the pictures of me as a fat baby, I noticed a man in the background. He wasn't anyone I knew and realistically, I just thought he was in the wrong place at the wrong moment. Like an accidental photobomb. However, something felt off about it, as if some negative aura resonated off the picture. I just forgot about it because what are the chances he was on the next picture of me? He was. But this time he wasn't looking into the distance like some random bystander. He was looking directly at the camera. His eyes somehow focused on mine, as if he knew where I would be in this exact moment. This picture was taken 12 years ago, so it must have been some funny coincidence. This spooked me a little and sent a chill traveling down my spine, but again, I thought nothing of it. I went to my old room to hide from embarrassment as my mom had pulled out the pictures from when I was in high school, which were the worst years of my life, made evident by the picture that made me want to rub chilies into my eyes so I never had the opportunity to see them again. I also started to think about the man in the photos, wondering about the chances of him being in the two solo pictures of myself, and his eyes being directly positioned to stare at mine when the picture was taken years ago. I never liked selfies. My high school self made me insanely insecure, but just to check I took a selfie to see if this was just some bizarre coincidence. I opened the picture. My body froze as, in the distance, through my bedroom window, I could see him crossing the street. I ran downstairs frantically and snatched the book out of my mom's hands. Everyone looked at me in shock as sweat dripped onto the page and my hands scrambled to look for my high school pictures. There he was again, and again, and again. My heart beat out of my chest as I put my back up to the wall to take another picture of myself, thinking how could he possibly be in this one if there's nothing behind me. I looked at the picture and he wasn't there. I calmed myself down and sighed a breath of relief. My mom handed me a glass of water and I just played the party through, still a bit on edge about the whole situation. The party had finished and I was just saying my final goodbyes to my parents before setting off back home. It was 3am and I was only two hours into the drive. My parents sure knew how to throw a party. I was definitely feeling the effects of the alcohol, but I was in full control of the car. My parents tried to convince me to stay the night, but I told them I had work tomorrow afternoon. I pulled into a service station to maybe rest my eyes a bit and started going through my phone. While scrolling, I received a text from this unknown number. I opened it, and to my surprise, it was the selfie I had taken of myself with my back to the wall. 
My skepticism made the conclusion it was one of my childhood friends who thought I looked funny in the picture, so I messaged them back with the middle finger emoji. A few more minutes of scrolling later, I got another text from the same number. I again opened the message to see if it was just the same picture. However, I started shaking uncontrollably. I adjusted my glasses to see if I was seeing things, but I wasn't. Tears flowed from my eyes, as in the photo. I saw a blood-red circle highlighting the reflection in my glasses. Pure fear engulfed me, as what I saw was that same man. I didn't know what to do. This man followed me through every picture of myself. My heart again beating faster as the number texted me. Take another picture. I blocked the number and started driving again. The adrenaline powered me through the whole of the way home, and as soon as I entered my bedroom, I crashed onto my bed. When I woke up, my phone had blown up over 50 messages from that one number. Wake up now. I like the way you look. We should take a picture together. Wake up and take a picture. I couldn't. I was being overwhelmed. I didn't know how to react. I curled up into a ball on my bed as my phone stayed pinging on my bedside table. Suddenly, I was startled by three deafening, consecutive knocks on my front door. I crept towards the door and glanced through the peephole. Nothing. I opened the door and on the porch there was a box covered in Christmas wrapping. I picked up the box and walked back inside, locking the door behind me. I opened the box and my heart felt like it was being grasped tightly. With every breath came pain, like fire being exhaled through my nose. A camera. I knew how real all this was now as beneath that camera laid two photos. One of the men staring at me through my bedroom window, and one of him staring at me in the car at the service station. This man follows me wherever I go, but what I don't ever want to find out is if he is planning to hurt me. I've always had the prettiest eyes at school. Everyone says so. Other people in my family have the same boring brown ones, but mine are green with gold flecks. Everyone says I should be a model when I'm older, and I probably will. All throughout school, I've dated all of the most popular guys. I love watching them watch me. For homecoming, I'm planning to go with Lee Tucker. The running back. He's already getting calls from a bunch of SEC schools, and I've caught him staring at me a bunch of times. There's only one problem. The new girl. Her name is Ileana, and she has my exact same eyes. I saw it the minute she arrived at school. There they were, like looking in a mirror. The same green luster, the exact same gold flecks in all the exact same places. Except that she has this pale, blank face. It made me sick to look at, honestly. Like putting a $2 frame around the Mona Lisa. Worst of all, no one else seemed to notice how ugly she is. She'd barely been at school two hours when I saw Lee and some of the other football players chatting her up at the her locker. The whole time they were talking to her, though, she just stared down the hall at me like she was in a trance or something. After school, I saw her sitting on the front of her car in the parking lot waiting for me. She drives this Frankenstein of an old Camry, complete with a driver's side door with no paint. It's basically the opposite of my cute little BMW. My dad got it for me. Of course, he's one of the top five pediatric surgeons in the country, so he can afford it. You must be Alice, said Ileana. I was wondering if we could go get some coffee. She blinked and TBH. It kind of made my stomach turn because it was like she was blinking my eyes. Why would I do something like that? I asked. Come on, she said smiling. We're connected. 
You can tell that, right? We should be friends. I've got friends, I said. Then I got in my car and peeled away while she stared at me in this creepy way. At dinner, my dad could tell I was moping, so he asked me, What's wrong, pumpkin? And then I told him about Ileana and how she talked with Lee and about her stupid eyes. My dad practically choked on his chicken parm. You stay away from that girl, he told me. Don't even speak to her. I told him he was kind of freaking me out, but he just repeated himself and then got his worried dad look and said he had to make some phone calls. So with dad acting totally psycho, I grabbed my phone and decided to do a little light Instagram stalking. Lee is kind of basic in terms of his Instagram game, but I can't help scrolling through his pics. Except this time. I found like five pictures of him and Ileana chowing down on enchiladas at Senor Taco. I screamed and tossed my phone, which totally cracked on the marble floor. Oh well, time for an upgrade I guess. After that whole incident, I decided that Ileana and I needed to have a little chat. I tracked her down at her locker and asked if she wanted to grab Starbucks after all, after fourth period, and she was totally up for it. At coffee, she kind of stared at me like a shy puppy, looking at me with my own eyes. Everyone once in a while, she peeped out little questions like, Do you have any brothers and sisters? And... What's your dad like? Why did you move here? I asked after playing nice for a few minutes. Did something bad happen at your last school? She shook her head. This might sound silly, but I moved here for you. I've been looking for you for a long time. She said. Uh, psycho? We just met. Yeah, cool. I said, casually finishing my latte. I, uh... Better get back to my dad. Say hi for me, she said. Yeah, sure. Dinner that night turned out to be weirdly tense, especially after I mentioned my coffee with Ileana. I told you to stay away from her, my dad said, squeezing his fork so tight his fist turned white. Why? I said. Is she like your love child or something? No. He said, she's just... His pager went off. Just stay away. She could be dangerous. I need a few days to figure out why she's here. I really wanted to do what dad advised, but... The next day at school, I walked into the cafeteria to find Lee and Ileana fully making out at the corner table. I fully dropped my salad, which got dressing all over my best Jimmy Choo boots. I walked over to them going full, real housewife psycho. Who do you think you are? I shouted at Ileana. I just wanted to see what you like about him. She said, Why you picked him, you know? Or maybe I wanted to know what it was like to kiss him. You've been given so much in your life. Sometimes I think you don't even realize it. The car, the boy, the money. But are you grateful for any of it? You realize you and I aren't dating, right? Interjected Lee. I uncapped the green machine juice I was drinking and flung it all over them. You're dead, I told Ileana. Dead. She licked at a bit of the juice as it trickled down her face. I hope you don't mean that, she said. I wanted so badly to like you, Alice. I wanted to give this whole process some time. Now I'm starting to think I should just get it over with. What the hell are you talking about? I shouted. But by then the gym teacher, Mr. Lowry, was pulling me off to the principal's office. After that whole incident, I could tell people were starting to get the impression that I was the psycho. So I decided it was time to control the narrative. I jumped on TikTok and made a little video explaining how Ileana had come into school to steal my boyfriend, and was probably wearing colored contacts to copy my signature look, and how basically she was probably trying to steal my whole identity. I titled it, This Psycho Stole My Eyes, and posted it. 
Believe me, it got plenty of views and the comments told me I was totally in the right. Knowing that justice was on my side, I grabbed a large rock from the field by the parking lot and smashed it through the windshield of Ileana's tragedy of a car, which honestly was probably an upgrade for that piece of junk. As the rock rolled to the pavement, I looked back to see Ileana watching me with my eyes and a slightly amused expression on her face. She mouthed words into the wind that I couldn't hear. Before I had to look at her for even a second longer, I got in my car and drove home. I woke up in the middle of the night from a really good dream about Lee and found someone in bed with me. Lee? I whispered half asleep. Did you... sneak in? It's me, said a soft voice. I thought it would be a nice surprise. I looked into my own eyes, blinking back at me. Ileana? I asked. I know we're not sisters, she said. Not all the way, anyway. And we never got to be babies together, but we still have time. I started screaming as loud as I could over and over again. This isn't how I wanted it to be. She said, I know it's not your fault the way you are, I mean. He spoiled you, but I wanted to at least get to know you before. Dad, I screamed. Help. His room was only a few feet from mine. His footsteps should have been thudding down the hall by now. I'm sorry, she said. He can't come. You see this whole thing? It was really between him and me. I was just projecting a few things onto you, but you're really just another victim here. She got up and looked out at the full moon, examining something in her palm. I did have a sister when I was born, she continued. A real one. A twin. They said she died at birth, but something never quite made sense to me. You see, they lost her body at the hospital. It happens sometimes, they say. They get mixed up with other medical waste and then thrown into the incinerator. But my mom always said she heard two cries when I was born. She saw two healthy babies. Something was dripping down her hand, dripping out of whatever she was holding. I lay in the bed, my covers tight around me, like they'd protect me from the boogeyman. And would you believe that same night? At that same hospital, a little girl was born to one of the top pediatric surgeons in the country. Now, it may take some digging, but if you look at that little baby's medical records, they'll tell you she was born blind. Yet, somehow those records later got altered to say her eyes were fine. Odd, don't you think? She took a step toward me. Where do you think that little blind girl got her eyes? No. I started to say, no, you keep telling everyone I've got your eyes, I copied you, I'm here to tell you, yours are stolen, she exhaled sharply, but like I said, none of this is your fault, you're just the beneficiary, and now the price is paid, we can leave as friends, she opened her palm to reveal what she'd been holding all this time, a pair of eyeballs, fully intact and dripping with blood. I knew from their dull brown color who they belonged to. Dad, I said weakly. The price is paid now, she said. It's possible he's still alive if you hurry. She pulled open my clenched hand and put the eyeballs inside. Here, she said. You keep them. My dad didn't end up making it. The funeral is coming up this week. At least everyone at school felt bad for me. Lee even offered to take me out to a movie. I went, but I wasn't really into it. I just spent the whole time looking over my shoulder, wondering if she was there. The cops are still looking for Ileana, but they don't have much to go on. Apparently that wasn't even her real name. 
The police have some grainy camera footage from Ileana at school, but it wasn't really enough to get a description out of to the media. I tried to describe what she looked like, but her features are so boring it was hard to even describe them. Just look at my eyes, I told them, wishing I could rip their stupid faces off. She's got the same ones. It's just eyes, said one of the cops. Not really enough detail to go off of. What else have you got? I shook my head. Nothing. I've had fish tanks for years. It's so peaceful to watch the various aquatic creatures swimming around living their lives. It can be a lot of work and money at times, but for me, it's worth the joy it brings me. Last month, some disease or a parasite wiped out everything in my tank, even the shrimp and snails. It was sad, but it happens. From tragedy, a new beginning. I got to pick out all new fish, shrimp, and snails. I never named the inhabitants of my fish tanks. It's not a rule, I've just never done it. I don't know why I named this one particular fish, but I think bringing him home was a big mistake. Satan was a bright red fish with yellow flecks and black stripes. I thought this was a clever name for a fish with these colors. The tips of his tail looked like they could puncture your skin if you touch them. He had an extra set of fins on the upper part of his sides that kind of looked like wings. There were no other fish in the store like him. Strange thing was, the store owner hadn't known where he came from. He sold him to me for five dollars. I scoured the internet, trying to figure out what kind of fish Satan was, but had no luck. Maybe it was a coincidence, but on the drive home from the pet store, I very narrowly avoided three car accidents and tripped and fell in the driveway. I almost dropped Satan's bag. I kind of wish I had. I put Satan and all of his new, nameless friends in my tank. I was very happy with my choices, especially Satan. Although the other fish were bigger than Satan, they all seemed to be scared of him. This is very odd when it comes to fish hierarchy. Size is everything, in a freshwater tank anyway. There was no reason why they were letting Satan push them around. Maybe the extra fin scared them, or he was doing something painful to them that I hadn't noticed. It didn't really matter, but it was interesting. Strange stuff started happening in the tank. One morning I woke up and all of the gravel was piled up on one side of the tank. The glass bottom was exposed on the other. There was nothing in that tank that could do that. Being such a mystery, I assumed it was Satan. I figured it was just something that type of fish did. Another morning, all of the decorations were in different places and had tiny bite marks all over them. On at least six different occasions, out of the corner of my eye the tank looked like it was filled with blood but changed back to water once I looked straight at it. Things got worse. Every few days one of Satan's tank mates would die. Fish die, no big deal. The weird thing was the corpses were flat, not kind of flat, paper thin. They reminded me of empty Capri Sun bags. It was like something was sucking out their insides, skeleton and all leaving the skin. Even stranger, on the days I found a flat fish corpse, Satan was noticeably bigger. The amount of growth seemed to increase with every flat corpse. I was starting to worry the tank is too small for him. That's when I noticed something that was really weird, just too convenient. On either side of his head were tiny black spikes that got longer and thicker every day. He was growing horns. Fish come in all shapes and sizes, but given his name, this felt too perfect to be a coincidence. Eventually all of Satan's tank mates were dead. I didn't replace them for obvious reasons. There was an upside after that. 
I knew for sure that everything that happened in the tank was caused by Satan. He uses his new horns to scrape little sixes and the LG on the glass. Never three of them together, though. It was kind of disappointing. He also digs pentagrams in the gravel. Not often, but I have seen it. I took the tank decorations out. He damaged them so severely they became eyesores. Not to mention, he had given them long, sharp points that I worried he would impale himself on. He was too big to have anything but him in the tank anyway. The voices started after taking the decorations out. I heard them in every room but the one the fish tank was in. They are deeper than I've ever heard a human voice go, and they never stop. It sounds like a church full of people with unnaturally deep voices praying softly in the next room. It's really faint, so it's not a huge deal, but every once in a while there's a loud, blood-curdling scream that I could do without. Naturally, I couldn't sleep. When I did, I had the most horrifying dreams you can imagine. They were about things like murdering my family, being a mass shooter, being in hell, which may not have been a dream, and countless other scenarios that ate away at my sanity. The other day I was scrubbing the algae on the glass and the water suddenly got so hot that it burned me. Satan was fine. Finally this morning I woke up and impossibly, there was another little fish in the tank. It was a little Satan. I named him Satanito. I have no idea how it happened. There were no other fish in the tank to breed with, but there he was. The spawn of Satan. If anyone out there has any guesses about what type of fish Satan is, or has had a fish like this and can offer advice, please don't hesitate to leave a comment. Oh god. I just heard glass shatter in Satan's room. We can all agree that it's satisfying to pop a pimple, right? Don't get me wrong, it's absolutely disgusting, but something about a buildup of pressure under the skin being pushed forward and out of it is just the right kind of gross. It feels like cleaning your skin in a way. Like letting the pus come out of your pores is healthier than letting it sit there festering. I know for a fact that it isn't actually good for your skin, but it feels like it should be. It became part of my morning routine, poring over my own reflection looking for blemishes. I have a little mirror in my bathroom that shows a close-up, just for this purpose. I'm no Dr. Pimple Popper. I wasn't filming it or anything, just a routine that helped me feel like I was cleaning my skin thoroughly. A week ago, when I began my routine, I realized I had a particularly nasty white head along my jawline, just off center from my chin. The head was small, but there was a larger base burgeoning just beneath the skin. Using the tool to apply pressure, as well as my finger, I popped it. The pus was vicious and foul-smelling, and a shade closer to yellow than the usual off-white. I maneuvered the tool around my skin, trying to get all the clog from beneath it, but still found myself unable to get all of it with the tool alone. I honestly didn't think much of it. I wore a bandage to work in an attempt to hide the crater in my face and breathe a sigh of relief when I realized it was barely noticeable underneath my mask. The next day, upon beginning my routine, I realized two things. First, was that the pimple had thankfully scabbed over. I hadn't fully been able to get deeper enough to clear it of pus, but I had gotten enough out to be pleased with my own handiwork. It was nearly deflated, now just a sore with a small mound surrounding it rather than the mountainous blight from the day before. The second thing I noticed was that a similarly enormous whitehead was sitting just at the edge of my hairline, as big as if not overtaking the size of the one from the day before. Frustrated, I made quick work of it and put on yet another band-aid, audibly sighing when I realized this one wouldn't be covered by my mask. The liquid evacuated from my skin, 
was just as rancid smelling as the day before, and I gagged as I realized it was leaking down my face from under the bandage. When I pulled the bandage away, I discovered that just as the day before, I had been unable to get all of the liquid out. It was too deeply embedded within my skin. The thick, chunky pus flowed down my forehead, and I cursed quietly. I used my metal pick to go deeper still into my skin, applying pressure until a red welt began to form and the dripping finally stopped. Here's where I may have messed up. When I got home from work that day, I took the band-aid off the now scabbed over wound from the day before, just to replace it. As I looked at the thin layer of skin over the crater, I realized it had flared up during the day, getting rounded and almost painful to the touch. It strained against my skin, making it a dark pink color around the white head of the pimple. Infected, I was sure. I had no idea how to handle it, but seeing it rounded again made me think that if I could get out the infected pus, I could make the pimple go away altogether. I applied pressure yet again from the metal instrument and my finger, and yet again it erupted. It was the same yellow, stinking mess as the last two times, and there was quite a bit more of it. But even as I released what seemed to be an absurd amount of secretion, I felt more beneath my skin. I steadied my resolve and dug as deep as I dared, wincing from pain as with a tiny squelch, a solidified ball of mass came from the spot on my chin. When released, it gave off a worse stench than when the previous whiteheads almost as if the scent were concentrated. To my dismay, it stayed there resting on the wound rather than falling as I'd expected it to, and I quickly realized that it was stuck to a wispy trail of blood, holding it in the air. It was about the size of my pinky fingernail in total, but as I looked at the coagulated blood-covered ball, I reached up to take it off my face, Grasping it gently beneath my thumb and forefinger, I noticed the gut-wrenching squish that I felt, as if the thing were mostly liquid. After smudging some of the blood off, I realized with a start that while most of it was off-white, a speck of it was sickly yellow, reminiscent of a rotten egg yolk. It darkened in the center to a slit of black, and I tried to tell myself that there was no possible way for it to be an eye. As I tried to pull it off my chin, the thin string of blood stayed attached, and after pulling it about an inch from my face, it pulled taut. I realized that I had mistaken a vein for a trail of blood. It hadn't hurt to pull the orb until the vein held, and even then the pain was not from a place I recognized. I had expected to feel it behind the wound, but I realized with a start that the pain I was feeling began near the top of my shoulder, a pressure I couldn't relieve. What can you do with something like that? I wouldn't be putting the thing that I'd decided was not an eyeball back into me, so I had to pull the vein. It was as simple as that. It was indescribably painful. The slow trail from inside my shoulder to my chin, the throat, I think was the worst part as whatever was at the end of the vein dragged its sharp, hard edge beneath my skin. It didn't help the blood and ever more disgusting pus dropped from the wound as I pulled, stirred by whatever I was bringing to the surface. Still, I pulled at the increasingly long red thread that kept the thing that couldn't possibly be an eyeball with a rotten pupil hanging off my face. When I finally got whatever was tethered inside of me to the wound where my pimple had been, I assumed that the worst of it was over. That was. I assumed until I realized that whatever hard, sharp object had been in me must now come through the pinprick-sized hole in my face. I would like to say I was brave in the end, that I unemotionally pulled the last of it through, but if I were being honest, I screamed. I cried. I gave up over and over, despite knowing that each brief reprise from pain would only make it all the sharper when I tried again. 
Eventually I used my metal pimple tool to open the wound further and finally pressed the dark metal object through my skin. You'd think I would have noticed somewhere along the way when Vane had become wire, but I was distracted by the pain I was in. And even looking at it, I couldn't see a single point where one bled into the other. It was absolutely seamless. Having the ordeal over with, I looked closer and saw small veins running throughout what I know had to be an eye, hidden deep within my skin. The color of the eye was not my own, and the slit pupil looked almost animal in nature. That wasn't what made me cry out in shock, though. The inhuman looking eye wasn't what made me immediately flush the eye in vein and anchor all down the toilet, crying inconsolably as I prayed that it had all been a dream. What caused this reaction was the realization that even without a deep understanding of technology, I understood the black metal that had been inside of my own shoulder had to have been some kind of camera. This morning when I woke up, there were four more white heads straining against my jawline, and two more on my forehead. Each was larger than the last and looked ready to pop at any moment. I don't know yet if I'll have the strength to pop them, or what will develop if I don't. I don't know if each contains an eye, or if by some miracle they're regular pimples. All I know is that I can feel something underneath them, deep within my muscles. I can feel it growing within me, and I don't know if pulling out whatever is being grown can stop it. My Cliché Scary Halloween Story I feel cliche calling this my Halloween story, but all these events transpire between multiple days leading up to Halloween. I'll first admit that I wasn't a great older brother growing up. My brother and I are best friends now, close as can be, but in elementary school, we endured a stint of hating each other's guts. I'm a couple of years older than him, so this would be sometime around when I was in 6th grade and my brother was in 4th grade. We have also established our relationship. His name is Chris, and that's how I will reference him from now on. Mid-October, late 1990s, Chris and I are in the McDonald's drive through with our mom. Our Happy Meals are handed to us, and we each get a Halloween plastic bucket. I get the ghost, and Chris gets the pumpkin. He doesn't want the pumpkin because he thinks the face is scary. Being the brother I am, I decide to taunt him with the bucket and belittle his feelings. He cries, and I'm scolded for my antics. But as my mom turns to yell at me, she doesn't notice the car in front of her has stopped, and she rear ends the end of the truck in front of us. The man gets out, and he's not really upset, even though there's now a pretty good ding in his rear bumper. He looks in the car and smiles at us. He's tall with a booming baritone voice. As he leans near the driver's window, he speaks kindly with my mom and asks our names while exchanging information with my mom before getting back into his truck. When the man in front leaves the parking lot, he takes a left. We make a right. My mom was a little shaken up, but not enough to direct her straight back toward me. My head is against the passenger window and I'm still looking into the rear view mirror on my door. I notice the white Toyota make a U-turn and start to follow our car. My mom is still pissed at us, so I hold my tongue for the moment. She doesn't notice yet, but the white Toyota stays behind us for quite some time, only abandoning the pursuit when we pulled into our neighborhood. Days pass and the event becomes a forgotten blip as the excitement for Halloween ramps up. My mom spent more time we could appreciate stitching together the cat dog costume we'd been wearing that night. If you don't know Cat Dog, it was an American cartoon where the main characters are, as you would probably guess, a cat and a dog. But they're Siamese twins. So my brother and I were attached via a big fabric tube sewn to our backs. This was our first Halloween without our mom, and she was more than delighted to make a costume that would force me to keep an eye on my brother. As the sun sets, we're out the door. The fabric tube bends enough for us both to walk side by side, but for comfort, I make my brother walk backwards as I lead the way. There were about five houses in our little cul-de-sac loop before you'd be opposite of our house. Then, we'd walk up the block and do that again. Turning onto the next block, etc., I noticed an eerily familiar white truck sitting idling about 40 yards deep. 
The interior is dark, but I can see a red ember glow of a cigarette, as well as a small exhale of smoke coming out of the driver's side window, signifying that someone is there. I ask my brother if he also thinks this is the same truck from the McDonald. We spin while walking, so my brother is now in front. He confirms and tells me he can see the big ding our mom had left. We spin back around. We can still hit a couple of houses without going past the truck. Innocently, my brother asks me if the man will ask us for money to fix the ding. At the moment, at that age, I was like, oh crap, yeah, maybe he would. Before we get to the first house fence post, I see the cigarette get flicked out the window, and he's stepping out of the now illuminated truck. He pleasantly shouts our names as if running into old friends. Then he begins to walk towards us. Again, I immediately advised him that our mother wasn't with us tonight, and at that moment and age, even worse, I follow up with, We're all alone out here and don't have money to fix his bumper. He laughs and tells us he's not there for the money. Then he spins a fictional tale about how he's obtained too much candy tonight and needs to get rid of some, and that he didn't want it to go to waste, and remember two young men going trick-or-treating that may want some of it. My brother shouts, Wow, now I feel obligated to follow him back to his idling truck, so my little brother can have some of the candy, and I don't have to reject his oddly kind gesture, you know? I almost felt indebted to him for how cool he was being about the dent, and I think he could tell. Anyway, on the walk there, I let my brother walk in front as the man tells him about the variety of sweets he'll soon have access to. With me facing the house, I notice it's pretty dead out here, and we may be the only kids on this particular street. I ask the guy, Hey, where'd you get all this candy anyway? My brother follows it up with asking if he went trick-or-treating. The man laughs, but he doesn't answer either of our questions. Instead, he opens what I assume is the truck door and tells us to hold on just one second while he grabs the candy. And just like that, I feel a strong pull on my costume. Before I can even harp on my brother for moving like an idiot, he's screaming, Let go of me! Let go of me! And again, a strong pull, almost taking me to the ground. Instinctually, I pull back using my weight to pull myself forward. It's then I realize this guy has a hold of my brother. And by the sheer design of my costume my mother made, he's got a hold of me too. The man is desperately trying to silence my brother and he succeeds by putting his hand over his mouth to muffle the scream. So I took over yelling precisely what my brother was and adding, Help! He's got my brother! The man seems to grow even more frustrated and seems to pull even harder as he physically picks my brother up. The costume chokes me but doesn't rip. He's picking up and putting down my brother like a rag doll, but without me budging. He can't do anything to get my brother free. I felt him try to grab at me and lift me off the ground so I spin around. I'm in the position where I'm next to my brother. I realize he can't get us both. I look the guy dead in the eyes, lean over, and bite the hand he's holding over my brother's mouth as hard as I can. He smacks my face away as he removes his hand. He gets in real close and tells me to shut the fuck up, or he will snap our necks. My brother went cold when he said that. I'll never forget it. Terrified, I just keep screaming. I'm yelling in his face and he's looking around. For the first time, I can see he's frantic. He's attempting to cover my mouth with no success. As he tries again, my brother picks back up with the screaming. It seems like so much happened in such a small window of time. The whole thing couldn't have lasted more than a minute, maybe two at most. Just as I start to hit this guy as hard as I can, I can hear someone, a new voice. I turn my head but can't entirely move my body due to the man's newfound grip on my costume. But then, sweet release, the man let go of our outfit. Without even a second thought, I yell at my brother to run, and we book it. Looking back only once, I could see the truck taking off in the opposite direction. But, I can also see a group of neighbors standing there where we were, more coming out of their houses and some calling out to us. We don't stop and we ran all the way home. But, not before going inside, we promised each other that we wouldn't tell our mom what happened. Why? We feared that we would never be able to trick-or-treat again. For some reason, we thought we would be the ones in trouble for almost getting kidnapped which I guess messed us up for quite some time. As a kid, you know, you can only feel safe in so many areas. So be careful, you know, watch your kids and stuff because you never know who might be out there also watching them. It started as a normal day. I woke up, brushed my teeth, brushed my hair, ate cereal, got dressed, and drove to school. When I got there, something was obviously off. I mean, if you didn't see anyone at your school, would it be off to you too? 
My first thought was that I had come too early, or maybe it was a holiday. I checked, 7.45 a.m. I was on time. It was just any other Wednesday. No holidays, no PTA meeting. I went to my homeroom. No one was there. There were backpacks sitting next to the desks. There was writing on the board. It was as if everyone had just vanished into thin air. I walked around the school for a little while, looking in the different classes, peeking in storage rooms, opening and entering places I had never been before. I looked in the cafeteria, the courtyard, all the classrooms, the track and soccer field, and even the break room. No one was anywhere. There was one place left to check. The gym. I jogged across the cafeteria, through the double doors that led to the 10th and 11th grade classes, and down the corridor that led to the auditorium and gym. I peeked inside the auditorium and saw no one. I walked inside the gym. Everyone was sitting there. Some were in chairs in the middle of the floor, some on the bleachers, some were standing. Every single person, the 493 students and 173 staff, the five security guards and even some parents, all of them were there. The strange part was that even with the 493 students, 173 staff, five security guards and some parents, it was completely silent. The only sound was the door opening and closing. My breath quickened. My heart beat faster. It was so suddenly eerie. What made it worse was that everyone, literally everyone was staring at me. Not blinking, not talking, not pointing or laughing. Just staring. It was petrifying. Absolutely, morbidly, horrifyingly petrifying. It sent my anxiety through the roof. It made the hairs on my arms straight. It gave me goosebumps and sent chills down my spine. I made my way to one of the chairs and began to take my backpack off. While all of their eyes stared at me, gaping at me like I was an alien, before I could sit down I heard someone say, Run. It was almost a whisper. I wouldn't have heard it if there was any noise at all. I don't know who said it, or why, but they did. It was enough for me. In one swift movement, I swung my backpack on and kicked my chair behind me. Suddenly everyone in the room was standing and walking or running towards me. They hadn't taken their eyes off of me. I sprinted out of the gym, down the corridor, through the cafeteria, down the main lobby, out the front door, through the parking lot, to the gas station across the street. When I got there, no one was there either. I swiped a few bottles of water from the freezer, tossed them in my backpack, and grabbed a few bags of chips, too. I hid in the bathroom the moment I saw them exit the building. I locked the door. I barricaded it with the rack full of toilet paper rolls. I pushed my body against it. I turned off all the lights and was as quiet as I could be. I spent a week in that room. Eventually, I got the courage to come out. When I did, no one was there. Nothing was abnormal. The clerk was serving a customer and waved a cheery hello to me. I was trembling. I walked out and downtown to the police station. I told them my story and they kept me there until my parents came to pick me up. They thought I was crazy. It took me two months to go back to school. I don't know what happened or why. Maybe I got caught in a temporary loophole that sent me to an alternate universe. And once space realized it, it just sent me back. I don't know. Maybe it was real, or maybe I am crazy. I have lived in fear of the starers ever since. I don't leave my house without a backpack of fully stocked survival gear. Am I crazy? Am I sane?
I was always alone. My parents kicked me out as soon as I turned 18. The rest of my family lived across the world. I didn't have many friends. Long story short, I wasn't loved. Most of my time I spent aimlessly wandering around my town, hoping that somebody would come for me. It never happened. There was this house though that I always felt drawn to. It was abandoned, looked like it had been for quite some time. Vines were crawling across the exterior, the windows were boarded up, and the paint was chipping away. I never explored it mainly because it didn't look safe. But as I walked by it one very late night, I realized even if it was unsafe, and I died in it, nobody would care. They wouldn't even go looking for me. Hey, what the hell? I muttered to myself. I might as well. As I approached the front door, it creaked open by itself. The inside was musty and covered in dust, but not nearly as broken down as it was on the outside. I was just about to enter when I heard something strange. A piano playing, and right by the piano, a strange shadow getting larger and larger as it slithered towards me. I stepped back in shock. It was some... thing. It had tentacles in place of arms, and its smile was sharp and yellow, unnaturally large. Its eyes resembled a snake's more than it did a human's. It held out a tentacle towards me. Come, stay. You'll love it here. Its cold tentacle wrapped around my arm and pulled me into the house where the door slammed behind me. It dragged me towards a table where dozens of other creatures sat. Something with nothing but a gaping black hole for a mouth and eyes drooled beside me. A monster with pale skin and no pupils grinned at me. An octopus-looking creature in a droopy chef's hat walked towards the table. A grand plate of disgusting-looking entrees in his tentacles. Dig in. The tentacle creature said, that same wide grin staring at me. What? What is... who are you? I asked. The tentacle creature laughed. Oh, foolish one. Look at us. We were just like you once. Outcast. Alone. Nowhere to go until we found this house. Stay a while. You'll be like us in no time. It hissed. I will never be like you. I yelled and ran towards the door, but it didn't open no matter how hard I pushed. The creature with white eyes grabbed me and dragged me upstairs, into a room with a single, moldy-looking bed. Rest, young one. You have lots ahead of you. It smiled, and I could see the bugs in its teeth. Let me go home, please. It shook its head. You cannot leave. I cannot leave. Even if I wanted to, this is your home now, as it is mine. I am not like you, I said tears in my eyes. This is your home, not mine. The creature laughed a wheezy, throaty laugh. What makes you think I'm not like you, young one? I'm a human. You are just some, something, I said. It sighed. I was a human once. It reached into its dirty shirt pocket and pulled out a picture. It took me a while, but as I looked at it, the resemblance was there and it became clearer to me that it was, in fact, that monster. This was me. I was alone, like you. I had nowhere to turn but this house. I hated it just like you, but as time went on I found myself more at home. It changed me. You don't have to love it right away, young one, but trust me, this is where you are meant to be. Just give it a try, okay? He said and walked out. I sat on the disgusting bed processing everything. Just give it a try, okay? Slowly I lied on the bed and to my surprise, it was comfortable. To be fair, my bed at home was just an air mattress lying on my kitchen floor, but this was like nothing before. 
I fell asleep in an instant and I had a thought that maybe this wasn't going to be so bad after all. The next morning as I woke up, I looked different. Not too different, just enough for me to notice. My skin was paler and my arms were veinier. My hair looked more matted and when I smiled to myself in the mirror, I couldn't help but notice it looked similar to the tentacle monsters. As time went on, I felt more and more like them. Things I used to be disgusted by became hobbies of mine, and things that I used to fear made me smile a wide smile like everybody else. I barely noticed any changes in me until about a week later. Were my teeth sharper, or was I just crazy? I just shook that thought off. But as time went on, the used to things I got, I felt at home finally. This was home, where I could find joy in tearing a live rat's head off and drinking its blood, or where I could eat live bugs whenever I so desired. This was meant to be. I was turning into the man I was supposed to be, the tentacle monster, who I now recognized as the most esteemed of gentlemen, smiled at me one day. Ah, brother, you've become one of us. A true monster. Monster? Who was he calling monster? I was no. I looked in the mirror and saw myself. My skin was now completely white. My fingers were long and sharp at the end. My eyes turned yellow like a cat's. My hair had fallen off. I was one of them. One day, as I was lounging by the piano, I heard the door creak open. A young man, maybe about my age, looked around. Hello? Hello? He called. I crawled towards him, eager to make a new friend. He jumped back at the sight of me. I flashed him my nicest, most gentleman-like smile. I reached out my hand to him. Come, stay. You'll love it here. Burns into my memory by Invisible Socks. So I have to tell my own story I have held for all these years. I am 46 years old and this event happened when I was around 5 or 6. My parents at the time left me at my grandmother's house during the day, presumably for childcare, and I have very few memories of that time. A few things that do stick out are walks to the park across the street in Fullerton, California, and home-cooked meals. I always like to climb this tree outside as well. But more importantly, I want to point out that I have a few memories from that time in my life. This is one I'm about to tell you that stayed and etched into my memory the most. I remember it was broad daylight, probably about 10 a.m. or so. I was eating cereal in my grandmother's kitchen. She used to talk on the phone all the time with her friends or whoever, so she would have pay attention to me. That morning, she was deep in conversation with a friend and I noticed something in my side vision that was outside. The best way I can describe it is, is it was like when you see men at hockey game that wear those green bodysuit things that completely cover their face and everything. So you see an outline of a man. However, this man I saw was unlike most of the other accounts of shadow people. It had no features on his face, if it was even male. No nose, no mouth, just a head that was all black. This was in the middle of the day, like I said. I couldn't see any shadows or anything. Just the black figure. He was walking on the side of the house and walking slowly, almost like he was in slow motion. I was scared and frozen. He walked right up to the window and almost looked like he was going to walk right through it. He started looking in, and looking back on it now, my adult brain is trying to make sense of it. Like it was just a guy who was robbing people wearing a balaclava. But the figure had no features whatsoever. What made this more frightening is that he had no shadow as well. He just seemed to slip by, and once he got to the concrete block fence wall thing that are so common in Southern California, he vanished. I have heard in the past that sometimes kids and young people are more attuned to seeing paranormal things. I have been a lifelong skeptic, 
I still cannot explain this, and like I said, it has stuck in my head for all of these years. I just wanted to share this with the community. I feel so much better telling someone. I told my son earlier when we were driving and when we were listening to Art Bell archives in the car. Listening to that really brought back a flood of memories from that encounter. I still cannot explain it. I raced down the creaky escalator, past the cheesy advertisements which looked as if they haven't been replaced any time in the last decade. It was still a while before I would reach the platform and I was already hearing the shriek-like symphony of the brakes as the Soviet-era train made its way into the empty station, lit only by a few flickering yellow lights. Panicked, I glanced at my watch, causing me to stumble over my feet and hit my head on the rubber handrail running alongside me. I woke up in pitch darkness. Feeling around my pants, I uncovered many cuts and bruises, but most importantly, my phone. As I tapped the screen with my disfigured fingers, it lit up, blinding me with light. Seconds later, as I read the time and my memories came rushing back, I was blinded by something much worse. Fear. 12.58 a.m. No, 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 it can't be. I tried to scream, but only a raspy whisper came out. I quickly understood that this was for my own good, though, as I realized that this wasn't simply a bad dream. It was reality. I sat in silence for what felt like hours. I never thought this moment would come. I always told myself that I wouldn't risk it. That I would be careful, yet here I was, fallen victim to my own impatience, and soon... I reckon the victim of something worse than death. Hey, I just thought of something. If you find this and you're not from around here, I reckon you wouldn't know what the hell I am talking about. I'll explain, but every tap of the screen is painful, so I will try to be quick. I was young when the rumors started, and yeah, that's just what they were to me back then. Rumors. Every city has their own, unique set of creepy legends that terrify school children and keep teenagers in check. Don't get me wrong, most of the rumors here in Redacted are just that. Unfortunately though, and I hate to be cliche, but this one, well this one was just different. And not in a good way. Listen, I'm not sure if I have much more time before those things find me. It's already 2 a.m. and the noises are getting closer. Any attempts to move result in a sharp pain in my back, causing me to stumble and crash back to the ground. I fear that crawling will have me falling down into the tracks, meaning they'll get to me even quicker. Even if I wanted to use my phone's flashlight, I want to conserve as much of the 12% of remaining battery as I can. And I don't reckon what I would see would be pretty anyway. I can see them. Their eyes, at least. The faint glows of red remind me of my car's cigar lighter. I should have taken my car today. I can see them watching. Dozens, if not hundreds, in each tunnel. I don't have much time left. If you find this, please. Just please remember, don't stay in the metro after midnight. This document was found in the notes application of an iPhone 6 in the sewers of Redacted. Redacted doesn't have a metro system. Whatever is happening to me, it can't be real. Every day now feels like a waking nightmare. Each day that passes, it gets worse. I'm a nobody. I've always told myself and others that, for me, it was an excuse, an easy way out of things. If I tell myself and others that I am someone insignificant, there would be low to no expectations of me. Nobody will expect anything. And nobody should expect anything from an insignificant, 
unassuming nobody like me. Now I wish I hadn't been doing it so much. It happened very slowly, literally bit by bit. I came home to my hometown from university for my semester break. As I approached my family's home's picket fence, I was expecting warm barks of welcome, but no. Our family dog, the family dog that I took care of for 18 years of my life, was viciously barking and snapping at me. I tried to reach for the gate, but he came snarling and attempted to bite me. This was very unusual for a dog like him. I really couldn't enter the house until my father calmed him down, chained him up, and let me into the house. At this time, I thought it was just that the family dog was old, and it was the evening times when I came home. I figured he didn't recognize me. Things got worse when I got back to the university. Admittedly, I'm not the most famous or recognized person at the uni, but I couldn't help but notice how weirdly people are staring at me. Some looked confused, others looked genuinely terrified. I tried approaching the student council president, who happens to be in my circle. As I greeted him, a sense of unfamiliarity radiated through his eyes, and even though I did have a conversation with him, it turned out particularly strange. He kept making me repeat my name as if trying to remember it, and he seemed so uncomfortable while talking to me. As the days passed by, it became more ominous and uncomfortably uncanny. People I knew at the university would look at me with confusion as I tried to approach them. Even some of my professors, some of whom were my professors from the freshman year until now, would seem utterly confused when they see me in their class. At first, I was in denial, looking for even the slightest of a logical excuse. I thought maybe people were pulling a prank on me. But this has got to be the most elaborate and grand prank I've ever experienced. How can every student in the university be part of this? And why me? As far as I am concerned, I'm not one to be taking this kind of treatment from everyone. I came home yesterday to the house that I've been coming home to for the last 22 years of my life. And instead of warm hugs and beaming smiles from both my father and my mother, I am met with confused eyes and smug frowns. The warmth of a home now replaced with uneasiness and confusion. I unknowingly tried to enter the home only to be driven away by my father. I'm as confused as everybody. Now it feels like I'm a stranger not only to actual strangers, but to the friends and family that I have known all my life. I tried confiding in my closest friends only to be avoided by them and met with the usual, I don't know you. I tried coming back to my home multiple times over, and again and again I was chased away, even had the cops called on me. It's only getting worse, now everyone looks at me with baffled expressions and suspicious eyes, almost as if I didn't seem human to them, and, and... I can't seem to remember M my own name. What's happening? When I try to say my name, I'm met with a mental block. Like my brain can't seem to look for the right name to say, even if I try my hardest to remember. Please, to whoever is reading this, please tell me to remember. It's been almost two weeks since the incident, ten days and six hours to be exact. All I can do is count the time. Someone knows I don't belong, and I know they're waiting for me to slip up on some small detail. I had just gotten out of the shower when a rush of confusion hit me. It was like I hit my head on the corner of a counter, but I was still conscious, and there was no pain. I felt different. I called my girlfriend, Angie, to let her know how terrified I was about what just happened, and she didn't seem too concerned. 
She was busy at work, so I figured she was preoccupied and couldn't focus straight. No big deal. She was able to calm me down enough to hang up and go about the night. I couldn't remember much. I didn't remember what happened that day, or even the week before. It's all still a blur. I decided to leave it be until the next day. Angie was asleep when I woke up, so I figured I had some time to relax. Except she looked different. Not a haircut, no makeup, but not how I knew her. Her dirty blonde hair now had less blonde in it. Her smile didn't shine like before. I knew she was different when she woke up. Her eyes were... darker. From a shade of green to brown, and above all else, she had this unsettling mood. Not wanting to bother her, I went to my parents to pick up some mail. Mom wasn't home, but Dad was. Cheery as always, he hugged me when I walked in. And he was different. Slightly taller, slimmer build and deeper voiced. Hey, he's been working out lately and it seems to have paid off. We talked for a bit before mom walked in and when she saw me, I watched her eyes grow wide as she shuddered through her sentence. She knew. I was terrified. I didn't bring up the incident and after her initial shock, mom carried on. I could immediately tell her differences. She was shorter, her voice lighter, and her hair was a light brown compared to her almost black hair from before. She had this unsettling stare towards me that no one else noticed. She knew that she couldn't tell anyone. My dad and brother were thankfully oblivious to the heavy air that had settled into the house. After the uncomfortable conversation, Angie texted me and asked if I wanted to go to her parents for dinner. I shot a quick sure text back, before saying goodbye to my parents and quickly leaving. Mom stared at me from the kitchen window as I pulled away. When I got home, Angie was watching TV and asked how I was feeling. If I would have been honest and told her, I probably would have been involuntarily submitted to a mental hospital. Who would believe anything I saw? If I told them, I told her I was feeling better, though I still couldn't remember much. I brushed it off, hoping she wouldn't push it too much, and she didn't. When we got to her parents' house, they opened the door and welcomed us. Her parents had changed exactly opposite of mine. Her dad was shorter, had put on a little weight, and lighter voice. Her mom was taller, voice deeper, and darker hair. After going inside, I felt so out of place. Her family went on about their day while I sat there visibly uncomfortable. Angie's dad asked if I was alright, and I told him I was sore from work. The subject was dropped as we continued on with the night. When we arrived back home, Angie went to shower as I sat down to really examine our apartment. Every piece of furniture, wall objects, and even the flooring had shifted slightly. It was here I finally realized it could be an effect from me hitting my head on something at work. The weird thing is, I hadn't hit my head on anything in months. After Angie got out, I hopped in, hoping to reverse the horrible day. Once out of the shower, I felt better and ready to forget the delusion I've been in. I laid down to the first rest that lasted longer than four hours, only to wake and realize I was still in this nightmare. My mother keeps calling me, asking me to come over for impractical tasks. She seems to be getting more and more adamant that I go over there whenever she is there. I agreed to go over the next day after work just to stop the questions. I got to my parents' house and my mom was the only one home. Nervously, I asked what she needed help with. She told me something was going on with her stove and asked if I could help move it out. But once we got to the kitchen... She sat down at the table and asked me to join her. I slowly walked over and took a seat. She asked something disturbing. Who are you? It took me by surprise. I didn't expect her to be so blunt with it. I paused for a moment before replying. What do you mean? Her eyes narrowed for a second before returning to normal with her reply of, Just wondering. 
her off-centered smile sent chills up my spine. We proceeded with pulling the stove out so she could retrieve whatever it was that she lost, and I went on my way home. Angie was in the living room watching TV and asked what my mom needed help with, so I told her. Of course, I didn't mention the weird conversation, but she knew I held back and didn't push any further. Everything continued on as normal before bed, and once we were laying next to each other, I caught Angie staring hard at me. Blank expression, no smile, almost like she was looking right through me. I don't know if I'll last much longer here, and Angie is starting to get suspicious of me too. Maybe Joey Manifoli was going soft, but he pitied the old man. Tall and stooped as if under a great weight, his roomy eyes brimmed behind the lens of his horn-rimmed glasses. He looked like he was about to cry. His mustache, dull, sandy brown just a month ago, had gone completely gray, and the lines in his narrow face seemed deeper, sharper. His white coat hung slack on his gaunt frame and his black bow tie drooped like a wilted flower. His naughty hands trembled slightly, as if with Parkinson's, and his Adam's apple bobbed up and down. His voice came in a low, frog-like croak, and speaking was visibly difficult. If a man had ever been down on his luck, it was Lenny Watterson. Next month, he said. I, I swear, I just... I have to bury my wife. They were standing in the middle of the Watterson's pharmacy on Leeford's Boulevard. The black and white checkerboard tiles gleamed in the light of the September sun, and the scent of cinnamon lingered in the air like a pleasant sepia tones memory. Lenny slipped his hand under his glasses to pinch the bridge of his nose, and a strange and uncharacteristic pang of sympathy cut through Joey's stomach. Short and squat, with graying black hair combed neatly back from a broad forehead and clad in a plaid sports coat that made him look like a used car salesman instead of a mobster, Joey wasn't a man who often empathized with people. In his line of work, you can't, or you won't last a week. You gotta be cold, and you gotta be hard. The motto around the suite from which his crew operated was, Fuck you, pay me. And it was fitting. Money makes the world go round, and if you're not being paid, your world stops. Normally, if someone gave him a sob story like Lenny Watterson's, he'd nod, express his condolences, then hold out his hand. Now fuck you, pay me. Things were different with the old man, though. Lefferts, and most of Queens itself, had changed a lot over the past twenty years, but Watterson's had been here through it all like a rock. 78. Lenny had been running the place since as far back as Joey could remember, and probably longer. Joey appreciated that. Nothing lasts anymore, and when something does, it deserves some kind of respect. He also saw a lot of himself in Lenny. They were both old partners in industries steadily fading away. You saw pharmacies and soda fountains nowadays less than you saw three-eyed aliens, and this thing of ours that wasn't what it used to be, either. The old heads were dead or in prison, the Sicilians ran everything, and the old ways of making money didn't always work. Take extortion. A lot of guys used to make good money doing that because, back then, the mob was strong. You didn't call the cops because, if you did, you were fucked. Now, three little numbers on the keypad could send fifty guys away for decades. Watterson was a special case. Nominally, Joey collected $300 every month for protection. Protection from what he'd do to the place if the old man didn't pay. But deep down, it was blackmail. Watterson, you see, liked little girls. Really little girls. Joey never threatened to expose him, but he made sure he knew up front that he could. I'll pay you next month, I swear. Watterson repeated. Joey put his hands on his hips and sighed. He glanced at the boy on his left, 
tall and lanky with black hair and an olive complexion just like Joey's. He wore jeans and a black zip-up hoodie. He stared down at his white tennis shoes and looked like he'd rather be anywhere but here. Last year, Joey's brother and his wife were killed in a car crash, and Bobby came to live with him. He was a good kid, but too goddamn lazy, so Joey had been showing him the ropes. That way, maybe he'd make something of himself one day. Showing a mark of mercy would set a bad example, but he couldn't bring himself to go hard. Not on Lenny. He couldn't walk away empty-handed, though. All right, all right, fine, Joey said and gestured with his hands. Hey, look, I'm fair. We've been doing this a long time and you've always been good about paying, so here's what I'm going to do. Watterson swallowed thickly and braced himself. I'll waive the payment, and this payment only. But come on, you gotta give me something. The old man nodded. Whatever you want. What do you got? Watterson opened his mouth, then closed it again. I, 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 I don't really have anything, he said. I, I... Recognition flickered in his eyes. Joey could read people well enough to know the old man had thought of something. What? Joey asked. Well, I, I have an old arcade cabinet in the basement. My brother gave it to me before he died. Samuel Watterson ran a junk shop out in Brooklyn for 30 years before retiring. He went to storage locker auctions like those assholes on TV and bought shit for cheap then turned around and sold it for as much as he could. Another crew out in Flatbush put the squeeze on him, and a couple of the guys used to accept crap from his store in lieu of money. Their captain reamed them out for it, too. Arcade cabinet, Joey said, tasting the words like they were strange and new. You mean like an arcade game, right? Watterson nodded. Uh, yeah. I was going to set it up here, but I never got around to it. When he was a kid, Joey and his friends used to hang out in an arcade in Maspeth, a dark, cave-like place filled with beeping, flashing lights and girls. He stopped fucking around with video games when his nuts dropped, but from what little he knew, some of those old games were worth a lot of money now. Let me see it, Joey said. Watterson led them down a brief hallway past the bathrooms and the office, Joey close behind and Bobby bringing up the rear, at a door with employees only on it. Watterson stopped and produced a key from his pocket. It worked the last time I checked it, he said over his shoulder. That was three years ago, so I can't promise anything. He unlocked the handle and opened the door. The hinges creaked, and the stale smell of mildew pinched Joey's nose. Watterson reached in, snapped an overhead light on, and carefully defended a set of rickety wooden stairs, one hand trailing along the unfinished banister. At the bottom, the walls were stone and the floor earth. Thick layers of dust coated everything, and cobwebs danced like phantoms in shadowy corners. Boxes lined one wall, and broken stools, chairs, and tables were heaped here and there like the aftermath of a miniature tornado. The game sat in an alcove around a corner, covered in a white canvas tarp. For some reason, Joey was reminded of bodies in the morgue. Bobby, hands thrust sullenly into his pockets, stood next to Joey while Watterson yanked the tarp off. Motes of dust swirled in the air and made Joey's eyes water. This is it, Watterson said, and tossed the tarp aside. Joey walked over to inspect it. Six feet tall at a glance, it looked like every arcade game Joey had ever seen. Screen, marquee over the monitor with the game's title on it, and a control panel with buttons and joysticks. There was no artwork on the sides like you'd expect, only a grid pattern consisting of black lines on a silver background. The lettering across the marquee was blocky and light blue. Primus, it read. Never heard of it. 
Walking slowly around it, Joey checked for obvious signs of damage, but didn't see any. He spotted a cord lying in the dirt and picked it up. You got an outlet down here? Oh, one sec. While Watterson went off to find an extension cord, Joey looked up at Bobby, who studied the cabinets with mild interest. You ever heard of this game? He shook his head. No. Watterson returned with an orange cord, and Joey jammed the plug into it. The marquee lit up. Soft, electric shimmer, then the screen. Primus flashed across it. Below that, L-1981 MK Tech. Credit, 1. Hey, there we are, Joey said. He dug in his pocket for a quarter and dropped it into the slots with a metallic and strangely satisfying chink. He pushed play, and the green vector lines streaked across the screen. A star-shaped thing formed in the center, and a tiny triangular spaceship appeared on the left. Joey hit a button, and the craft fired at the star, which began to spin. A low, buzzing sound filtered from unseen speakers, and Joey's fillings vibrated, making him wince. It, it works? Orison asked. The star spun faster, and Joey stared into it, mesmerized. Without warning, it fell away, and a confusion of polygons, prisms, and hallucinogenic spirals took its place. The buzzing grew louder, more insistent and Joey's heart began to inexplicably race. Something wasn't right. He forced his eyes from the screen, and black dots filled his vision. He blinked and shook his head, a headache already smoldering above his left eye. Are you all right? Watterson asked, worriedly. I'm fine, Joey said, and pressed his hands to his temple. That shit hurts my eyes. Almost gave me a seizure or something. A loud ringing echoed through his ears, and his stomach twisted. For a second, he was dizzy. Then, as suddenly as it came, it was over. I'll take it, he said, and patted the machine. I'll come back later and pick it up. Watterson's shoulders lifted a little, and he gave an eager nod. I'll be here, he said. Outside, the sun shone and exhaust fumes choked the mild breeze. Cars honked, a siren wailed in the distance, and people made their way up and down the sidewalks. Joey lit a cigarette, and Bobby whipped out his cell phone. I don't know how you can look at those screens all day, Joey said. Two seconds and I got a fucking headache. The pain above his eye had faded, but he could still feel it, a pinprick of heat boring into his skull like a laser. Before playing Primus, he was hungry, but now the thought of food sent his stomach gurgling. When he blinked, whirls and stars burst across the backs of his eyelids, and his head spun. This is why I don't work a desk job, he pointed out. Bobby didn't reply. At the car, Joey slid in behind the wheel with a grunt, and Bobby climbed into the passenger seat. For a moment, they sat in silence the smoke from Joey's cigarette heavy in the air. I don't usually do that, Joey said at last, but I made an exception. Without looking up from his phone, Bobby nodded. You get sob stories every time you collect, but I've known Lenny a long time, and he's not lying. His wife really did just die, and I get why he's got to skip this time. A defensive edge crept into his voice, and hot shame spread across the back of his neck. Bobby was quiet. Joey turned to look at him. He wore an absent expression and darted his eyes from side to side across the screen. Joey was good at reading people, and his nephew was uninterested in what he was telling him. That irritated Joey. Hey, he said sharply. Can you look at me and not at that fucking phone? Bobby looked up with strained patience. I'm getting real sick of your attitude, Joey said, and threw the car in drive. You need to start paying attention to what I'm showing you. 
You might think it's a fucking joke right now, but one day you're not gonna have me wiping your ass and buying you Xboxes and shit. You're gonna have to make your own money. This is how you do it. For a moment, Bobby looked like he was going to mouth off, but he simply nodded and mumbled something that might have been okay. Shaking his head, Joey pulled away from the curb and set a course for the suite. A nightclub with a sleek, stylish facade and situated off the main drag. It was owned by Anthony Tony Rossiti, a captain so fat his rolls had rolls. Joey and the other guys called him Tony Tits behind his back and Sir to his face. In the daylight, the inside was dim and empty save for a few guys at the bar, all members of the crew. Joey sat next to Steve DeFano and waved the bartender over. A perky blonde with long legs and pink lips, she brought him a rum and coke. And Bobby, just a coke. Tony in? He asked Steve. No, he's out. Steve said, a tall, broad man with a mustache. Steve owned a moving company that the crew used to launder money. Joey knocked back his drink. You think you can help me out with something? He said. What? Steve asked. An hour later, Joey stood on the sidewalk before Watterson's with his arms crossed and supervised as Steve and Ray Mancini wheeled Primus out on a dolly. A white moving truck sat illegally parked at the curb and people passing in the streets had to move over to avoid it. Because they were New Yorkers, every single one of them honked for the hell of it. The cabinets, covered once more by the tarp, leaned back against the handcart, and as they got it over the threshold, it started to tip. Watch it, Joey started. Steve caught it before it could fall, and Joey walked alongside, hand out, to stop it if it fell again. Grunting, straining, and sweating, Steve and Ray got it up the ramp and sat it against the far wall, then wrapped ratchet straps around it to keep it from falling during the drive. I didn't know you liked video games, Ray said, a mocking hilt in his voice. Yeah, so what if I do? He held his hands up in a placated gesture. Hey, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong, it just, you know... Maybe it's time you grew up and got your head out of your ass. Steve snickered, and Bobby turned his head away to hide his smile. Just shut up and do what I told you. Joey lived in a nondescript house on a quiet side street in Far Rockaway. It was two stories, brick, and set tastefully back from the sidewalk. Steve backed the truck into the yard, then he and Ray wheeled the cabinet around back. Joey went ahead to unlock the basement door. Instead, the floor was heavily carpeted with a pool table in the middle. A dartboard hung catty corner from the couch, and a flat screen TV took up most of one wall. He and the other guys played pool and poker down here on occasion. He had Steve and Ray set the cabinet next to the stairs and only realized later that there was an outlet nearby. After Steve and Ray left, Joey stood before the game with his hands on his hips and stared at his watery reflection in the darkened screen. His fillings ached at the memory of its buzz and the pain in his head returned. The compulsion to turn the cabinet on gripped him and his heartbeat sped up. For a moment, he almost did. Then he ripped himself away and went upstairs instead. Just after six that evening, Joey poured pasta into a strainer in the sink, set the pot down, and stirred the sauce. It spat and splattered his arm, burning him. He picked up the strainer, shook it, dumped the pasta back into the pot, and set it on the stove. Next, he took a loaf of Italian bread from the bread box next to the microwave and cut it into slices. He worked with the grace and ease of a ballerina, as at home in the kitchen as he was beating a guy's face in with the handle of a 38. His movements were fluid, his steps fleet. In a wife beater that stretched tight across his gut and bared his hairy arms, he resembled a bear, but mimicked a rabbit. When the sauce was done, he turned the stove off and set it aside. 
then grabbed a plate from the cabinet over the sink. He forked a generous amount of pasta, drowned it in sauce, and added a piece of bread, and set it on the table. He did it again, then went into the living room, where the TV played unwatched, and the lamplight cast a low, comfortable glow. At the bottom of the stairs, he cupped his hands to his mouth. Food's ready. He waited until he heard Bobby moving around, then went back into the kitchen and sat, the chair creaking under his weight. A few minutes later, Bobby trudged in like his feet weighed five hundred pounds apiece and took his spot. His eyes were hazy and unfocused, and his hair stuck out at odd angles, putting Joey in mind of those troll dolls that were big when he was a kid. You were sleeping, weren't you? Joey asked. Yeah, Bobby said. I was tired. You need to stop staying up all goddamn night on that computer, Joey said, and took a bite. It'll turn your mind to mush. I feel kind of sick. That's all. The boy mumbled and picked up his fork. That was a lie. He stayed up until two or three in the morning playing games or going on 4chan or whatever kids do. A vision of Primus came back to Joey, and his chest closed like a feeble fist. Something wasn't right with that cabinet, and after dinner he was going to go downstairs and check it out some more. For a while they ate in silence. The only sound was the scraping of forks on plates. Then Joey took a drink. You asked that girl out yet? A deep blush spread across Bobby's face, and Joey couldn't contain a grin. Her name was Clara, or Kara, or something like that, and she lived a couple of houses down. Cute little redhead with green eyes and pale skin. She was always following Bobby around like a puppy dog, smiling at him, giggling, the works. Bobby said he didn't like her, but he was a goddamn liar. His problem was that he was too damn shy. Eh, not yet, he said. Why not? Joey asked. Bobby shrugged one shoulder. I, I just, I don't know if she likes me like that. Throwing his head back, Joey laughed. You got a lot to learn, you know that? I can read people, kid. Trust me, she likes you. Wants to hold your hand the way Trump wanted to nuke that fucking hurricane. Bobby's blush turned bright red, and Joey laughed again. He liked picking on his nephew. In a fatherly way, of course. Those Irish girls are wild. I give it five minutes before she's dragging you in her house. Let's go to my room. Bobby choked on his food, and Joey slapped his back. Seriously, though, Joey said, and took a bite of his bread. You should ask her out. Stop being shy and shit. I'm not shy, Bobby argued. Whatever you want to call it, ask her out or you're grounded. He grinned to show that he was playing. After dinner, Bobby did the dishes, then went back up to his room to do God Only Knows, and Joey went into the basement. The cabinet was where he left it, huddled at the foot of the stairs like a cat burglar with his back against the wall, listening. Joey favored it warily, as though it were a coiled snake instead of a video game, and the memory of the buzzing returned. Despite bitching and moaning about cell phones and computers, Joey owned one of each and used them frequently. Neither one made him feel like he was going to pass out the way Primus did, and though he kept it under wraps, he was a little worried. He blamed the game earlier, but maybe something was wrong with him. He was 53 and overweight with high cholesterol, the perfect candidate for a stroke. He didn't know much about strokes, but maybe the flashing lights and teeth-rattling hum of the cabinet triggered something. He sucked his bottom lip into his mouth and considered his next move. Part of him wanted to go back upstairs and forget about it, but another wanted to plug the game in and play it, just to see. If something was the matter with him, he needed to know about it. After an indecisive moment, he bent over, picked up the plug, and jammed it into the outlet. The marquee kicked in, and the air crackled with energy, setting his teeth on edge. He stood in front of the screen and stared at it. Primus, L. 1981, MK Tech, 
credits. One. He reached into his pocket, found a quarter, and started to put it into the coin slot, but stopped. Maybe he shouldn't do this. Maybe he should go upstairs, make an appointment with his doctor, and be done with it. The quarter dropped into the machine's guts with a click, and he swallowed. No, he'd just play around and go from there. He hated going to the doctor, and if he didn't have to, he didn't want to. He jabbed the play button with his thumb, and the game started. A tunnel, green lines on black, took shape in the void, and the spaceship, or whatever it was, appeared. Joey frowned in confusion. This was different from the last time he played. Huh. Must be at a different level. The ship took off like a rocket, and Joey guided it with the joystick. Every so often a throbbing light filled the track and hitting it made the ship go faster. If you touched the wall grids, you slowed down, and if you slowed down too much, the timer ran out and you lost. It was simple, even for its time, but eh, not bad, he guessed. As he played, Joey felt none of the effects from before. His head didn't spin, his skull didn't ache, and his stomach didn't heave. The buzzing bothered him at first, and after a while it receded to a low drone that settled into his brain. It wasn't bad, actually. It kind of made him sleepy. At the end of the level, You Win flashed across the screen, and Joey smirked. He liked to win. The next stage was different. Points of white light streaked at the player, giving the effect of being on a spaceship and whizzing past stars. None of the buttons did anything, but if you maneuvered the joystick, the screen moved from side to side. Two minutes in, strobing colors rapidly pulsed, and Joey stared into them, unaware that his jaw hung slack or that his eyes had widened as if to see every pixel. The world ebbed away and all that existed were the lights and the constant hum. When Joey came to, please insert quarter scrolled across the screen. He blinked and shook his head. He felt okay, but suddenly very tired. Eyes grainy, head achy. He pushed away from the cabinet and rubbed his neck. It and his back were both stiff. Upstairs, he got a drink from the fridge and went into the living room. The buzz rang in his ears, and his fingers jittered. Every time he closed his eyes, he could vividly see the screen, and his stomach knotted with something approaching need. On TV, Stephen Colbert sat behind his desk on The Late Show, and Joey's step faltered. What fucking time was it? He pulled out his phone and swiped his thumb across the screen. Almost midnight. Now, his head did spin. It was just after seven when he went downstairs. There was no way he spent five hours standing at that cabinet. His back and neck both twinged in disagreement. He furrowed his brow in thought and racked his brain, sure that he was wrong, but no. He was only down there twenty minutes, maybe half an hour. Yet, his phone said it was eleven-fifty-eight. That couldn't be right. He stared down at it, expecting it to magically change, but it didn't. Something eerie seemed to pass close by, and the hairs on his arms stood up. Five hours. He spent five hours down there, and he honestly couldn't remember any of it. A chunk of ice formed around his heart, and he nervously licked his lips. Wasn't losing time like that a sign of having a stroke? In bed, he gazed up at the ceiling, hands folded on his quivering chest, headlights from passing cars darted across the walls, and a quiet hum permeated the atmosphere like electricity before a storm. When he closed his eyes, he saw grids, swirls, and light, and the hot pain in his head swelled. A hot flush crept over him, and his heart palpitated sickly. He glanced at the phone on the nightstand and chewed his bottom lip. If it didn't stop soon, he'd call an ambulance. Some time later, the malaise melted away, and he slipped into a thin slumber. 
Twinkling lights surrounded him like falling snow, and an ominous buzz steadily increased like an approaching swarm of wasps. Stalks of green light cut through the darkness, forming a prison-like grid, and Joey stumbled through it, desperately looking for a way out. The buzzing was louder and louder, worming its way into his head, puncturing his brain, setting every nerve ending on fire. It sounded like whispering voices, and though Joey couldn't make out the words, he understood them. He understood them too fucking well. A thunderclap of agony rocked his skull, and he fell to his knees with a scream. Blood seeped from his eyes, and his nails clawed madly at the sides of his face, ripping skin, tearing veins. His eyes bulged from their sockets, inflating like two balloons, and the voices screamed at him, frantic, urgent. The pain was excruciating, and there was only one way to stop it. Staggering to his feet, Joey ran at the wall, and the grid shimmered with dark excitement. He threw himself at it, and just as 50,000 volts surged through his body, he came awake with a gasp. Dusky morning light cascaded through the window, and birds tweeted to each other from treetops the neighborhood over. Joey's eyes stung, and his head throbbed. They were loud. Too loud. He sat up and buried his feverish face in his shaking hands, the dream already dissipating, retreating beyond the rim of remembrance. Something about the game. That fucking game. Uh, Uncle Joey? Joey started so bad, he let out a strangled cry. Bobby frowned at him from the open door, his book bag slung casually over one shoulder. The boy hesitated perhaps taken aback by his uncle's evident fear, then jerked his head towards the stairs. I'm going now. It was 6.45 by the clock on the bedside table. Joey took a deep, shivery breath. All right. Yeah. Uh, have a good day. Are you all right? Bobby asked. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. Bobby lingered for a second as if he wanted to say something, then, mercifully, he went away, leaving Joey alone. All right, so something was wrong with him. He couldn't remember the dream, and aside from being shaky and afraid, he felt fine, but that didn't mean shit. A blood clot, cancer, some fucking thing was nestling in his brain, and if he left it alone, it'd flare up, just like it did last night like knots crackling in a fire. Picking up the phone, he dialed his doctor's office and made an appointment for ten. Done. He got up, went to the bathroom, and took a long, hot shower, the pounding water relaxing his tense muscles. In the kitchen, he made himself toast and drank a glass of orange juice. His eyes darted to the basement door, and he imagined he could feel the cabinet's presence. His hands twitched and he could feel the ghost of the joystick incessantly prodding his palm, smooth and slick. He closed his hand, and his chest stirred as if with desire. You know, there was a common denominator here. Both times he spaced out, he was playing that damn game. It did something to him. Triggered him. He wasn't saying it was the cabinet's faults, but it primed him. Sparked him. Whatever you want to call it. Now, the urge to play it was bubbling in his mind like fizz. His fingers flexed, his throat went dry, and his midsection fluttered. He finished his juice and went into the living room. Good Morning America was on, and he tried to lose himself in it, but couldn't. It was too hot, too stuffy, the couch too lumpy. He shifted his weight, crossed and uncrossed his arms, tapped his foot... He felt tight, edgy, restive. He wanted to play that game. That admission dislodged a sardonic chuckle from his throat. It was true, though. Primus pulled his blood as surely as the moon pulled the tide. He raked his fingers through his hair and took a deep breath. He couldn't play it. Wouldn't play it. 
Yet somehow he found himself standing in front of it, the marquee glowing and the screen glinting. Push play, push play, push play. He didn't remember putting a quarter in. Cold sludge sloshed in the pit of his stomach. Sweat trickled down the back of his neck, and his hands lightly trembled as he reached out to press the button. His mind screamed at him to stop, but he did it anyway, guided by some unseen force. The game started, and Joey fell into a vortex of light and sound. Odd, non-geometric hurled at him from the depths, and the buzzing soothed his aching brain, lulling him into a state of near catatonia, like the voice of the wind. He swiveled the joystick and tapped the button with mechanical absence, a machine cycling through the motions. His lips parted, a ribbon of drool coursing down his chin and his eyes glistened. He could almost make out words in the white noise, almost comprehend what the game was telling him. The more he played, the deeper he sank. He could hear the blood crashing in his veins, mice thumping in the walls, traffic on Central Avenue four blocks away. He could smell the hot wires in the machine's body, metallic like ozone. He could feel every pump of his heart was aware of every bone in his body. The voice became clearer, louder and commanding. A hand fell on his shoulder and the illusion shattered. He jumped and whipped around, and Bobby stumbled back in surprise. Disoriented, Joey didn't recognize him at first. What are you doing here? He asked. His voice came as a hollow croak, and he was put uncomfortably in mind of Lenny Watterson. Bobby's brow crinkled. I've, I've been here, he said, bemused. Vertigo crashed over Joey like a wave, and he studied himself on the machine. What do you mean? Why aren't you at school? Bobby looked at him like he was crazy. School's over, he said. It's five o'clock. Joey missed a beat. It was. He pulled out his phone. 503. I was just wondering if you were going to make dinner... Joey swallowed. In his periphery, the screen winked. Play. 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 Hey, yeah, Joey said. Hey, give me a minute. Bobby nodded and went back upstairs, and Joey looked at the cabinet. How long had he been here? It felt like only five minutes, but had to be more like six hours, maybe even longer. Like the night before, he couldn't remember any of it like his mind had been wiped clean. The game called him, and painted with fear. He fled. He was too out of sorts to cook, so he ordered a pizza. He and Bobby sat at the kitchen table. Bobby scarfed down one slice after another, and Joey stared vacantly down at his, the peppers becoming grids, the pepperoni spinning, humming, whining voices. Then she said yes, Bobby grinned. Joey didn't know he was talking. Uh, yeah, uh, that's great, he muttered. He tried to lift his head, but he felt like he was going to topple over and grabbed the edge of the table for support. He's losing it, Bobby thought, and Joey heard it as clearly as if he'd spoken. He looked up, and the boy smiled goofily down at his plate. Going crazy. Gonna crack any minute now. Old fuck. His lips didn't move, but his eyes glowed green. Joey blinked and massaged his temples with his fingertips. Maybe he was. Maybe he was going crazy. Or maybe. Maybe it was that fucking game. No. He was certain. It was the game. Some way, somehow, it was fucking with him. When Bobby was done and in his room, Joey cleared the table, sat, and pulled out his cell phone. He went to Google, typed Primus Game into the search bar, and hit the spyglass button. 
The top results was headed. Primus, Urban Legend, Wikipedia. Joey frowned. Urban Legend. He clicked the link and text filled the screen. The attached picture showed the same cabinet currently in his basement. Maybe not the exact same one, but certainly one of them. He started to read. Primus is a fictional arcade game and urban legend that emerged in the late 80s on various Usenet groups. The legend claims that an arcade game called Primus suddenly appeared in a Portland, Oregon arcade in November 1981 and caused severe psychoactive effects in players, including dizziness, nausea, nightmares, and eventually insanity. Joey's blood ran cold. The game was said to be part of a CIA experiment related to the MK Ultra project intended to bombard viewers with subliminal messages and psychoactive imagery in anticipation of potential broadcast over Soviet and Eastern Bloc television sets in the event of a war. The phone dropped from Joey's hand with a clunk. Holy shit. Holy fucking shit. He had all of those things. Nausea, nightmares, the works. The article said the game wasn't real, but what the fuck was that downstairs? What was that fucking thing? A hallucination. A fake. A fake. It had to be a fake. It said right in the article it was a legend. Further down, it said people with too much time on their hands made replicas. That's what his had to be. A toy inspired by a myth. Only the things he'd been feeling since yesterday afternoon weren't a myth. And neither was the sudden urge to go downstairs, slip a quarter in, and play. He wanted to play it. Jesus, he could feel it in his bones. A sharp, needling yen, like a drunk craving his favorite poison. Every cell crying out for the comforting lights and sounds. His head slammed and his chest expanded and contracted with his ragged breathing. His ears rang and warm, wool-like fuzzies swaddled his brain. A stabbing pain plunged into the center of his stomach and he doubled over. His arms wrapped around his middle. The buzzing was back, deafening, drowning out everything else. He let out a moan and squeezed his eyes closed. Terror snaked around his heart, and Primus called him like a siren on a rocky shore, luring ships closer, closer, closer. Hugging himself against shudders of agony, Joey went to sit, but bumped into something instead. Primus. Without realizing it, he'd gone into the basement. He stared at the screen, his breath locked in his throat. Primus, L-1981, MK Tech. Credit, 1. MK Tech, MK Ultra. Since I was 10 years old, I've been tormented by nightmares. My parents would hear me moaning and sometimes screaming in my sleep almost every night. Every few nights, the same dream would appear in my mind. I'm standing in front of a statue of an insanely beautiful woman, and suddenly the statue starts decomposing like a dead human body, but it happens in seconds. About a year ago, when I was 14, my mother, a very superstitious person, decided to buy a dream catcher for me. It was a cheap souvenir with plastic beads and black feathers, and she placed it in my room, next to the window. For a few nights, no screams nor moans had been heard from my room, and after this time, the statue appeared again. This time, it didn't decompose. It turned into a real woman with a body made out of stone, smiled at me and said, I will protect you from what comes next. Despite this ominous prophecy, nothing else happens in this dream and I woke up happy. Both my parents praised the dream catcher and I was able to continue living, this time without fear. The statue lady would still appear in my dreams from time to time. She would warn me, 
give me strange advices and often try to ensure me that she was on my side. It was weird, but way better than having non-stop nightmares. Then one day, the nightmares came back. I found myself surrounded by fire that was getting closer and closer. Suddenly, the statue lady came from the sky and took me out of there, saving my life. I promised, she said, disappearing into the mist. The alarm went off about a second later, informing me that it was time to go to school. From this moment on, I've had the strangest nightmares every night, and the statue lady would always appear to save me from any horrors I was about to endure. With each next dream, she would get more and more colors, slowly turning into a real human body instead of stone. Four days ago, her change has been completed. She saved me from a psychotic murderer with a chainsaw, and she asked me to call her mother. I did that, and she kissed my forehead. While she was leaning towards my head, I suddenly felt a rotten odor coming from her mouth. The person who leaned back was not my statue lady. It was her heavily decomposed corpse, the one I had been seeing in my older nightmares. No one will take your sanity from me. She said, You are mine to torment forever. I woke up screaming and I saw a ghost or a somehow visible energy wave escaping my bed and flying to the window. It crashed the black dream catcher in half and got out, leaving me scared and crying. My mother's gift had been bringing nightmares upon me, and my old nightmare had felt threatened. Therefore, it crushed the catcher. Now I am alone against the statue lady again, and since that night, I haven't fallen asleep. I feel as if I was slowly losing my mind, and I know that I'll eventually have to get some rest. Hopefully before losing my mind. And when I fall asleep, the statue lady will put her rotten hands on me again. Chasing in a Maze by Otherwise Add 1747 A few years ago, I entered the University of Lausanne to enter my medical studies. I had just arrived in the city and even in the country. I was very excited to start my year, to discover the university, to meet new people, etc. Everything was going great until the end of the third week. Friday, sometime around 9 p.m., I leave the library. I say goodbye to my friends and start to go home. The pace of work was already very intense, so we had been working all day, and I was in a rush to get home. It was my favorite part of the day because I got to put on my music, take the subway, and then the train. It gives me a chance to rest and catch up with my thoughts. Anyway, that night it was so cold, there was no one left outside. It takes me about seven minutes to walk from the library to the subway. I'm walking quietly with my music in my ears when suddenly I get a shiver that runs down my body from head to toe. I start to feel comfortable as if someone was watching me. And at that point, I pause my music and decide to not turn around to check in case the person is trying to be inconspicuous and if I notice them, I was fearful that something might happen. I don't want to run either because I'm not sure if I can run faster and I don't know exactly where to go. At this point, we pass a glass building. So I decide to look inside and pretend I'm fixing my hair. I quickly glance in the corner of my eye and my blood runs cold. There is someone walking a few feet behind me in a hoodie. I try to reassure myself that he was just finishing work and going home, and that he is cold and that is why he is wearing his hoodie, and there are no houses for civilians for quite some time. I decide to send a message to my mother saying, Come and get me in front of the insert name of the building, please, I really don't feel safe. It is important to know that the university is 30 minutes away by a car from my house. At this point, I don't find another solution and I decide to take refuge in a building while waiting for my mother to come and get me. As I was about to go back, I opened the door, took off my helmet, and went down the stairs to find a hiding place. We entered by the third floor. I thought I was out of trouble when suddenly I hear the door I came through open. This time, I am sure he is after me. But since I'm new, I don't know this building and where it leads. 
I run downstairs at full speed and I hear him behind me. I can hear this guy's footsteps running down the stairs at full speed as well. I run without looking back, being sure that he is running faster than I can, and that he will catch up with me. I don't even know where I'm going, but I pray that I don't fall into a dead end. Looking back, I even think that it was like that scene in The Shining with the labyrinth. I don't know how far ahead of him I was, so I opened a window in the hallway to make it look like I was out of there, and opened a little door further. It was a huge auditorium, and it was pitch dark. I went down the stairs and hid under a desk. I put my phone on silent and did my best to hide. My mom had been texting me a lot asking me what was going on and saying she was on her way with my dad. I texted her I'm in insert name of building. He is looking for me, please come quickly. I hid under the desk thinking I was screwed. My hiding place sucked and he was going to find me any second. Then, I heard a thud and a huge scream and I don't think I've ever been so scared in my life when I heard that scream. For 15 minutes, my mother was sending me messages telling me to hang on, and at the end of those 15 long minutes waiting for him to find me, I finally got the message from my mom saying that she's here, and she has the police. They are going to enter the building and they need to know where I am. I just tell them I'm on the second floor because I had no idea where I was, and after two minutes, I heard the door of the auditorium open and it was the police coming after me. Once I got out, they took my statement and they said they would check out the university management. The next day, they contacted us and said that they saw on the surveillance cameras that there was indeed someone who had followed me. Apparently, there were no cameras inside that particular building, though. You can't see the guy's face and therefore, we don't know who it is. They just sadly said that the security was going to do patrols at night and advised me to do something... They just said that security was going to do patrols at night and advised me to have someone with me when I'm out.